I guess we'll get started. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 12 p.m. public portion of closed session of the February 11th, 2020 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. In this part of the meeting, the council will receive public testimony. Thereafter, the council members will move to the courtyard conference room for the closed session. I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Watkins? Here. Matthews? Here. Brown? Here. Weber? Here. Strong? Here. Vice Mayor Myers? Here. And Mayor Cummings? Here. Are there any members of the public who would like to speak on any of the items on closed session agenda today? You can come up to the mic and you'll have two minutes. You can use the podium. Yeah. Hi, my name is Sybil Bay and I'm the one that filed the claim against the city for um, a main water break that happened on my street and damaged my property. Um, I brought my binder today. I I'd submitted all my documentation um, to the city, but I brought backups today in case you wanna take a look. And I also wasn't able to send in two videos that I have that my neighbors took that I have in my phone in case you wanna take a look at those. Um, but basically, I my neighbor had noticed a wet patch in our shared alley that serves five, four houses. And I, uh, back at the beginning of last year, and he said, I think you might have a water break, Sybil, or something wrong with your water. And I was, so I had called the water department, um, spoke to them many times. They came out, kept telling me my water meter was not running, it was not my water but the water got worse and worse. And pretty soon my entire portion of the alley was wet. And, but my water meter was not running. So I didn't know what it was. And I had talked to multiple people there and it's all, you can contact the water department. They have it all documented. I mostly spoke to Joanna, I think her name was that, um, she probably got sick of me calling because I kept saying, what is going on? And um, it turned out a woman named Leah, Leah came out many times and she said, I think that we have to wait until the rain stops to test the water. Last, This is last winter. And I said, I, I need to figure this out because my neighbors aren't happy and it's eroding my driveway. It was basically coming down from De La Viega Park Road, the top of my house. I live on a hill. Am I over? Oh no. Anyway, um, I have all the documentation and you can take a look and see what, the, what had happened, but thank you. Thank you. Is there any <clears throat> other member of the public who would like to comment on this item? Just a question, would it be possible to get access to the video? Do we have, I mean, is there a way, I'm asking you. Is there a way we can do that? I mean, just to have access. Yeah, I would, I would suggest that uh, you work with Patty Heyman, our risk manager, to arrange to Okay. have the emails uh, and then she can then get them to the okay. council. Yeah. Leave the binder with yeah. the Yes, yes. You can and, leave it with they, the... And they have all the materials too, just so you know that you submit it. The, they've got them in their packets too. All right. If there's no other member of the public who would like to comment on this, we'll adjourn to uh, the courtyard conference room for a closed session. Good afternoon and welcome to our 1230 session of the February 11th, 2020 meeting of the City Council. I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Watkins? Here. Matthews? Here. Brown? Here. Weber? Here. <clears throat> Brown? Here. Vice Mayor Myers? Here. And Mayor Cummings? Here. And if the clerk could please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance.
Before we begin, I would also like to acknowledge that the land on which we gather is the unceded territory of the Awaswa-speaking Yupi tribe, the Amamutsin tribal band comprised of the descendants of indigenous people taken to Mission Santa Cruz and San Juan Batista during Spanish colonization of the Central Coast, is today working hard to restore traditional stewardship practices on these lands and heal from historical trauma. Um, moving on, we will start with the introduction of new employees, and I would like to invite up Assistant City Manager Laura Schmidt to introduce Brett Woolman. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Laura Schmidt, um, I'd like to introduce Brett Woolman. He is our new records coordinator in the City Clerk's Division of the City Manager's Office. Brett earned a degree in business management at San Diego State University. You know, Ralph graduated from there, right? Okay. <laughs> and moved to Santa Cruz about nine years ago. His professional experience includes a variety of jobs in banking, plus a recent stint as a compliance specialist. His organization, customer service, and detail orientation were truly standout characteristics in his interviews here at the city. He has a wide variety of interests from reading, writing, running, music, and sports. For conversation starters, he more specifically plays the guitar and is a fan of the LA Clippers and the LA Chargers, which we may not hold against him, I suppose. You may still speak to him though, and apparently he was an LA Clippers fan from when they were terrible. So he shows a certain level of dedication. He enjoys exploring the beaches and mountains in Santa Cruz and our surrounding areas. Please welcome Brett. Welcome. Next, we have Director of Libraries, Susan Nimitz, to introduce Laura Kern. Hi, I'm Susan Nimitz. I'm the Director of the Santa Cruz Public Libraries, and I'm here with Lauren Kern. Um, Lauren came to Santa Cruz in 2009 from Temecula. I'm learning my, my California lingo. Is it Temecula? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, she came to be a student at UCSC and majored in biology. She joined the library four years ago as uh, in a temporary position as an aide, and she's now joining us to be a permanent library assistant at Felton. And I just want to do a shout out to Felton because it opens on Saturday the 22nd. We'd love to have you all attend. Lauren um, <coughs> writes and reads, which is true of most library staff, um, but she's also a homemade bread maker. Mm. Please welcome Lauren. Question. Susan, what's the date, the time for the Felton? Um, speeches start at 9, the ribbon cutting's at 10, so you can time in between that. Thank you. We'd love you all to come. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Next up, we have the Director of Public Works, Mark Dettel, to introduce um, three new employees. Good afternoon. Mark Dettel, Director of Public Works, and it's my pleasure to introduce three of our new employees. Um, next to me is Jonathan Garcia. He's a new solid waste worker, uh, born and raised in Santa Cruz, uh, and currently lives in Santa Cruz. Has two younger brothers and a pet dog, and he uh, used to work for a community tree service. Um, he attended Santa Cruz High, and he enjoys mountain biking when he's not working for the city. Jonathan. And next to Jonathan is uh, a new our new engineering technician, Noi O Yan, and Noi was she was born in China and moved to the United States when she was 14 years old. She attended high school in Round Rock, Texas, a small town outside of Austin. After high school, she moved to College Station and lived there for six years to attend school. She got her master's and bachelor's degree there. Um, and then she worked in Austin for two years before moving to California. Uh, now she currently lives in Campbell and she has a, finance, a fiance and a cat named Coconut. No, she didn't name her fiance, but she named her cat. So <laughs> <laughs> shared that. Um, um, she's worked as an engineering uh, in training as an environmental con with an environmental consulting firm in Austin called LNV. Uh, and, it, and she worked on a lot of projects like hydraulic modeling, treatment plant and distribution design, 
And the two main projects uh, were hydraulic modeling of a, on GIS and ozone system improvements for their uh, treatment plant, which is really works well with our wastewater treatment going to tertiary um, and recycled water. Uh, she, she attended Texas A&M and got her master's degree in civil engineering and a bachelor's degree in biological and agricultural engineering, which is water resources mainly focused on irrigation. Um, and when she's not working, what she likes to do for fun, she loves to paint and draw, and she also enjoys hiking, running, and tennis. And a fun fact that she wanted to share, um, her name is, is interesting, Nai, Nai O. She said it's, it's really from in 2000 and went based on the Olympic Games being held in Sydney. Um, the Nay came from, from Sydney and the O from Olympic. Uh, and it turns out that uh, there was a competition between Beijing, China, and Sydney, Australia, to see who would host the, the Olympic Games. And if the game would have been in Beijing, her name would have been Jing, Jing Ho. So anyway, it's late, leaving it up to fate. That's pretty interesting. So anyway, please welcome Neho. <laughs> and next to Ne is um, a new equipment service worker, Rafael Landeros. Uh, he was born in Mexico in the state of Michoacan. He grew up in Santa Cruz. He currently lives in Watsonville. Um, he, has, he has some pets, some koi fish is what he has for pets. Uh, he's worked as a mechanic for the last 10 to 12 years. He went to K through 12 in Santa Cruz and he attended Central Coast College, has an accounting certification. And when he's not working, he likes to hang out with friends and family, watch sports or go to sporting events, camping and fishing. So please join me in welcoming all of our new employees. Thank you and welcome. All right, so up next is the introduction of our new city county advocate to implement strategies to address UCSC growth plans, uh, Morgan Bostic. Good afternoon, city council, uh, vice mayor. My name is Justin Cummings, I'm the mayor of Santa Cruz, and I would like to introduce Morgan Bostic, our new UCSC advocate. <clears throat> Morgan Bostic has a degree from UC Santa Cruz in politics and legal studies. As an undergraduate, she was an intern for former mayor Cynthia Chase and council member Chris Crone. Ms. Bostic has drafted policy for the Santa Cruz County Jail and Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Office, and has worked on various local campaigns as a public policy research assistant. In 2018, Ms. Bostic was awarded the Robert T. Matsui U.S. Congressional Fellowship, through which she has worked as a legislative fellow for Congresswoman Barbara Lee in Washington, D.C. Upon graduating, Ms. Bostic moved back to her hometown of Los Angeles to serve as council aide for city council member Mike Bonin, where she, where she was the policy and services liaison for residents and neighborhoods of Venice Beach. And now she is back with us here in Santa Cruz to serve as our UCSC advocate. And so I would like to welcome Morgan Bostic. Okay, next is um, Parking for Hope check presentation. <laughs> so today I'm pleased to announce that the city of Santa Cruz in partnership with the Santa Cruz Downtown Association will be presenting Hope Services with the sixth annual check collected from our Parking for Hope Holiday Program. For those who do not know, Hope Services is a Santa Cruz nonprofit that provides training and support services to adults with developmental disabilities. <laughs> In doing so, their crews have helped to keep our downtown streets clean and welcoming for over 20 years. The funds were collected from downtown meters the week before Christmas when the usual rates applied. However, all proceeds this eight day period were designated for donation to Hope Services. Over $182,000 in total has been collected for Hope Services over six years. 
This means that the total check collected in 2019 that is being donated to Hope Services today is $39,984. Wow. We welcome Hope Services team to the podium to accept this donation. Too. <laughs> so uh, we'd like to, as a group, say thank you to the city of Santa Cruz uh, for this funding and support. Um, when told we'd be attending a city council meeting to receive a giant check, our crew felt appreciated and expressed their gratitude. Um, Mark and Eric Brember, who a lot in town know as the twins, um, shared how much they appreciate working in the community. Um, Tony said, uh, let me say, we're cleaning up this town and I love it. Thank you, Santa Cruz, for helping me do that. Um, Sarah, over here, said, thank you, City of Santa Cruz, for helping me have this job. And Cassie wanted to share her thoughts herself. Thank you for it. Hi. Thank you for this job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, Very much appreciate all that you do, so thank you. <clears throat> Next up, um, the mayoral proclamation declaring February as Black History Month in the city of Santa Cruz. Um, and I just wanna read a few lines from the proclamation. National Black History Month in February affords special opportunity to become more knowledgeable about black heritage and to honor the many black leaders who have contributed to the progress of our nation. The mission of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, the nation's oldest, largest, and most widely recognized grassroots-based civil rights organization found in 1909 is to ensure the political, educational, social, and economic equality of rights of all persons and to eliminate race-based discrimination. And whereas the Santa Cruz branch of the NAACP organizes annual community-wide events such as Juneteenth, a Labor Day picnic, and events in recognition of Martin Luther King Jr., such as Youth Day, Gospel Night, and Martin Luther King marches. And whereas since 2018, the NAACP has co-sponsored the March for Dream in downtown Santa Cruz with the Santa Cruz Police Department. And whereas the Santa Cruz branch of the NAACP was founded circa 1949 to address local housing issues and has continued to work for decades to promote throughout Santa Cruz County equal economic opportunity, criminal justice, environmental and climate justice, civic engagement and education, including awarding scholarships to high school students who are pursuing post-secondary educations, and whereas acknowledging and understanding the struggles for equal rights in the African American community can strengthen the insight of all of our citizens regarding the issues of human rights, the great strides that have been made in the crusade to eliminate barriers of equality for minority groups, and the continuing struggle against racial discrimination and poverty. Now, therefore, I, Justin Cummings, mayor of the city of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim the month of February 2020 as Santa Cruz NAACP Black History Month in the city of Santa Cruz, encourage all citizens to participate in community practices that ensure equality for everyone. And I wanted to um, present this award to one of the members of the NCAA, NAACP who just walked in. And so I would like to ask them if they could approach the podium uh, to receive this award.
Thank you. Um, on behalf of the Santa Cruz chapter of the NAACP, I'd like to say thank you. I also always add that I am a native, so this is, makes it even more special for me. Um, I'm just gonna take a minute here to read our mission statement, just because it's this month. Uh, the mission of the NAACP is to ensure the political, educational, social, and economic equal rights of all persons and to eliminate racial hatred and racial discrimination. Thank you again. Thank you. And it's probably worth saying that uh, NAACP, NAACP, excuse me, um, uh, and the university and the city, among others, were co-sponsors of the MLK convocation last night, at which you were a featured speaker. So um, uh, it's a great partnership, great continuing program. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you for that comment. Okay. I have a few announcements to make, and then we'll move on to our regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television, channel 25, and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. Our rules of decorum are on the window ledge to my left, and it is my job to keep the meeting running without disruption, and we ask that you respect your fellow citizens when you're inside or outside our council chambers. I'd like to ask the council members if there are any statements of disqualification today. Hearing none, I would like to ask the clerk to announce any additions or deletions. Mm, there, it's noted on the agenda, but number 14 is removed, pulled by the department, and won't be discussed. Thank you. Is it the, the culvert, or was it the UV? Culvert. culvert. Clarify, if I could. Sure. It's just to clarify on the agenda, it says the below item was pulled, which, but it's the above item. Sorry, that's why the confusion. Sorry. <laughs> oh, you might have gotten the wrong agenda then, mm -hmm. but yeah, it's okay. number 14, the culvert. Okay. Thank you. Okay, oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not on the agenda, and oral communications will begin on or around 7 p.m. I'd like to ask the city attorney to provide a report on closed session. Thank you, Mayor Cummings, members of the city council. Uh, this afternoon, the council convened at 12 p.m. in the courtyard conference room to consider the following uh, closed session items. Item A, a conference with legal counsel concerning liability claims, the claim of Sybil Bay, previously Sybil Biddle. Um, that is also listed as uh, Item 11 on your consent agenda this afternoon. <coughs> Item B concerned labor negotiations uh, involving the following groups, uh, the Police Officers Association and Firefighters Local 1716. The former uh, Police Officers Association item is also listed as item 12 on your consent agenda. I'd like to uh, call no reportable action then. Okay, thank you. I'd like to call on the city manager's report and provide updates on city events and business items. I don't have a report today. Okay, thank you. Council meeting calendar. The council will review the meeting calendar, attach the agenda, and revise as necessary. Um, I'd like to call on the clerk to provide any updates to the calendar. Um, there are no updates. Okay. Moving on to consent agenda. First, up is the consent agenda. These are items five through 16 on our agenda. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who would wish to pull any items? Council member Crone. Thank you, Mayor. I've been requested by members of the public to pull item seven and item eight. Okay. Item seven and eight. Is there any other items that are to be pulled? Council Member Myers, Vice Mayor Myers. Um, I'd like to pull number nine, please. Nine. Okay. I have, I just have questions on 13, item 13. And I just have a comment on item six. Okay. Then I have a question on item 10. Are there any members, 
can I make a quick statement about sure. the minutes that were just passed around before mm -hmm. you get to that? Um, Councilmember Brown brought up that um, there were a couple friendly amendments that she had accepted, so we um, included those, and then there was an, a, a duplicate line, essentially making it kind of confusing. <laughs> You'll see the red lines in front of you, but. Okay, is there any member of the public that would like to speak on any of the items on our consent with the exce exception of items number seven, eight, nine, that were pulled by council members? 13, you can, you can approach the podium. And you'll have two minutes. 13. Um, it's just a question on it, so. I have questions, we didn't pull it. Okay, good afternoon, council members. Um, you're being asked on this agenda item to appropriate $80,000 to reinforce the <coughs> levy bank. And um, just to tell you ahead of time, I'm not really expecting you to vote uh, no on this, and I won't hold a grudge against any of you <laughs> if you do. But um, I wanna place it in a broader context for a moment. Um, Jesse Street March is a lagoon, um, a saltwater lagoon, a freshwater lagoon, or it's a lagoon, it's freshwater and saltwater. And this, <clears throat> and in somewhere in the past, the, it was filled with a lot of um, landfill. So the south end of Jesse Street Marsh is extraordinarily high compared to the rest of the marsh, and um, it acts as an impediment to any kind of salt water getting into the marsh. Um, the natural flow would be into the marsh. Now, of course, it's blocked by the levee, at which, and now it's called seepage, when it, when it, not a natural flow, but it's called seepage, because it threatens the neighborhood, and um, it threatens the boardwalk. In fact, I have some questions whether this is an emergency at all, um, considering the timing just before the tourist season. <laughs> what I wish in my wildest dreams is that instead of spending $80,000 on this, that $80,000 would be used to remove the land flow, allow the ocean, the river water, to flow into Jesse Street Lagoon, because inevitably that's what's gonna happen with sea level rise. And that's the bigger context this is good money following bad, $80,000 down the drain. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Is, there an, is there any other member of the public that would like to speak on items with the exceptions of seven, eight, and nine on our consent agenda? Seeing none, I'll come back to council. Uh, we'll start with uh, council member Watkins' comment on item number six. Um, I know I reached out to the mayor also to express my interest in participating in the subcommittee and also appreciation for, for forming this conceptually. Um, the thoughts that I had were to uh, consider equity as it relates to women and minorities accessing the industry, as well as the youth impacts and social norming. So as potential additions to some of the areas of focus that they'll be examining. I think that's appropriate. Yeah. Okay. Um, moving on, we'll go to a question on item number 10, which I had. Uh, one of the, the things that came up, a member of the public reached out um, and was wondering whether Habitat for Humanity could qualify for the Cal Homes funding as um, part of the technical assistance for self-help housing projects. I wasn't sure if someone could comment on that from staff. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Jessica Meller, um, Management Analyst from Economic Development. So Habitat, um, they are going to be submitting their own application, um, but we're not partnering at this time because they're focusing on their own application. Thank you. Moving on, um, there was a question, I think, by Vice Mayor Myers on item number 13. No, I'm, I'm 13. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, <coughs> Council Member Myers, I think, did you pull nine? She pulled nine. Yeah, you pulled nine. Okay, so um, 13. Yeah, so... Um, <coughs> This is, in part, my question is uh, related to uh, the comments made by uh, Barbara Riverwoman just now. Um, 
I guess I'm wondering, is somebody here who can talk about this? I think I saw, oh, you are here, thank you. Um, so if the, um, I get, it seems that the reason that you were wanting to do this to buttress the levy is that the water is seeping through onto the street. Um, understandable, um, but is it in seeping through, if it's doing that, then how do we know it's not seeping to the marsh as well? Is there any way to measure seepage in the marsh first. Um, this is, it is, as Barbara suggests, you know, it's a functioning ecosystem and it needs water to function properly. And so I'm, I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about what the danger is and um, if we don't do something right now without kind of looking at it further first. Uh, yes, <clears throat> my name is Steve Wolfman. I'm a senior civil engineer uh, in the public works department. Um, we're really just addressing the upper seepage that actually goes f through the levee. Uh, we're not addressing any of the seepage that is um, that could get to Jesse Street Marsh. Um, during this year, uh, towards the end of the summer, we had uh, the seepage showed up um, uh, towards the bottom of the levee. Um, and the Army Corps was quite concerned about the seepage in that um, one of the issues with the levee itself is that seepage is collected and we don't want the seepage to bring soil with it um, and have a catastrophic failure of the levee. That's what this is addressing. So we're really buttressing the levee strengthening it at that location and collecting any water that does get through um, to put back into the uh, river. So the elevation differences, I mean, we're really quite a bit above what could seep under the road to Jesse Street Marsh, that whatever seepage is happening there will continue to happen. And it does happen. We 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 can see it. Okay. Welcome. I'm 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 not sure. Like, what's what evidence? What tests have you all done to see if there is actually seepage into the marsh, and that this won't now preclude that seepage? Well, the reason it won't preclude it is because the elevation difference between w what were trying to buttress the fill. We're not really trying to stop the seepage, we're gonna collect it, but it's way above, it's above the road elevation. So the seepage that gets into the marsh would be below the road, and we're not, uh, we're not putting a cutoff wall to try to prevent that seepage from happening. So we're quite a bit above uh, the Jesse Street Marsh, any Jesse Street Marsh seepage that could occur. And we have quite a strong letter from the Army Corps directing us to prevent this uh, type of uh, water movement from happening. I could also let you know that the levee itself already has uh, seepage prevention within the levee. Um, the levee was not built as a clay core levee that prevents uh, the seepage and we, we see it all the time. Um, throughout the city um, on San Lorenzo Boulevard and over um, on the other side in the uh, uh, Third Street parking lot. So we, we see that seepage, it's collected and it's put back into the river. I'll just say for the record, uh, um, so-called seepage is good for the marsh and somehow we have to reconcile that, um, you know, the needs of, of, of us humans along with a viable um, filtration system and a, and a viable marsh because one of the low hanging fruit in the whole climate change mitigations is having, is investing in um, healthy uh, viable marshes. Thank you, Mayor. Any further questions? Not a question, but I will just say there are a lot of people here in the audience and it, it hasn't been clear given all of the statements that have been made 
uh, previously, which which are true. I think it's worth pointing out in the um, staff report that uh, the Army Corps and city staff agreed that the seepage was an emergency situation that could potentially result in a levee breach through sediment transport of embankment material, which could cause the levee to undergo rapid erosion and failure during the next high water event. So this is really a pretty profound um, public safety issue, and we are under many requirements to um, to work with the Army Corps on um, that levy. It's, uh, I think we understand the longer term issues here, but I just wanna put that out because it's, I think it's something that's part of the bigger picture here. Yeah. <clears throat> Any other questions or comments from the council on this item? Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, the bigger picture is a viable marsh and I'm glad that the uh, folks for the next item on the Amamutsin, I think they understand those issues between the conflicts between nature and uh, and the sort of human endeavors. And so that's what's happening and playing itself out here as well. And since uh, Councilmember Matthews made that comment, that's why I'm also making this comment. Any further comments, questions? Thank you very much. Um, at this time, I'm looking for a motion on the remaining items on consent with the exception of items seven, eight, and nine. So I'll move the oh. consent and with the um, revised minutes as submitted. Second. <laughs> we have a motion made by Vice Mayor Myers, seconded <clears throat> by Council Member Crone. Just a question, um, uh, Council Member um, Watkins did make a few comments about um, the, was it item six? Mm -hmm. And those were not part of a motion, I think. Right. But just accepted as recommendations oh, or how do we do that in the minutes if it's on consent well, there was no action taken there was no action so, so we just I take them in. incorporate them into direction to staff yeah okay I just so thank you clarify that yeah. I, I, I also think it's um, it fits with the initial directions right. we right. gave I agree so it's it's in the record yeah previously that, yeah, yeah. Any further questions or comments on items that have not been pulled for consent? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. So we'll return to uh, the items that were pulled on consent, starting with item number seven, which was pulled by Council Member Crone. Um, I know there's many members of the public uh, wanting to speak on this item, and um, it, I'd like to go to the public, but if other council members have statements, that's fine. Okay. Question. Are there any other questions by council members on item number seven at this time? Seeing none, um, we can go to the public for public comment. I know that uh, there was a representative, Chairman Lopez from the Amamutsin Tribal Band who requested four minutes. And so I would like to invite Chairman Lopez up to the podium uh, for four minutes. If any other members of the public would like to speak on item number seven, which is related to the protection of the Amamutsun Tribal Band sacred land of Urasak, I'd like to ask that you please line up to my left and you will have two minutes. Okay. Um, good afternoon, Honorable Council of Santa Cruz City. Thank you so much. I ask you to pause for one second. For those of you who are in the audience, you can't stand and block the people behind you, so thank you. And if you're holding signs up, please make sure that you're holding them low so that you're not blocking the people behind you. Thank you very much. Sorry to interrupt. Good afternoon, Honorable City Council of Santa Cruz, the City of Santa Cruz. Thank you so much for um, scheduling this um, hearing to consider the resolution um, regarding your stock, the protection of your stock and the denial of the sand and gravel mining. My name is Valentin Lopez and I am the chairman of the Ama Mutsun Tribal Band. And our tribe is comprised of the descendants of the indigenous peoples that were taken to Mission San Juan Batista and Mission Santa Cruz. Our people have been on these lands for 12, 14, 15,000 years or more. And if you think of that in terms of generations, our people have been here for 800, 900, perhaps 1,000 generations or more. Many of our members been, believe that we have been here since creation. We do not argue with them, we believe it. Today we're asking you to understand the, the importance of Eurostock and looking at it historically, 
Our, um, I said our people have been here for 15,000 years. Our creation story tells us the Creator very specifically picked our people to live on these lands and to take care of them. We did not look at ownership. Our ancestors did not own this land. They realized that this land belongs to Creator. And the land today, the uh, homes that you own, you may think you have ownership, but truly they belong to Creator. And one day Creator will show us all that. Um, what we learned about the lands in those years is that the land is sacred. And it's our responsibility, all of our responsibility to maintain that sacredness of this land. Is my time up? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was going to say, I really blew it if it is. <laughs> um, to maintain that sacredness of this land. And today we're being challenged to do that. In 2006, elders came to the tribe and they said, our creation story tells us it's our responsibility to take care of Mother Earth and all living things. We must find a way to get back to it. And how could we, a federally unrecognized tribe that you know, have been um, forced out of our territory because we cannot afford to live in these high-priced areas? Our people um, did agriculture. And whenever the Silicon Valley and the San Benito and, the, and, the, you know, and a lot of the other areas, when they transitioned from agriculture to industry to now to Silicon Valley, how could our people live there when they, did not have read, when they didn't read and write and had limited um, uh, uh, skills other than agriculture? It was very difficult. At that time, many of our people had to leave, and they went to Fresno, um, Hanford, Madeira. But in 2006, they said we might find a way to come back. And so since that time, we've been working hard. We've been forming relationships and partnerships with Pinnacles, National Park, um, California State Parks, the um, BLM and the, and the monument. Pinnacle, I'm taking too long. I'm sorry. Your stock is our most sacred site. Our culture, our spirituality, our environments, our humanity has been under attack for generations and generations, and we're asking that be turned around. And we're asking you to not, to, to stand with us to, for the protection of Eurostock and to recognize that our spirituality and our culture must not be lost. As an unrecognized tribe, we are at risk, at risk of extinction. We feel the federal government, because of our, our unrecognized status, is waiting for us to either assimilate or to bleed out. We will not let that happen. We will be here until the last sunrise. We will take care of the lands and the air and the water for you and for all people. Ho. Oh. You'll have, have a, a representative. That gave you'll, have me up, the, the, you'll have up to two minutes, just to let you know. Yeah, two minutes, right? Uh, tribal. Rep I was going to say, a tribal representative gave me the daunting task of following Chairman Lopez. So, my name is Tony Russomano. I'm here representing the Santa Clara, uh, Santa Cruz County uh, Democratic Central Committee uh, and the county's Democratic Party. Last August, the members of our committee voted unanimously to join with the Santa Clara County Democratic Party in urging all relevant government agencies to deny permits to operate a proposed quarry at Yurisak. The Amamutsan Tribal Band of Costanoan Ohlone Indians are the descendants of people who lived here for thousands of years before being forcibly relocated and held by the mission system. Today, they are working to fulfill the responsibilities of their creation story to protect Yurisak, which is the location of known cultural resources and burial grounds. Specifically, we are opposed to plans to operate a cement quarry within Eurostack. It would threaten a Santa Cruz County wildlife corridor, and it would be located within a sensitive watershed of the Pajaro River. The passage of the proposed resolution would add a clear and strong voice in the city's continuing support of the Ama Muslim Tribal Band. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Speaker. Thank you. Before I begin, I would like to offer thanks to the land and to the Amamutsun for their loving stewardship and their refusal to surrender in the face of so many hardships. 
I'm Dora Shuey, a board member of the Santa Cruz ACLU. The ACLU recognizes the crimes and atrocities against, the, against indigenous peoples for centuries and is supporting several bans in their legal efforts. Northern California ACLU staff are working with the Amamutsun so that their stewardship is recognized in the California legal and governmental systems and specifically in protecting your stock. The ACLU membership and many others in Santa Cruz would appreciate the City Council's unanimous support of the resolution before you today. Thank you. First, I'd like to acknowledge Chairman Lopez for his courage and resilience to stand in the face of unimaginable circumstances, reaching out to the United Nations for support to stop our community from committing this crime is sobering. We are in unceded, the unceded village of Uwipi in the nation of Awaswas, now represented by the Amamutsun Tribal Band and you. My name is Greg Cotton. I'm one of the founding members of Friends of Eurostock, a multicultural, ever-growing group that takes responsibility for our system that continues to deny Native people's rights and threatens to continue harm. I'm a local environmental researcher who has worked for, the, for years in the Pajaro River. This mine is very much a threat to an endangered watershed and endangered species. But this pales in comparison to the unimaginable and irreversible harm it would cause to human beings, both native and non-native. Our community has enjoyed an idyllic story of the colonization of this land that we now enjoy. Like the Southern Confederacy, we often omit the brutal part of our history and for obvious and uncomfortable reasons. We name streets and raise romanticized mission bells in our parks that celebrate this brutal history. We are now here today to stand together, to turn this tide and transform the very heart of our uh, and the foundation of our community and maybe even heal a little bit in the process. I'm moved and proud to be part of this community and showing up in a meaningful ways to correct this system of injustice. It can be the beginning of something truly extraordinary, a radical notion where indigenous people are respected and celebrated for who they are, great leaders, extraordinary artists, spiritual leaders, teachers, neighbors, and human beings with spiritual rights. I urge the council to vote unanimously in support of the Amamutsun Tribal Ban. This is the future. Thank you for being leaders in it. Thank you. I'll probably keep this short, uh, Garrett, um, Philip. Um, you know, I don't have an opinion actually about this property because it's far away. I know the details of it. Um, it may well be a historic area that is worth preserving as an open land. I, I don't know. Um, but I do know that what I see here is, I'll read a little of this, kind of some of this a little too harsh, so I'll go, go over it. But uh, again, we see the progressive Glover Cummings crone trying to savage private property rights of U.S. citizens, this time four miles south of Gilroy, a real stretch of jurisdictional imagination. I'm assuming it is for political leftist virtuosity grandstanding purposes, because otherwise it has no purpose or jurisdiction taking sides in this kind of a faraway dispute in the name of the city. Disputes are really handled by courts normally. Um, you know, and it is sort of a dispute and not within your jurisdiction. Um, uh, does it have anything to do with running the city? No. Uh, what is this supposed partnership with Amamutsun Tribal Band? I'm not sure, other than you both, the progressives anyway, and they share this victim oppressor uh, ideology, you know, yeah, okay, the just, sort of excuse me. I just like to say to members of the public that everyone is invited to their own opinion, and we have to respect everyone's opinion within our community, so please, no booing, continue. Okay, I don't see any quid pro quo, I don't know what you get out of that partnership. Um, uh, let's say has no place in the agenda, it's more the any developer, any economic activity, mistaken, mistaken victim, oppressor, knee-jerk progressive agenda, sticking its nose into a very far away, none of your business business, taking sides and declaring a verdict that injustice has been done. It's not your legislative job to weigh in on disputes, even less far outside the city. That's what the courts are for. 
They can decide if that dirt is more sacred than property rights. Thanks. Thank you. Next speaker. Hello. Um, my name is Erica Sunovich, and I'm currently the Conservation Committee Chair of the Sierra Club. I'd like to start by saying thank you so much to Val Lopez for your incredible leadership on this issue, and thank you to the City Council for considering supporting your SAC. And like many people have mentioned before, your SAC is of extraordinary cultural and biological resources, and also is a source of the Pajaro River watershed. And so it's so important that we protect your SAC on so, so, so many levels. And so I am thanking you all for considering this resolution and urge you to please vote unanimously in support of it. Thank you. Mishmitru Hish, Kanrakat Amamutse Nation. My name is Catherine Luna, I am a tribal member. I traveled here today from Fresno. I wanna let you know that I live in an area where the land has been quarried. I wanna let you know that there's days where our children cannot come outside because the air is polluted, the air is bad. We have towers in the valley that tell us when the air is moderate, severe, when you don't see the stars. You smell, today in the morning, I smell the, the uh, scent of kerosene coming through my nose as I walked out the door. That's what you will be smelling when you see the traffic succumb to tearing down the, our sacred mountain. I'm coming to you in a basic way. I live in the area where they tore down our land, the land of the Monos, the land of Chichansi. This is our land, Hodestock. You now live here. It is all our responsibility to take care of the sacred land, to understand that air pollution, water pollution, sound pollution is non-discriminatory. It'll affect you, or maybe it'll affect your generations after you, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, when they walk with asthma, lung diseases, or even may have one lung to breathe with. This is a serious condition of when somebody wants to desecrate not only sacred land, but to take the land down, take those watersheds, stop migration of water life, wildlife, plant life, finned, winged. It's a whole different story when you live it. Today I took the time. Today I wanna come back home and I wanna see sacred our sacred land, Huddestock, as it once was for all of our generations be behind me and all of our ancestors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You'll have two minutes. Thank you, everybody who spoke. I totally in agreement. It is our responsibility to take care of Mother Earth and all living things. We are at risk of extinction, actually, all living things on the planet. And I'm just quoting some of this. This mine is a threat to all life, needs to be stopped. And the previous speaker spoke about how we don't see the stars and pollution is non-discriminatory. In thinking of protecting all living things, I have an article here, the honeybees plea, the honeybees plea. And it's about the bees dying from 5G technology, but also this happened over a hundred years ago on the Isle of Wight. The bees dying when Marconi put in a wireless uh, communication system and it changed all life. Um, we need to stop the proliferation of wireless microwave technology everywhere. Every Every business, every city, every town, every place on the planet 
is being exposed to this existential threat and we need you to do whatever you can to stop the mine, stop the wireless microwave assault. And I have other articles of the honeybees plea by Arthur Furstenberg of Cell Phone Task Force. So thank you for your time and very moved by the previous speakers here. Thank you so much. Yeah. Is there any other member of the public who would like to speak to us on item number seven? Okay, seeing none, I'll move back to Council for Action and Deliberation. Council Member Crum. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you all for coming, taking your time out of the, the, the day right now to, um, to be here with us. This is wonderful. Uh, Mayor, I'd like to make a motion a resolution recognizing and supporting the Amamutsin Tribal Band in protecting their sacred lands of Hurastak from the developments of public or private entities and instruct the mayor to send a letter to Santa Clara County. And I just wanna quote one thing from our, um, from our resolution. Now therefore be it resolved that the city council and the city of Santa Cruz supports the efforts of the Amamutsin Tribal Band to preserve Sergeant Ranch Jurastak as open space in perpetuity and to regain access to their cultural and spiritual sites at Eurostock. Second. So I just wanna bring this back for a second. Um, Council Member Crone, um, can you restate, I know that you just read that off, but I'm wondering if you could restate clearly what the motion is. Um, and then if there's other comments we wanna make after we've made the motion, I think that's appropriate. But just so for the purposes of minutes and clearly knowing what the motion is on the floor, can you? Okay, the motion on the floor is uh, resolution recognizing and supporting the Amamutsin tribal band in protecting their sacred lands at Eurostock from the development by public or private entities. And we instruct the mayor to send a letter to Santa Clara County. Second. Okay. So motion made by council member Crone, seconded by council member Glover. Um, I noticed that council member Glover, you had your hand up and then vice mayor Myers, council member Matthews and then council member Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you for the motion, Council Member Crone, and thank you to everyone who came out today to address us on this issue. It's <coughs> been something that I've been looking forward to for a while now and being able to have these conversations and have the force of the city, or at least the voice of the city, behind the Amamutsin Tribal Band, the Friends of Eurostack, the, uh, you know, I went to the, uh, the walk for Eurostack that took place down in the San Juan Batista area and participated in that action. It was not only powerful, but amazing to see the amount of support that exists uh, for this movement and for the protection of the lands. And I just wanna emphasize, because I know that there was at least one speaker that said that it didn't have anything to do with the city. And it's the concept that everything is interconnected that I think we need to be emphasizing and taking into consideration with this resolution is that what affects one affects all of us. And especially when it comes to the protection of sacred sites, but also in environmental sustainability and stewardship, if we lose access to watersheds or if we pollute watersheds, if we destroy migratory paths, it will impact not only the people in that immediate area, but it, as was said by the speaker from Fresno, will impact generations uh, in, uh, in perpetuity potentially into the future, especially if we cause extinction events uh, and so forth. So I'm, I'm proud to uh, be able to be a part of this vote and we'll be supporting the motion. Vice Mayor Myers. I just want, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I just wanted to thank everybody for coming today. Um, I was fortunate enough to be part of a research team that um, actually studied the wildlife corridor aspect of the property for many years and um, it is, and it is a linchpin piece of the earth that um, basically links um, all of the mountains in the Bay Area to the southern Big Sur and beyond. So um, for those in the public who may or may not know the specialness of this piece of land, um, from a biological perspective, it's incredibly, incredibly important and um, it does serve uh, a, a critical piece of uh, what our landscape in California actually um, functions through. So I just wanted to um, just thank you all for your efforts and um, your work is incredibly important and um, I certainly will be supporting the motion and I'm, I'm very pleased that you brought this all to our city and um, we are part of a bioregion and we need to all be aware of, of the things that work together here to, uh, to keep our communities uh, in wellness. Thanks. Council Member Matthews. Thank you. 
I'm happy to also add my support uh, to the motion. I have, a, a think, a very friendly suggestion. That is to add the word adopt to the very beginning. We adopt the resolution. And then um, add the words um, and encourage the Tribal Council to share our resolution with others as they deem appropriate. Um, and then I also, if, if that's a friendly amendment. That's a friendly amendment. amendment that's been that is a friendly amendment. Thank you. And um, I just want to point out, I happen to see just, pardon? Where are you putting that? Um, at the end of the motion, just say, and encourage the Tribal Council to share our resolution with others as appropriate. And, so, uh, and I just want to point out um, a magazine article I came across just a couple weeks ago, what stewardship looks like. It's uh, a very um, descriptive uh, insight and, and Val is the poster child. <laughs> <laughs> um, about um, incorporating indigenous um, practices and peoples in uh, a, a deep view of land stewardship of natural areas. So um, right in the theme that we're talking about. Yeah. Thank you. I'll share this with council later. Yeah. Council Member Brown. Yeah, I have uh, just, I just wanna make a quick comment first to thank everybody who's come out uh, <clears throat> today and all of you have been working so hard on uh, trying to raise awareness about this really critical issue. I think that, um, you know, we got a lot of letters of support and uh, they were very um, moving and persuasive. I didn't need persuading, but um, I just want to read a couple of sentences from one, fr and this is from Rua Bush. I don't know if I got that name right, and I don't know if you are here, but it was really a beautiful um, letter. And so in addition to the Kind of environmental, <laughs> wildlife, uh, public health issues, obviously, that this uh, project or proposed project raises. Um, it's really critical that we um, recognize the, 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 the critical foundation of this site, as, um, as Val suggests, uh, to the Yamamuts. And um, they're US citizens, Santa Clara and Santa Cruz County residents, members of our community, our neighbors, classmates, coworkers, and friends. The construction of a gravel mine at Turistock would be a decisive blow to the continuity of Mutsun culture and curtail their ability to perform the rituals and ceremonies necessary for the functioning of their cosmology and community well-being. And so I'm really pleased to be here to support uh, this resolution. And I would ask if the maker and seconder of the motion would accept one additional friendly amendment to, in addition to um, directing the mayor to send a letter to Santa Clara County, uh, directing the mayor to also send, issue a press release about our action today. Yes, thank you, good idea. Accepted. Yep, that was a friendly amendment made by Councilmember Brown, accepted by Council Members Crone and Glover as makers of the motion. Is there any other comments? I'll just, I'll just briefly add on to what has already been said by my colleagues here. I want to thank those who came. I know, Val, we tried to connect, and um, I think there was some sort of incident over Highway 17, so it's really, it's really great to see this on our agenda. I'm happy to support this resolution moving forward, and I'm pleased to hear of the amendments to express that beyond our city and into the public, so hopefully we can get more support as well. Thank you. Well, I'd just like to say that um, I agree with all the council members who've expressed their sentiments today and want to thank you all again for showing up in such large numbers in support of this resolution. And I think that it was summed up very well when someone said that, you know, to paraphrase, we might not all be from here, but we all live here and we have a responsibility to protect our lands and to protect uh, the, the sacred lands of the indigenous communities who have been the original people of this area. So with that, um, is there any other questions or comments by council members? Okay, um, I'd like to, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Next up is item number 
eight on our council agenda, which is the UCSC grad student strike. Before this happens, um, maybe we'll take a couple minutes. If there are individuals who are gonna leave at this time, uh, we'll give you the opportunity to exit the building and we'll reconvene in about, we'll give ourselves a five minute break. I try to connect with that. There's an ad for the wildlife. Okay. We will return um, items that are on consent. Moving forward, item number eight that was pulled by Council Member Crone regarding UCSC graduate student strike. Councilmember Crone. Thank you, Mayor. This is a very sort of timely issue too um, with the, uh, the stuff that's going on, the strike that's going on right now in front of uh, UCSC. And uh, we all know that something has to give here. We have a... a a terrible uh, housing, an affordable housing crisis in Santa Cruz. And I'm really happy to uh, bring this issue before um, this body, especially because sometimes the city on a hill is a city on a hill and there's a lot of separation between the town and the gown. And I think that the more we talk to each other um, instead of about each other, I think the better we'll be off, the, the better off we'll be uh, I would like to hear from, I know there's some folks present uh, who might like to address the council. Uh, so that's really, I don't have any, you know, there's no motion that I would make yet. Are there any other questions or comments by members of the city council? Seeing none, we'll open it up to public comment for two minutes. Those of you who would like to comment on item number eight related to UCSC graduate student strike at UCSC, please line up to my left and you will have two minutes to speak. Uh, thank you, good afternoon. Uh, several weeks ago, I brought before you documentation about the uh, university's housing prices, which were two to three times the rate of the in-town prices. In Chancellor Reeves' uh, <clears throat> email to the community or to the UCSC community, she talked about housing affordability on to in town. How the problem of housing ability, affordability starts with UCSC on campus. And the high in-town rents are because of UCSC's exorbitant prices. This week, City on the Hill, 711 empty beds on campus. Do you guys see the connection? It's because of the exorbitant rates in on campus that create the demand for students to move off campus. So if, I'm sure the COLA would be great for the few graduate students who'd get it, but if you guys really wanna have an impact I mean, measure M, you create 100 affordable units here, 100 market rate units here, that's nothing. University is projected to grow by 8,500 students. The only really impactful thing we can do as a city is to put pressure on UCSC to provide housing that's at least on par with the city. I mean, could you imagine, instead of being two to three times more expensive, and for those who didn't hear me, Four bedroom apartment on campus, more than $9,500 a month. That's not with food service. Two bedroom apartment, almost $6,000 a month. So that's two to three times what the in-town rates are. What if they were one third to one half? Do you think that there'd be 711 empty beds on campus? No, I can tell you as a landlord, rents would drop dramatically. So I urge you if you're gonna adopt this motion to add a statement about UCSC's culpability in a demand that they lower their rent and provide adequate housing, adequate amount of housing on campus. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker. And if y'all wanted to come back behind me. Thank you, Council, for the opportunity to speak. My name is Sam Hughes. I'm a PhD candidate in the Social Psychology Department at University of California, Santa Cruz. I'm here today to provide some context regarding the situation that graduate students who are striking at UCSC are currently experiencing. Because of the cost of housing in Santa Cruz being so high and housing being so scarce, graduate students at UCSC have had to take extreme steps to afford living here. We regularly take out exorbitant student loans. Some graduate students participate in sex work or sell drugs 
in order to make ends meet, and some avoid re uh, reporting toxic mold for fear of losing their housing. Some have stayed in abusive relationships or resorted to living in their cars or garages, and many choose to skip meals in order to save money. Despite these challenges, many of us work up to 60 hours a week conducting groundbreaking research to benefit our city and community. We work to prevent environmental degradation, improve the quality of math education, work towards ending sexual violence, make pesticides safer, provide recommendations for addressing racial inequity, protect our community from the spread of coronavirus by mapping its genome, work towards improving treatments for cancer, keep mercury out of our food supply, and support formerly incarcerated students re-entering the educational system. Much of that is not paid for us for our to work. Instead, we're paid wages that do not cover the basic cost of living in exchange for an additional 20 hours a week of teaching. For months, we asked the university to provide us with funding to help address the high cost of living in Santa Cruz. And so far, they have only offered a small amount on a needs basis, potentially punishing students who've taken on second jobs in order to stay afloat, who won't get access to that money, and preventing access to that funding for some of our most vulnerable students, international students that can't apply for that funding via FISA or by, via FAFSA. Uh, horrifyingly, last Friday, the university issued veiled threats to deport international students for participating in a strike. Even worse, the money that they're offering will be taken away as soon as the university uh, provides more graduate housing, which is planned to be above market rates. Their offer is unreasonable and comes with severe punishments for graduate students So we're who are just striking to get their basic needs met. Excuse me, sir. Yep. Time's up. People Thank shouldn't you. have to do sex work to earn a PhD. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Can I ask, I know you were all were in line um, before. Yeah, I, I get that. I'm just saying if you all are going to stand, I'm going to ask that you stand over here and then come up one by one um, rather than kind of all stand in front of everyone in the audience during this entire time. So go ahead. You'll have two minutes. Uh, council members, mayor, thank you for your time. I'm a, my name is Molly Hafer, and I'm a politics undergraduate at UC Santa Cruz, and I'm here to talk on some of the opinions of the undergrads during this strike. As undergrads, a major part of our education comes from the hard work of our TAs and our graduate students. They pour so much into making sure we thrive in our classes, so it only makes sense they should be able to thrive in their home lives. In the end, housing situations have a dramatic impact on work performance, and if one branch of our student body hurts, we all hurt. Undergraduates and graduate students are together in this issue, contrary to the administration's rhetoric. I'd rather have my fellow students be able to have food and shelter than know what my grades are. And that is all I have to say. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker. <clears throat> Thank you all. Uh, I'm Julia Sores. I'm a sixth year uh, PhD student at UCSC and a Santa Cruz resident for the last five and a half years. In the time I've lived here, I've watched my friends and colleagues grow more and more desperate to meet rent. Between teaching, mentorship, research, and research, most of my colleagues work more than 60 hours a week but have no financial stability. There have been times where I did nothing but work from when I wake up and when I sleep for weeks. But still, we don't make enough to live without severe rent burden. Please stand with us, your graduate student neighbors. Everyone deserves a living wage. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Barrett Phillip. Uh, the simple is, that phrase is just stay out of it. You have no business weighing in on labor negotiations between employees and UCSC. UCSC has its obligations to negotiate on behalf of the public as it is a public institution with labor, something you could all remind yourselves from time to time also about who you are supposed to represent and what American values of individual, individual rights you should represent. Would you appreciate UCSC weighing in on your labor negotiations? or anyone in the city appreciate your weighing in on their labor negotiations? Uh, that doesn't require an answer because I can answer for you as one who supposedly you represent. No. Uh, you always represent all people, even taxpayers, with sound fiscal policy. You have no divining rod for price discovery that is none of your business or the governments in general, really. You are attempting to interfere in a free market. For the work time required, graduate assistants get paid far above minimum wage, far above your own definition of a living wage. I think I calculated the starting wage at 27 an hour. It is a, can be a part-time job. You don't live on a part-time job. Uh, this is essentially the usual leftist, progressive, Brown, Cummings, Glover, consideration of the public as a cow to be milked again, since the money to pay for this will come from the public. And it will probably also actually work its way into higher costs for students, because there's no free lunch, you know. Um, anyway. 
Uh, maybe they deserve more, maybe less. That's up to them and UCSC to, de to decide and exercise their individual rights to do so, not you. Uh, it's another exercise in leftist council members, virtuosity signaling, Marxist victim, oppressor, collectivist, priority endorsing, sticking its nose where it doesn't belong, possible political grandstanding, and should not be here as an agenda item. Um, the recall should come soon enough. I see some of you aren't paying attention. Oh, unbelievable. Never seen that before. Anyway, here's a little quote. P price discovery is not a sexy function of markets, but it is critical to the efficient allocation of scarce capital and resources and to the economy as a whole. Okay. We finished that one. Yep. Next speaker. Hello, my name is Yulia. I'm a fourth year graduate student. Uh, I am also a striker. I'm an international student who has uh, faced veiled threats of deportation as a striker. Um, I am also one of the organizers of the COLA campaign. I, uh, I can report to heavy police presence on campus, policing peaceful protesters. There was one arrest, and apart from violence and um, injuries that occurred in as a direct result of police enforcement, no injuries have happened. The strike is peaceful and uh, all measures are in place to ensure public safety. We have strike captains, we have people who are ensuring safe passage of vehicles and people. Uh, we have, throughout this campaign, we've collected uh, testimonies that prove that we're paid poverty wages and graduate students live in poverty. Graduate, being a graduate student is a full-time job on top of being a teaching assistant or being a research assistant, and we ask that you intervene and stand on our behalf. Thank you. Any other member of the public who would like to speak to us on this item? Seeing none, I'll return to Council for Action and Deliberation. Council Member Glover and then Council Member Crump. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to make a motion to direct the mayor to write to the University of California Santa Cruz administration to acknowledge how difficult it is for UCSC graduate students to try to live in a community where the cost of rent far outstrips their salaries, express the city of Santa Cruz support for the, for COLA for um, graduate students and re request the cost of living adjustment and call for an immediate remedy and resolution. There was a small change there from the main recommendation and that was to change the words from support the current strike to supporting the uh, COLA for all for all students. I'll second that. If you would add, um, I think uh, Mr. Grodberg makes a good point that in the mayor's letter, if he could also address the uh, exorbitant rents that UCSC charges on campus Accepted. Okay, so there's a motion made by Council Member Glover, seconded by Council Member Crone with a friendly amendment. Can you ex can you say the specifically what that friendly amendment is because it didn't, didn't feel like that came out very clear? That the mayor would um, include in, in, in your letter uh, sentiment about the exorbitant rents that are charged on campus and those rents essentially setting the market in Santa Cruz because all landlords pay attention to that, to the rate that they charge. Again, I'm just gonna, I'm trying to do this for clarity's sake. Yeah, yeah. That if you're gonna make a friendly amendment or if we're making motions that we state the language. Okay, that the mayor, that the mayor's letter address the exorbitant rents that UCSC charges on its campus housing. Period. 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 <laughs> now, if you'd like to, make I thought you wanted a conversation. If you'd like to make comments on after we make the motions and the friendly amendments, it's fine to make comments. But I think let's, it's important that we clearly state what our motions and friendly amendments are, so that the clerk is able to capture them and the public understands what the motion on the floor is. So, and I accept that friendly amendment. Okay. So, friendly amendment made by Councilmember Crone, accepted by Councilmember Glover, um, Councilmember Matthews. 
Um, I appreciate the modification in the language uh, and am happy to support it as now proposed. Um, and I just want to point out, I'm not going to make part of the motion, but point out we had an introduction at the beginning of our meeting this afternoon of Morgan, who's been hired as the um, uh, to staff the effort of the uh, Measure U City County Group to deal with the impacts of university growth. And uh, this just makes it very clearly. And one of the main um, directions of her work will be to connect with students and have them convey the impact of university growth on their student experience, the quality of their student experience. And certainly, even the thousands of units that are proposed on campus now, currently in the courts, but even those don't deal with growth. So uh, for those who are looking a little bit longer in the future and want to become involved um, with our advocate on that issue, uh, you're welcome to get in touch with me after the meeting and, and I'll make sure that you are connected with Morgan. Yeah. Thank you. Councilmember Brown and then myself and then Councilmember Glover. Uh, uh, just really quickly, I'm uh, pleased to support the motion and appreciate the language change. I did want to acknowledge that in addition to the, the requests and, and letters we've received from people in the community in support of this action, we did receive a message from uh, Chancellor Lurie, and I did, I just mm -hmm. wanted to acknowledge that um, we received it. We appreciate the efforts that um, that she's discussed, talked about um, initiating and, and believe that, um, you know, it, that's a good start, but there's ways to go in order for uh, graduate students to be able to, um, you know, survive in this community. And I also want to just say, this is not, uh, in, from my perspective, this is not an attempt to interfere with uh, their labor management negotiations. This is a uh, response to a request from members, a, a desperate request from members of our community to support um, their struggle. And so, uh, you know, I just wanted to make those comments and say, um, I'll be mm -hmm. voting yes. Okay. I just wanted to, well, I'll add Council Member Cronin Stack. Um, I'd actually like to ask for a friendly amendment uh, to the motion. Uh, first, I want to express that, you know, kind of as my colleagues have been stating, you know, this is the council's response to members of the public, specifically graduate students who have been reaching out to us, asking for our support with them. And in no way are we trying to influence any kind of labor negotiation. Um, that being said, though, uh, having come to Santa Cruz as a grad student and not being far removed, having only graduated back in 2013, I understand the struggles of grad students um, as far as how difficult it is to live in town off the stipends that grad students receive, especially because housing costs have probably doubled since I left as a graduate student in 2013, and the um, salaries of graduate students have not seen that same amount of increase. And so I totally feel for the grad students in this situation. Additionally, since attending graduate school, or beginning, I should say, in 2007. Um, I have not ever heard of the type of force that's being used on campus um, ever before, and so I would actually like to also, as a friendly amendment, ask that we encourage the, um, the, the UCSC um, reduces the amount of police presence um, that's being seen on campus. Here, here, I love, I, I appreciate that taking it up a notch and I completely support that addition and amendment. And it's an encouragement, so, you know, I think that it's. I, I, as a seconder, I also do too, but, and I understand that I think we've had it, sporadic conversations with our own police department in their um, uh, involvement in the, in the strike as well, and I think they have sort of taken it down a notch uh, because this is a UCSC issue and um, it's a problem I think that they've created uh, and they can solve it too. And, and just so the public is aware, we received a letter from our police department yesterday. They were not on campus yesterday and involved in any of the activities. My understanding is today they were gonna be um, on campus dealing with traffic related um, issues. So I just wanted to make sure that it was clear from what my colleagues were stating that uh, the Santa Cruz Police Department weren't involved in any of yesterday's activities. So just to be clear. Council Member Glover and Vice Mayor Myers. Councilmember Brown, Council Member Watkins. Go ahead. Thank you, I think it was, I don't mean to question you, Mayor, I think it was Council Member Crown after oh, it was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, so two things. One, uh, yeah, just to reiterate what the mayor just mentioned, uh, we received correspondence from the police chief saying that he'll be instructing our SCPD staff not to participate in any of the, I believe, enforcement or the arrests that are going that could potentially take place on campus. So we're trying to control it that way. And I just was hoping that the uh, clerk in the motion, I may have forgot the word um, to support the COLA for all and also uh, the cost of living adjustments and the campaign COLA for all. I just wanted to make sure that that was included in there to emphasize the support for the campaign and the work that's going on there. We good? Cool, thank you. Council Member Crone. Uh, I wanted to underscore what Council Member Matthews was saying because for the first time the city has an advocate that we actually have staff that's gonna work with the university, between the city and the university, and needs uh, help from all of you as well as a lot of folks who are on campus uh, and in making it really clear in Sacramento what the pressures are here because they're not really getting it there right now is from our experience and that's what this person hopefully will be um, putting together research and interviews and taking it to um, those elected folks in Sacramento. Ms. Mayor Myers. I just wanna thank the students who came out today and um, you know, we obviously have limited, um, we, we, we can certainly show support and are very supportive of, of what's happening with the students here living in Santa Cruz. Um, my uh, ask of you today is to also hold us accountable. Um, we need to build more housing in Santa Cruz. And um, so please come ask us to do that. We um, have uh, done a lot of work over the last couple years and we still have, are not building housing. So um, we, you know, that's one way to try to um, make your residence here in the time or maybe your permanent residence here um, while you, uh, you know, figure out where, what you're doing in the future. But uh, we have a housing emergency in our city and uh, that needs to be part of, of also what, what you need to be asking us to do is let's build some housing. Thank you. Council Member Brown took herself off stack. So Council Member Watkins. Sure, I'll just, I just wanted to echo what Councilmember Crone acknowledged about Councilmember Matthews' comments in regards to having this person now here to help us work with the university and advocate for uh, a better relationship and, and moving forward for uh, meeting our, our city's needs. And then also Councilmember Brown's comments in regards to hearing from the chancellor and how we as a city need to work with the university to be able to ensure that we have a, a, a sound partnership, but recognizing that these needs impact our community and impact the university. And and I thank the students for being here. Um, I think also on a kind of a, may, maybe at a, a larger level, it's disheartening to know that we haven't valued education to the point where we want to see higher education thrive and people be able to make that work because we have such a need to have brains in our in our nation um, leading the way and and it makes it really hard and it makes it really elite and so um, just recognizing the struggle and knowing that that struggle is existing for many others as well. I do wanted to get clear. I wanted to get a little bit of clarification on the last friendly amendment, um, and I, I sort of how I heard it or maybe understand it is more um, thinking about how we would encourage sort of more de-escalation -escal strategies um, as opposed to force. Is that reflective? I, I don't know, or maybe if you don't mind repeating what you had. Sure. Um, what I had asked is that we um, encourage the chancellor to um, consider reducing the amount of police presence and. Additionally, adding in force um, would be appropriate. I just have been receiving numerous photos from uh, students where they're showing on the order of 50, 60 police officers who are on site. Um, I personally know of at least three people who have been uh, strict, struck by cops, one of whom has a concussion, the other who was struck in the abdomen, and another who was pushed around, and that's just three of um, other reports of the police using um, excessive force on the students who were on campus. And so um, it's many of the students have reached out and they've said, you know, it's really intimidating that there's so many police officers. Is there anything the city can do? I inform them that the city's police officers aren't up there, but, you know, we could encourage that um, they, you know, minimize their, their presence or, um, and also, and additionally reduce the amount of force that they're using. How about adding campus police, just to clarify in the language that goes out? Does that sound legit? Campus police, but also I know that there's there's reports of other police from other highway jurisdictions patrol. and highway patrol. Mm -hmm. So I would say, yeah, campus police, highway patrol. Oh, 
I just want to say, just for to help try to help clarify. So the way, so I I've been at on that end of a, I'm, I'm not going to say the wrong end because there is no right end, I believe, of a police baton. But um, you know, having been there as a graduate student at Berkeley, what we learned, and I and it happens at all the campuses, is that um, regionally police force, you know. Some police forces will come in, and if their jurisdictions are willing to loan them out for these purposes, then they'll um, come onto the university campuses. So, in this case, it's Highway Patrol, I think, is the only other one, but it, there could be other um, local law enforcement. Mm -hmm. I don't believe the sheriff's office has sent people up. But so it, it can be, so law, making it kind of law enforcement in general mm -hmm. um, kind of covers whoever might end up. I just have a quick, maybe one more question. Is that something that the chan chancellor in, impacts or who makes that call? Is that the, I mean, I, I guess just for clarification on what that means. My understanding, it's the university. The university. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. so. the, the word D, uh, oh, oh, sorry. It's a friendly amendment now, UCSC campus police and California Highway Patrol. I would say law enforcement. I think the, the appropriate will be law participating law enforcement. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then was that accepted as a friendly amendment? Yes. Yeah, and I think the word that um, Councilmember Watkins used, de-escalation, I, I like that word. I don't know if you can want to fit it in there at all or if, it, or if you think it fits in your um, friendly amendment. I put reduce, I put reduce use of force. Okay. Or, sure. Or, yeah. And encourage de escalation. Yeah. I think that would be Different appropriate. Things. <laughs> yeah, I'd, ac I'd accept it. And, 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 um, and maybe for de escalation, de -escalation <laughs> strategies. Yeah, except might, I, might I say maybe prioritize de escalation strategies? Sure. Perfect. Okay. There you go. Yep. Right. Accept it. Reduce force and prioritize de escalation strategies. Yeah. Sounds like the final language. All right. Councilman, make one final comment on uh, the um, campus, the organizer for Measure U, campus growth uh, advocate that's just been hired. One of I, I mentioned she would be uh, connecting, among others, with university groups, uh, with student groups, and one of the uh, strategies is um, well, we we lobby to our local, our state um, um, assembly and and uh, senators. And they say, well, of course, you're from Santa Cruz, you know that's your issue. But one of the objectives is to reach out to students. Where are you from? Are you from Central Valley? Are you from Southern California? Are you from wherever? Who are your elected officials in the state so that you as a graduate student and your family uh, presumably say, we're speaking to you as, as your constituents statewide so that we, we broaden the awareness of the impact of campus growth on the student experience here in Santa Cruz to include students from the entire state. So I just want to explain a little bit about the, that's one of the strategies that she'll be following. Thank you for that comment. All right. And I'd just like to let um, the other council members know and the public know that I'm going to be personally meeting with the chancellor tomorrow to discuss um, city university relations. So if there's anything, um, I know this will be likely a topic of conversation. <laughs> and if there's other um, issues that uh, anyone would like us me to bring up at that time, that I'm going to be going there. I'm going to be meeting with the chancellor at one. So, okay. Seeing no more comments. Or the, questions? Sorry, if we could, can we get the motion read again? Oh, sure. <laughs> Just to make sure we're clear. Okay, I have it broken down. Okay. I don't have it combined. Sure. Um, direct the mayor to write to UCSC administration to acknowledge how difficult it is for UCSC graduate student to try to live in a community where the cost of rent far outstrips their salaries. Express support for a COLA for graduate students, the student's request for a cost of living adjustment and the campaign COLA for all and call for an immediate remedy and resolution. Uh, friendly amendment that was accepted to include um, in the letter of um, sentiments about rent, exorbitant rent charges campus. on campus and request that council encourage participating law enforcement agencies to reduce the amount of police presence in use of force and prioritize de-escalation strategies. 
right. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? It passes unanimously. All right, last item, we're just so um, council members are aware, um, we're about five minutes over and we still have one item left on consent, which is our city council policy 6.9 council request, which was pulled by, council, by Vice Mayor Donna Myers. And so I'll turn it over to Vice Mayor Myers. Um, I just wanted to state that I'm not gonna support the, um, the motion. Um, I think we've, I think we, from what I understand, we've used this on two agenda reports, and I feel like there was a lot of work gone into um, what looked to me like a pretty, um, pretty viable process. And I understand testing it out in the first couple couple of agenda reports is is always difficult. I'm sure between the um, the agenda folks who were trying to to complete those reports as well as the staff, but I feel like. Um, I just feel like we're we're just sort of sort of casting aside. So I understand we'll have a subcommittee, but I'm not going to support that. I feel like we just we really are jumping the gun and not really testing this out in a long enough period of time. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Are there any questions by council members? Council member Watkins. I think I too would I too haven't had a chance to actually like try out by writing a report and using it. So I think for me I prefer if I'm happy to be part of the subcommittee and I'm happy to look at how we can sort of base it on what's been sort of established, but I'd like to fine tune it before just completely rescinding it personally. And I'm wondering if there'd be potential for movement on that while the council looks at some of the challenges that may arise with it as it comes that you experienced in the first agenda reports, but could likely go forward even further to then be informed as we look at a new strategy. Because for me, I haven't had a chance to really see what is like substantially flawed about it, you know what I mean? So I, I'm wondering instead of just completely rescinding it, if there would be a potential for discussion around having it temporarily in place for trial to understand how to fine tune and improve moving forward. Councilmember Matthews. Uh, I'm thinking along those same lines that perhaps the direction to go since there was a subcommittee that met and apparently agreed unanimously on it when it was brought to the council. Council approved it unanimously, the um, motion currently on, the um, policy currently on the record. Um, the motion could be to um, revisit the current policy for uh, clarification and streamlining and use the committee that's been suggested here uh, to do that, um, just to give us a, a chance to, um, um, make it more workable without abandoning it. And I think what was driving the uh, motion that we recently adopted, not the motion, the policy we recently adopted that is currently before us, um, that was a, an effort to grapple with the um, kind of steady stream of major work products um, put before staff to accomplish in a fairly quick turnaround, which uh, I think most of us would agree uh, has not been workable or satisfying. So my preference would be to um, revisit and clarify the existing policy for um, uh, streamlining and clarity. Councilmember Brown. Yeah, I um, I was reluctantly supported the policy when it came before us previously um, because of all of the work that had gone into it. I did at the time believe it was overly complicated and could get us into some challenges around how it's interpreted and operationalized. Um, so I think at the moment, I, my preference would be that we rescind the motion uh, or the, excuse me, the policy and um, you, you know, use that um, as a basis for refinement. I, mean, I don't think we need to throw, like, we don't need to throw it out entirely, but I'd prefer that we not be using it and encountering potentially more challenges. I think just rewriting it, making those revisions in the subcommittee. And if I could ask the question, um, Vice Mayor Myers, does it, are you not willing to serve on the, the committee in your opposition, or because I'll you can I'll you can no, I'm willing to I'm willing to serve okay. on the committee. I'm okay. just I I'm I. 
just expressing that I won't support the the um, the rescinding and going back to the 1998 policy because I I just don't think we've tested out the new policies. So, um, thank you. It's not in favor of that portion of the motion. Any other comments by council members before we open up to the public for a public comment? Okay. Is there any member of the public who would like to comment on item number nine, which is city council policy 6.9, council request? Okay, if you would like to please line up to the left, you'll have two minutes. I'm assuming this is about getting items on the agenda. Mm -hmm. I think that would have been nice if it had been clearly stated in the agenda today for the public and I find it telling that it is not. The agenda has been an enormous political football and problem ever since the progressives achieved a so-called majority on city council, <laughs> which became effective in 2019. I will note that it has been so political that Santa Cruz Together, which enunciated in its public meeting that Drew Glover was going to be a target of their recall, which they were calling at the time a special election, they perceived Drew as vulnerable and they were going to go after him. And they were specifically going to go after him using the homeless issue because Drew, they knew, was an outstanding advocate for the most poor and homeless in our community. Interesting that we were able as progressives to get one big issue on the agenda, and I'm sure Cynthia is gonna try to counter this, but I really hope that she does not. Um, because it was the only thing we were able to get on the agenda for the first three months that would really look toward helping the homeless. And it was engineered in such a way that although we started with every potential available site that we could have a transitional encampment, it got down to one, which was Depot Park, and it was cultivated to be an unfriendly community toward homeless, and it was specifically used against Drew. So to say that this issue is political, which our members who are under attack cannot say because they are under attack, I am saying this needs to be revisited, it needs to be transparent, and the public needs to be able to also have a say in what gets agendized. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. I'll be brief. I looked in the binder and I couldn't find information about what what the policy was in 1998, and I would have loved to have read it or made copies or taken pictures. So I don't really know what the difference is. That's all I'm stating. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Oh. Good afternoon, Scott Graham. Um, the city of Berkeley has a rather extensive protocol for putting things on the agenda, which I have sent to most of you, I believe. Um, and I think that the uh, group that's going, going to look at the revision should uh, possibly use the Berkeley uh, agenda process as a template for revising this policy. Um, I mean, you don't have to do it exactly the way Berkeley does, but a lot of what's in there is very good. And I would also like to see the agenda process opened up to the public to make it a public meeting that people can attend, maybe not talk to you. I mean, it would be great if they could talk to you, but uh, you know, the, the public, the, it's not a closed door issue. I mean, this is the workings of the government. The people should be involved. Thank you. All right, I'm bring it back to the city council for action deliberation. Council Member Matthews. Yes, I'd like to move that, and look, before I make my motion, I'd just like to say that the policy that we now have before us, which it was relatively recently adopted, was a really good faith effort by the people that sat on that committee. Let's let's give them that. And the effort was to uh, um, give some structure to the issues of scheduling and, and workload and so forth. So. Um, 
I just wanna put that out there. It was not a conspiracy. It was a good faith effort to give more structure to the agenda setting um, process. <laughs> so with that statement, I'm gonna move that we um, direct a subcommittee consisting of Mayor Cummings, Vice Mayor Myers, and Council Member Watkins to revisit the uh, city council policy um, currently on the books with the idea of uh, clarifying and streamlining it um, to make it um, um, uh, more usable for both council and staff. I'll, I'll second the motion. A motion made by Council Member Matthews, seconded by Council Member Watkins. Council Member Glover. Thank you, I'd like to make a substitute motion. Uh, a motion to revert Council Policy 6.9, Council requests to its November 17, 1998 content, send the policy back for further review and refinement by the subcommittee working on the process for new Council requests and adjust the subcommittee to include Mayor Cummings, Vice Mayor Myers, and Council Member Watkins. Second. Okay, so we have a substitute motion made by Council Member Glover, seconded by Council Member Brown. Any comments currently? I would just like to say that um, having been one of the members who worked on this policy, it was pretty difficult um, being one of the people who brought an item with that new policy in place and um, it led to a lot of confusion, a lot of, um, I think that for staff and council members who were working on those items, uh, as a result, there were some um, conflicts be between what came out, what was proposed to come out in those uh, agenda items. And I think it would be really useful if we, as a committee, work on an item together so that we can see what are some of the difficulties that we're gonna encounter when we're actually putting an agenda item together because that was one of the steps that was not taken mm -hmm. um, when we had actually put this together. And mm -hmm. so um, I am going to encourage um, that while we're still continuing to bring items forward that we do so within the spirit of the new p policy. But I think that um, having ourselves be bound while we're trying to refine a policy can become problematic potentially. So just wanted to say that. Councilmember Watkins. One of the, um, as one of the members of the committee as well, I, um, I feel that after six months of trying to flesh out not only what will be manageable for understanding staff constraints, I mean, we have so many things we want to do and very limited resources, so trying to manage that as it relates to priority setting, but also in, in relationship to the mayor's role and really looking for clarity on what gets on the agenda or doesn't get on the agenda, what makes a threshold for an item that is um, urgent and needing to be placed on the agenda, what is um, a reasonable time frame around agenda setting and agenda topics. So for me, um, having struggled with clarity and having sort of really felt that a lot of folks didn't necessarily feel there was transparency or clarity, that's also what this, I, this is about. So um, I'm, a, I'm a little, I support, I'm happy to be a part of the subcommittee, but I won't support the substitute motion by just sort of throwing it all out at this time and not necessarily moving forward with not only a more consistent path for not only the staff, but also for us as council members and for the mayor to understand the agenda setting and what makes it to the agenda, onto the agenda. Any further comments? Okay, so there's a substitute motion on the floor made by council member Glover and seconded by council member Brown to revert council policy 6.9 to its November 17, 1998 content. Send the policy back for further review and refinement by the subcommittee, working on the process for a new council request and adjust the subcommittee to include Mayor Cummings, Vice Mayor Myers, and Council Member Watkins. Okay, Council Member Brown. Voting on whether or not to accept the substitute. Mm -hmm. Yes, correct. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? No. Okay, so that motion passes with Council Member Glover, Crone, Brown, Mayor Cummings. Um, and it was opposed by Vice Mayor Myers, Council Member Watkins, and Council Member Matthews. And so now there's a motion on the floor um, to um, 
Revert Council to Policy 6.9, Council requests to November 17th, 1998 content. Send the policy back for further review and refinement by the subcommittee. Working on the process for a new council request and adjust the subcommittee to include Mayor Cummings, Vice Mayor Myers, and Council Member Watkins. If there's no further discussion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. No. Yep. So that motion passes with Council Member Glover, Crone, Brown, and Mayor Cummings voting in favor. Vice Mayor Myers, Council Member Watkins, and Council Member Matthews voting against. Okay. I do have a question. Council Member Matthews. What do you anticipate as a timeline for this? I think two out of the three of you have been through this partially already, mm -hmm. correct? I would estimate that depending on when we'd be able to meet, because I know that um, a lot of the subcommittees have been forming and a lot of these subcommittees are starting to move forward with their work that I could imagine this could potentially come back within the next three, if not four months, if not beforehand. I would, if I could comment, sure. hope beforehand because that's part of the problem. We do have all these subcommittees, there's just so much stuff mm -hmm. boiling around right now. And the question is, at what form does it come forward? What are the time expectations? So, And I think that it would be great for the subcommittee to work at, uh, at our first outset of kind of what needs to be addressed and then <clears throat> estimating what timeline we would need to get this back. And, and, and my final comment, sure. <laughs> um, someone mentioned, I think it was you, that part of the, pro and I wasn't part of the committee, so I don't know, but there, there wasn't um, as full of a staff input into the process that was concocted as there might have been. Did I misunderstand that? I think there was a misunderstanding. We worked closely with the Okay, um, okay, staff that was that. it, yeah. Vice Mayor Myers. I'll just state for the record that I'm ready to work on this starting next week. So I'll be out of town for part of it, but I think this is very really important and I don't think we should wait three to four months to, mm -hmm. to try to remedy this. I, I, I think it's very important that we clarify this. A lot of work was done on it. Let's, let's just get to work and get it done. <laughs> Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. All right, agreed. Great. Thank you very much. And so that concludes um, public, that concludes our consent agenda items for today. So next up on our agenda is, uh, our agenda is item number 17, general business. Um, the order will be a presentation of the item by staff for the council members who brought forward the item followed by questions from council. We will then take public comment and then return to council for action deliberation. The first item on general business today is the Harvey West Pool subcommittee report which will be presented by Tony Elliott, Director of Parks and Recreations. <clears throat> All right, good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. Uh, good news is we're sunsetting one subcommittee to make way for uh, a new <laughs> subcommittee here. Um, uh, for the record, Tony Elliott, Parks and Recreation Department, uh, and the a request for City Council today uh, is to accept the recommendation from the Harvey West uh, Pool Subcommittee uh, to hire a consultant for feasibility analysis and to approve a budget adjustment uh, to appropriate $50,000 from the park tax fund for that analysis. So jumping right to that just to make it clear um, uh, at the beginning. And let's see, Bonnie, can I toggle from here? All right, so back in the fall of uh, 2019, um, we reviewed the Harvey West pool item with the city council and the city council directed staff uh, to work with a subcommittee made up of city council members and parks and recreation commission members. Uh, we met twice uh, back in the, the fall or in the winter um, uh, to cover um, a number of things uh, that I'll go to here in just a moment. Uh, but I wanted to cover really quickly some of the figures that we shared with the city council back uh, in the fall of 2019 in terms of the pool's current um, operations and um, the budgetary impact and then um, what it would look like on a full-time basis. So going back, this is actually part of the fiscal year budget uh, conversation with the city council. Um, we, uh, the city council directed staff at that time to look into options and costs related to operating the Harvey West pool on a year round basis. So what we brought to the council as a follow up from that uh, direction uh, almost a year ago uh, was information on the current operation. So the current operation is before you here, we spend um, a net of just shy of $100,000 per year based on the current operation. 
That operation runs from March through um, uh, March through October each year, so it's a pretty limited format. And Jim Booth Swim School is our primary uh, source of operating the Harvey West Pool. So our our expenses are pretty low, uh, but really our services are pretty low at the pool um, as it stands. What council had asked us to look at originally was a, the cost of a year round operation. And so the net cost, what we estimated would be um, about 1.2 million per year. And we estimated on the high end uh, that we could get up to a revenue of about $400,000 per year. So the net general fund impact um, annually would be just about uh, $800,000 uh, per year. So just again, just to bring those up to reference those figures that we reviewed just about um, a year ago. So the subcommittee met um, again uh, over the winter a couple times. Uh, we had two different meetings. In the first meeting, we talked um, uh, what I'll call the what, uh, and really that is what is the what is the vision? What is the vision for the Harvey West Pool? Um, uh, so we talked similar to the conversation that we had with the city council last year, and similar to the conversation we had with the Parks and Recreation Commission, really the what, we talked about things like uh, very low cost or free opportunities for, for example, all youth in Santa Cruz to be able to have swim lessons. Um, we talked about the pool um, as a place where families can gather and have picnics and, and spend the day. Um, uh, so they're kind of that family sentiment. And we talked about opportunities for classes and lap swimming and some of those things. So really a lot of vision, a lot of passion and fire came from the subcommittee, uh, both the commission uh, and council side in terms of what could the pool be. Um, and that really is reflected in the Parks and Rec Master Plan as well. The pool, Harvey West Pool is identified as one of the top uh, recreational uh, options and amenities within the park system. So the pool is highly favored uh, by the community, but the question of what, what is that vision, uh, really took the, the, the precedent for the first, uh, or the priority for the first meeting uh, that we had. The second subcommittee meeting, we talked about the how. So we talked about the vision of what we wanted the pool to be, and then we started to really get into, okay, how do we make that happen? Uh, is the pool big enough currently? Is it ADA accessible? Uh, do we have the proper technology uh, and infrastructure to run the pool uh, on a year-round basis? And so. We brought in uh, Parks and Recreation staff. Um, in particular, we brought in some of our folks from the Central Zone. Blake Wessner is our uh, Central Zone Park Supervisor. Uh, and Blake, uh, um, in a really great way, in a very professional way, brought us back down to earth. Uh, he let us know what the, the pool needs, what it would cost, and so it was a little bit of that reality check, which was a good thing. So currently, um, currently, the really the immediate needs at the pool, if we were to open the pool on a year round basis, we would need to invest probably close to a half million dollars. So based on the figures that we have at the moment, that number is uh, 452,000 uh, that's before the council here. So those are really the immediate maintenance needs uh, that we would need to put into the pool immediately um, to to expand the operations from the current limited uh, calendar to a year round uh, calendar. This number uh, represents the things that we know. So there are some things that we realize that we don't know related to Harvey West Pool. Um, there are a lot of ADA upgrades that we know that we need to make and we don't have costs associated with those yet. Um, we also know that the pool is losing water. Uh, we don't know where that water is going exactly uh, in the extent of that issue. And so we know that we are losing water. And so that could be another major cost related to the pool. So with all of these things said, the committee really, it kind of boiled down to, um, we have the reality of the condition of the pool, but we also have this vision of where we want the pool to go. Um, and so what the committee recommended um, actually uh, was perfectly consistent with what we have in the Parks and Recreation Master Plan. And that is essentially to further study the pool, study the feasibility, uh, study the business case, and study the market. So really to understand from our community, what does the community want from a pool uh, in terms of city services? What are the competitors, so to speak, doing? So what is, uh, what's happening at the Simpkins uh, Swim Center? What's happening around the community? Um, and what would it take to potentially build a new pool uh, to expand um, if achieving the vision really is best uh, uh, sort of created uh, by developing a new pool? So the recommendation for the council today um, 
from the subcommittee, uh, made up again of council members and commission members, um, is to, uh, to accept the recommendation uh, to hire a consultant for feasibility analysis. Um, and to approve a budget adjustment of $50,000 uh, from the park tax fund for that analysis. And last thing I'll say, I just wanna be very clear. I, I had a couple of questions from the community. We are not um, proposing that we shut down the pool or cease operations, but what we will do, I think if the council says uh, today, go ahead and, and hire this consultant uh, with this funding, uh, we will keep the pool <coughs> open and do everything that we can to keep it operating and running. We don't necessarily need to put uh, this $450,000 into it today, but if we do operate it on a year round basis, a more expanded basis, we do uh, need to make these investments uh, very soon. Um, we do have some other projects ongoing right now, the heating system, we've got an on-bill financing opportunity uh, that we're taking advantage of, uh, of right now uh, to improve the heating um, and energy efficiency. So there are things that we are doing. So I just wanna be clear that we're not proposing closing down the pool, but we uh, would like to further study it. So uh, with that, um, I'll look to the subcommittee members to, to weigh in or are happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you very much. Do any of the subcommittee members wanna start by speaking to this item? Yeah, I'll just um, just want to thank Tony and the staff. Um, they brought forward a lot of uh, really good analysis for us. Um, it was very obvious once we dug into some of the numbers and actually um, understood the level of repairs and replacement um, that was going to be needed, plus the mystery of actually where the water's going, um, that the facility is, is really degraded from really just lack of any capital investment over the last 15, 20 years. So um, I think once we got a hold of those numbers, we realized that um, we, we, you know, we, we wanted to, to potentially look at something that was uh, maybe a little different than when we envisioned going in, but um, I just wanna thank the staff because that analysis I think really turned uh, the tide in terms of how we thought about what we were gonna do, as what our recommendation was gonna be. So thanks, Tony. Council Member Watkins. I'll just sort of echo the comments that my colleague made and thank the staff as well as my colleagues here and our commissioners who chose to serve as well. I think we all share uh, love of this community resource. It holds so much potential for a community and really wanting to see it move forward in a way that's informed. And so um, coming from a place of like, we wanna get it done to like, okay, this is what we need to know in order to do it right. For the, for the future, I think it's a really a good place to be. So I, I'm really encouraged by moving forward from that place and, and um, hope the council will support the recommendation. Yeah, just really quickly, I'll say, uh, it was a wonderful experience to participate in this process and the meetings in those conversations. I, um, I really appreciate the commitment. If anybody thinks, anybody who's out there thinks that the pool is neglected, um, we don't use it as much as we would like to, um, it's, it's not, it certainly isn't. It's not a reflection on how much we care about the pool. And that became very clear to me in those meetings um, and talking with Blake. So, and I, as one who is from time to time skeptical of uh, con funding consultants for ongoing for studies, um, I would say that you know in this case, I you know I was really persuaded that this is um, potentially a real a bridge to actually getting a much better program, potentially um, a year round program, and um, it I think that. Uh, we have some real opportunities that a study like this can help kind of move us forward with. So um, just thank you all and I hope to move forward. Councilmember Matthews. Yeah, um, this is very, I'm gonna support the motion before us. And um, I think everyone up here knows when the pool was um, um, r drastically reduced in its use, that was a result of a, the absolutely severe economic collapse and um, there has been interest in uh, bringing it back to full city operation and um, more active, more uh, frequency of use. And of course the operating expense for that is, it's a big ticket and we understand that pretty much all our parks and rec facilities are subsidized to some extent or another. But um, I am pleased particularly that we're looking at not just the market uh, and what's our competition these days, it's really important to have that in there, but um, I do like the idea that we're looking at what are the um, 
short term or more immediate, um, basically repair or improvement needs, is that correct? Um, the obvious, <laughs> and then the ADA currently un, unstudied, and then the unknowns, which we'll get into. Um, and then um, am I right in, in thinking that this study would also um, perhaps explore some improvements that would make it more competitive and usable for the future? So it's not, <coughs> not just fixing up what we've got, it's looking forward. That, that's correct, okay. that's correct. It, yeah. um, and then given all that, and different um, uh, scenarios for operation, there would be different operational costs. So we're talking capital and then operation, which depends on what market we're serving. So what do you, what do you see as a timeline for bringing this back? It's a great question. We don't know yet. Um, okay. We could follow up uh, in terms of that timeline. I think our hope in bringing this, we talked a little bit about the timing of this and bringing it back this time of year, around the mid-year, rather than with the full budget uh, to hopefully get a head start on it. So ideally, if we could hire a consultant uh, this spring into the summer, uh, that, um, that perhaps by this fall leading into the next calendar year, that we'll have a good idea of where we're headed uh, into, into fiscal year 2022 and, and beyond. Okay, that's realistic. And um, I just wanna say this is one more <laughs> dramatic illustration of um, the needs of our capital, our just valued community assets that have not been maintained and not been improved in decades. And um, I really support knowing what this one will cost and what it can do for us. And we got a lot of others out there too with that statement. Mm -hmm. I had one question, and I'm not sure if this is something that can be answered right now, or maybe if this needs to return to council in the form of a memo, but some members of the public had reached out and they were curious about the park tax fund. And so what pays into that, like, so what pays into that fund, how much money's in that fund currently, and the purposes mm -hmm. and use of that fund? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just uh, one second, I just, I gave something to Bonnie. She could put it up right now and that would help us get a visual of it. Yeah, perfect. I had sent a, a memo out to the city council as well uh, prior to this meeting. I don't know if everybody received it, but um, a memo on the specific breakdown of the park tax and what that, uh, what that is, how it's collected. Okay. Um, generally speaking, it's an impact fee uh, on development, on residential development, uh, very similar to the Quimby uh, fee. Um, it's $3 per uh, square foot on essentially new residential development that's collected um, as part of the building permit process through the planning department. Um, the current breakdown uh, is before the council here. There's a little over a million dollars um, in the uh, yeah, FY 2020 uh, adopted budget. Um, a lot of that, we don't have the full, um, the full scope of what is encumbered essentially here. So there are a number of projects that are tied up or that those dollars are committed to existing projects. Um, so, um, anyway, I don't have that specific breakdown uh, necessarily, but uh, this funds a whole range of things from, uh, from trail work uh, to, I'm, I'm kind of spitballing here off the cuff, um, uh, really any number of projects that uh, are acquisition of land and improvement of a park asset, uh, those types of things. So um, Quimby, Quimby is a little bit more specific in terms of what that goes to, but the park tax in the municipal code uh, if I recall it, it's uh, chapter five in the municipal code, breaks it down very specifically and it's in that memo that I shared with the city council on uh, what that can be appropriated uh, to. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions from council members at this time? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I was wondering if you could go farther up on that um, memo in the, where it's read. Oh, I think that's a different piece of paper. Um, because I had a couple questions, I mean, <clears throat> I just wanted to go through the numbers with us because I don't, I don't, I don't understand it. Um, just, since we have the opportunity to do that right now, yeah, this one? that one, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but do you know when the park tax was started? When was that passed by voters, or was that something that even predates um, that, that uh, was passed by a city council at some point in the past? 
You know, I think it's it's been in existence ever since uh, I've been with the city for over 23 years. So it goes back, yeah. It's, an, it's an, essentially an impact fee, a development impact fee, uh, and that's one we've had on the books for many, many years. Uh, and as Tony mentioned, it gets collected. What gets collected depends on development, uh, and what it pays for is specifically outlined in our code. Um, and it's just been a, an ongoing revenue source for the for the parks. Uh, on a year-to-year -year basis. And the council every year as part of your budget, um, when you look at the CIP, funds are allocated from the park, from that fund towards various park uh, projects, including the Quimby funds. And then we, we do a fund balance projection for all of our funds, including this fund. And that's in our budget uh, documents uh, every year as well. So you can go back and look at that. So it's accounted for on an annual basis in our budget and it's appropriated through the budget process like any other fund in the city. And it says it's for the green belt. Fifty percent is for green belt, and fifty percent is for equipment or something. I mean, I mean I... that's for Quimby. Uh, that's for Quimby. Mm -hmm. And so, it, if you like, look at the one point two million um, uh, ending fund balance. One point two. Would that be part of your budget when you start out in June, or, or when we approve the budget process, or is that something like that supplemental that fills in gaps that come up about during the year? So, so yeah, it doesn't fill in gaps throughout the year. Again, it's something that we have, uh, we have existing projects that are on the books that were approved as part of the fiscal year, the current fiscal year budget. And in fact, we have projects that go back to the prior fiscal year that are still on the books that we're still working through um, and haven't fully expended those dollars. Uh, but as we go into the new budget uh, in the, the upcoming fiscal year budget in the coming months, we'll go through a similar process where we will have, um, a whole, a whole number of capital improvement items, some of which we will uh, ask uh, uh, support from the city council for general fund dollars for those capital items, and some will ask for park tax uh, or Quimby dollars. But yeah, again, those are uh, appropriated through the budget process um, each year or carried over as the projects continue forward. Big picture that fund, so the, the department, Parks and Rec Department has not, uh, to my recollection, utilized any general fund capital improvement dollars over the past five years or maybe more. So virtually all of our capital improvement dollars come from either Quimby or the park uh, facility tax fund, park tax fund. Um, and so it's a, it's a limited pot, a million dollars sounds like a big number, but it's um, uh, but pretty limited. Um, and really all of our capital investment. And so we have approximately uh, $60 million in deferred maintenance in the Parks and Rec Department. And so that million dollars uh, can go really quickly toward addressing very critical things. So the pool is part of that overall discussion, but one of many projects uh, uh, needing potential funding. And when you get the 50,000, 50, you have to take it out of a, something else that's already, it was already committed for or in law, the project just hadn't been started yet. So we, we have $50,000 available that is not uh, tied to a project currently. So that's where we're asking uh, support of the council to um, uh, allow us to appropriate or appropriate that 50,000 to be used for this use. Um, a, a big portion of, or a, a portion of the overall park tax fund, um, strategically we actually withhold to be ready for a potential grant match. So a lot of grants, uh, it might be an 80-20 match. So we actually hold a couple hundred thousand dollars um, up to a half million of that million to be ready for any grant opportunities that we can leverage those funds. So uh, some of that we withhold as sort of a, a reserve within that, but 50,000 can come out of um, the overall bucket. Thank you, it's helpful to know, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Is there any other council member who has questions at this time? Same. Thank you very much, Tony. Thank you. Is there any member of the public who would like to speak to us on this item? If you'd like to, please line up to the left and you will have two minutes. Hi, Elise Casby, community organizer, and also I was in recreation therapy in the mental health field when I started out, um, started my career. So I just wanna say, first of all, thank you to Tony Elliott and the Parks and Rec people and others who did this analysis. I really appreciate your work. I also wanna say that I am hoping that our vision for the, for the pool will truly be a public vision, inclusive of all classes and people in the public. And I think we could have a really stupendous pool. Uh, what's fantastic about that area is it is still, although on the outer edges, it's still in the downtown area and it could be quite accessible by bus. Right now the number four goes there. Um, 
And so I'm really supportive of the $50,000 for the consultant and as Sandy's said, so many times consultants can truly be valuable. I'd like to use a comparison here of Dave Seppos who was brought in to find if we could have a viable task force to address the rental crisis and the housing crisis in Santa Cruz. And I think Dave was paid $40,000 for an excellent um, F effort and uh, I would like to ask that we have another consultant who is truly a advocate for the public interest. And to make sure that that happens, I would like to ask that the council make all potential um, possibilities, uh, in other words, for all the consultants that are interested, that we could also evaluate those people. And the reason is this, I have been to a city pool in Eugene, Oregon, which I consider um, a splendid, magnificent public pool. It's clean, it's beautiful, it's family oriented. It's also centrally located. People can get there on the bus. Um, it's just a real asset to the community. They provide showers for anybody who needs them for 50 cents a shower. So it's a tremendous resource and I'd like for us to consider that as a way to get showers to the homeless population. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Hi, good afternoon, Margaret O'Shea, resident of Santa Cruz on the west side. And um, I attended um, a couple Parks and Recreation Commission meetings and um, brought up, even when it wasn't on the agenda, about um, expanding the hours of Harvey West Pool. Um, so it's been an issue that I'm, I'm following. I was very happy to see in the Santa Cruz Sentinel that it was on the agenda today, so that's why I came. While I was waiting, I read the, um, February 6th Harvey West Pool subcommittee report. And um, so I, my comments are brief. I'd like to say that a concern um, I continue to have um, is the limited hours when the pool is even open at all. So I um, urge um, the council to make sure that that's included in the statement of work, that if one of the options as presented in this February 6th report is um, continuing with the existing scope of operations March through October each year, um, that that be looked at. It's, um, it's and I, um, I, I won't turn around, but I even want staff to know how, how valued this is. That's why I came to this meeting. I really appreciate that the department and the department leadership has continued to push for this. I thank the committee, the commission for looking at this. Um, but it is a problem, the existing hours. Because um, Jim Booth Swim School operates it, I've even had a discussion with a staff member that there's been lack of communication sometimes between the department and the Jim Booth Swim School about the hours. So it's advertised as these are the pool hours. Turns out, if you're swimming there, you gotta be out of the pool by a certain time because they're locking the gate at another time. So, so we need to kind of fairly advertise the swim hours are X, which is like, let's say the pool's open 12 to two in the summer for swimming on a Sunday. Turns out you need to be out of the pool by 1.30 or 1.45. And that's, I've seen so many families really devastated. You get there and you gotta get out of the pool. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Okay. Is there any other member of the public who would like to speak to us on this item? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to council for action deliberation, council member Brown. Yeah, so I um, am ready to make to move the recommendation to accept the recommendation from the Harvey West Pool Subcommittee to hire a consultant for a feasibility analysis and adopt a resolution to amend the fiscal year 2020 budget and appropriate funds in the amount of $50,000 from the park tax fund. I'll second that. All right. So we have a motion made by Council Member Brown, seconded by Council Member Watkins. I do have comments, but I didn't want to, I wanted to. Yeah, end. that's, yeah, so. <laughs> I'll make comments okay, you can whenever, follow up. when, it, when okay. you can just put me on the stand. So you can, we'll follow up with Council Member Brown, Council Member Watkins, <laughs> Vice Mayor Myers, Council Member Crum. Uh, so I wanted to respond to the comment that was just made by Ms. O'Shea. Um, I'm wondering if, it, I don't know that we would need to include it in a motion, but I'm wondering if we could follow up on that and, and try to figure out how to make sh it clear to the public, because um, I could imagine taking some kids down, like, that would be a hard thing to 
careful now <laughs> to they're not aware that the hours are actually shorter than advertised. Yeah, I appreciate her making that point and we'll look into it to make sure our hours uh, are accurate as posted. Thank you. Great. Council Member Watkins. I was just sort of going sim to similarly follow up with that, um, <laughs> having been there with the, trying to find the time and the kids, it, is, it isn't really conducive to families being able to access it. And it is a short time and there is an abrupt end. So the, um, definitely the clarity in advertising and transparency, but also the direction of trying to move to have the pool open more frequently is the intention behind where we hope to be. Council Mayor Myers? I think it's yeah. good. Okay. Yeah. Council Member Crum. What about the other issue that came up? What's your thoughts on providing showers, like that being part of the work of the consultant to think about having more showers there to provide, you know, to supplement what we provide now at the Homeless Resources Center and? Yeah, I think I think all those are great questions in the context of, of what could this facility become. Um, in the Park and Rec, Parks and Rec Master Plan, it even alludes to things like a, like a fitness center, uh, health and wellness facilities. So I think as the consultant goes through it, um, we'd like for them to consider what all of those uh, might look like, what could really be incorporated, and then how we operate that, um, uh, again, from an operation standpoint, I think that's the other question. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. All right. So no further questions. There's a motion on the floor by Council Member Brown, seconded by Council Member Watkins to um, to accept the recommendation from the Harvey West Pool Subcommittee to hire a consultant for feasibility analysis and adopt a resolution to amend the fiscal year 2020 budget and appropriate funds in the amount of $50,000 from the park tax fund. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Okay, next item on our agenda, item number 18 of general business is ordinance amending SCM section, SCMC section 15.38.010 and section 15.38.030 regarding small cell wireless facilities. Uh, this presentation will be by Joshua Spangrud, senior civil engineer, and Stephanie Hall, deputy city attorney. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mayor Cummings, members of the city council. I'm Joshua Spangrud, senior civil engineer, public works. So uh, I don't have a presentation for you. I think you guys have seen it a number of times right now so far. I'm sure I could pull one up from the past if you guys are interested. But basically what we have here are several minor adjustments to language from the last time uh, the ordinance was proposed. Uh, our city attorney, I'm gonna turn this over to the city attorney's office. They're the ones who really did it. My name is just on the report, so. Hey, thanks. And, and I'll be filling in today for Stephanie Hall, uh, Deputy City Attorney. I'm Tony Condotti, uh, City Attorney. Um, this ordinance has somewhat of a circuitous legislative history uh, going back to April of last year when the council introduced ordinance number 2019-06, which would take uh, the city's wireless communications facilities regulations out of Title 24, your zoning code, and move them into Title 15, uh, which pertains to streets and highways. Um, a separate ordinance, 2019-11, was then brought forward to incorporate wireless communication facilities uh, into um, Title 15, and that was introduced by the City Council at your meeting on November 26th of 2019. Uh, also at that time were adopted regulations that implemented the ordinance as well as uh, a resolution adopting a fee schedule for processing permits for wireless communications facilities. Uh, the reason why I mentioned the circuitous legislative history is that when both ordinances came back for final adoption on December 10th, the council uh, expressed an interest in additional changes and rather than have a reintroduction of both ordinances or ordinance 2019-11, the council directed that those changes come back in a new ordinance um, and specifically the changes were to eliminate subsections, uh, subsection F of section 1538010 regarding the purpose and intent, uh, the language that is 
proposed to be eliminated states that the purpose and intent is not to limit or prejudice any individual's ability to seek a reasonable accommodation under the Americans with, with Disabilities Act or any other applicable federal or state law to the extent such requests are consistent with applicable FCC regulations uh, and federal and state laws. Council directed that we return with an ordinance to eliminate that language as well as uh, an amendment to subsection 030B4, which states that the chapter shall not apply to facilities for small cell wireless facilities that are suspended, whether embedded or attached on communication cables or lines that are strung between existing utility poles in compliance with applicable safety codes. Um, as to the reference to uh, ADA accommodations, that's already covered in your uh, adopted regulations. And, and as to the reference to small cell wireless facilities that are suspended on uh, wires or cables, um, those are prohibited in your regulations as well. So this is really just a cleanup ordinance and I'm happy to answer any council member questions or comments. Are there any questions at this time by council members? You saw the um, email I sent to uh, Barb, Barb Choi and her response, and so that's um, been changed according to what you just said, it sounds like. Uh, yeah, I agree. There's, there's some, uh, I would say, somewhat ambiguous language in the report as to what the staff's recommendation is, but after we've discussed it with staff and uh, internally in the city attorney's office, we're comfortable with the proposed amendments as they're presented here. Thanks. There's no other questions, I'll open it up to the public for public comment. And if there are members of the community that would like to comment on this item, I'd like to ask you please line up to my left. Um, and I'll invite up first Satya Orion from EMF Aware, who reached out for extra time on behalf of that group, and so you'll be given four minutes. Thank you, Mayor Cummings and Council. So it sounds like you've done my work for me already. You, you're uh, recommending these to be deleted and I can just say and thank you uh, for hearing me. Um, this was first item was submitted by me, not something that was in the ordinance and so I'm just asking it be deleted. And the second one I felt, just to give you a reason, I felt uncomfortable with adding um, another, of taking something that could be potentially added to the wires and uh, saying that it wasn't covered under regulations. So um, I'm happy that it's prohibited currently. So thank you for that. Um, so I'd like to, I wanna take the opportunity to have one more request. Um, a small change, but quite important one to the uh, permit guidelines section of the ordinance, um, section four, public notification, 2G. I realize it's not on the agenda today, but I'm hoping it could be agendized for the next meeting. Um, this is regarding the submission of requests for reasonable accommodation under the ADA or other applicable law. Um, I'm at what I'd like to first ask for is that the five calendar day time limit be removed. My feeling is that it does not allow adequate time for a person to submit such a request, um, especially if you take into consideration weekends and holidays, a five calendar day request could effectively become two business days, very short time. Um, and I also, another small inclusion that we also um, specifically say include contact information for who a person would direct such a request to, and I'm assuming public works, um, what their name, how to reach them. I just, um, I believe that honestly, people will make these requests as quickly as possible, but it just seems really important that we not, um, that we just do everything possible to make that process as easy as possible, easily accessible as possible, and, and not create further access barriers, which is what we're trying to eliminate by this. I mean, the, the, I'm very, very grateful that this is even included in the ordinance because it's what it's doing is it's providing a legal pathway for people to potentially stay in their homes who are 
extremely EMF sensitive and might have to leave otherwise. So, um, so I thank you and I, and my request would be that, um, thank you for hearing me say this today and that we could bring it back to the next meeting for a more thorough discussion of what would be reasonable considering all that I've said. So thank you. Uh, You'll have two minutes for this item. Thank you. Nicholas uh, Whitehead, I want to address you on the larger picture of this very, very controversial field of communications technology and the, emanation, the electrical emanations from that. Um, th there are three areas of uh, accepting your responsibility. There's the political area. Yeah, sure, you want to help companies that are helping our society communicate. Naturally, you want to do that. Uh, you want to help consumers, and that probably the majority want these services. Um, then there's the legal situation you're in. The apparent, the authority to, of the FCC to overrule any public health considerations is extremely dubious, and I think this is going to be proven out historically. So I'm addressing you on and asking you to look, for, look toward the historical developments that might occur. But, so that comes down to, to your ethical decision in any future um, allowances you make for these, these, uh, these technologies. Um, you really have to consider the future public health. Not all the information we have is reliable. There are alternative sources of information. There are an increasing bevy of speakers internationally and in the U.S. who can address uh, accurately, scientifically, the, the public health effects of these uh, high-powered uh, transmissions, these particular frequencies. And I think this, this community deserves to hear from them, and I would like that to be a publicly sponsored event rather than private groups having to always do that. So please look ahead and consider these aspects. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good afternoon. I really want to thank all of you for so many things, but not so much with just blindly following. Um, you know, this, the existing technology can kind of be linked to every modern Western ailment. You just have to do the research. You just have to ask the questions. Um, although it's interesting to hear all the various this and that, it really doesn't mean anything. It's, um, it seems kind of unusual to me that the FCC guidelines were developed by Schrumann, who came up with this number for a heated thermal effect of 10,000, when biological effects are known to happen, excuse me, 10 million. Biological known effects are said to happen between 6 and 200 at the beginning. That's quite a huge order of magnitude. So I showed up to speak here about seven months ago. 13 people in front of me didn't say what I thought needed to be said. And now I could probably say it a little bit differently because I probably have a thousand hours of research on this and other subjects in that seven months. So there's not much we can do to stop this. You know, it's interesting. I just read something the other day that, you know, people on airline flights are coming down with flu-like symptoms because of this fast internet service that's coming down from satellites. And they're not sure what really to do, but when they get off the plane and they get away from that stuff, feel better. So there's a lot of synergistic effects that are going on. I kind of decided six months ago that I might as well work with the two ends of the bell curve that'll be the most affected, and that's youth and teachers and law enforcement and emergency responders. Because um, there's so much information out about this, and uh, we're all already affected. I mean, we've known for over 100 years about these effects. And so it's just... Kind of troubling because it's not making people healthier. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Right, next member of the public. Good afternoon, Scott Graham. Um, part of my feeling on this is that uh, this is a different technology than the current, it's a different wavelength than the current cell phone towers emit. And there hasn't really been much study on 
the effects on humans and on animals and insects of, of these cell towers. And I'm not sure if you can legislate like how far apart they need to be because I know the uh, companies want to put put them really close together, even though they claim they go a mile or m further. I mean, they're advertising on TV that, oh yeah, these signals go a long ways, but then they want to put them every 500 feet. So, I mean, that makes absolutely no sense. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, and the need for it, I mean, we've already got 4G. 5G, from my understanding, is the only real need for this is so that people can play these high intensity games on their phones. Right now they have some lag time if you wanna play World of Warcraft. And so in order to play World of Warcraft on your phone, you need 5G. And I mean, do we really wanna do that? Do we, re you know, right now I see babies playing with cell phones. And it's like, we don't know what the effects of somebody giving a baby a cell phone and that kid becoming addicted to the cell phone. I mean, it, there's, most people are addicted to them already, but to be addicted to them from being a one-year-old for the rest of your life, we don't know what the effects that's gonna have on people. And that's absurd. That, the federal government doesn't allow us to check that out. And I think the city should enjoin every lawsuit out there against 5G. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other member of the public that would like to speak to us on this item? No, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you'll be our last speaker. Um, I too just want to posit that I really, I really feel that since I saw this, um, ordinance being affected the first time, that it seemed like it was kind of out of our hands, that the federal government, if I'm re re recollecting com correctly, wasn't going to let cities um, refuse the service, if we can call it that. And I think that, you know, we have to, so I, I really wish that more people would speak on this. We, we're at a crossroads in terms of human civilization and we, we cannot ignore the horrible, horrible health impacts. And I have to d disagree with Scott. My understanding is that there have been some excellent studies done on the unhealthiness of 5G. And there are countries that will not allow it uh, to be put in their country because they understand the health risk and they will not allow their public to be exposed to that kind of danger and harm. And so, you know, I, I kind of see our city council's hands are somewhat tied here, but I also feel like, you know, I loved it when Nancy Pelosi ripped up Trump's speech the other day because she needed to make a statement. How, uh, whether you agree with that or not, um, as a Democrat, I feel like it was somewhat disingenuous because the Democrats were responsible for getting us to Trump. But on the other hand, at least she was making some kind of a statement that, you know, he is subverting our constitution. Um, and again here, I feel that the city really needs to make a statement that, that on some level, y'all need to defend our public health. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'd like to bring it back to Council for Action and Deliberation. I defer. Council Member Brown. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you all for, uh, for those of you who have come and spoken. Thank you to EMF Aware and Satya Ryan for really sticking and hanging in there and getting us to this place. I've opined on the limitations of what local government can do in this arena. I think there is a growing body of data on the the public health impacts that you know we'll be hearing more about and we need to take very seriously. And I have no doubt this will uh, be an ongoing point of discussion here in Santa Cruz. And that EMF Aware will keep us updated about um, ways that we can participate in uh, future litigation. We've already directed that of our staff. And so I think that'll 
continue. Um, and so right now I'd like to uh, move the recommendation that we um, introduce for publication an ordinance amending section 15.38.010. It's the stat, it's the recommendation here. Um, so um, amending the ordinance with the red lines that were included in our agenda packet um, as on a first reading. Um, second. Okay. Yeah. So we have a motion made by Council Member Brown, seconded by Council Member Matthews to accept the staff recommendation. Is there any further discussion on this item at this time? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. <laughs> Okay, the next item on our agenda, agenda is item number 19 of general business, which is the Beach Pl Flats Impact Fund. Uh, the presenters will be Council Member Glover, um, Mayor Cummings, and Council Member Crone. So I will pass this over to Council Member Glover. Thank you, Mayor. I'm just gonna, if we wouldn't mind giving just a moment for the presentation to load. But if that's the case, maybe we can take a three minute break and we'll come back at 2.16. Thank you. 3.16. Sorry, 3.16. Are we on time so far? Yeah. yeah. Time to spare. All right, I guess we'll bring this back since we have quorum. Wonderful. Oh, right, great. Thank you, Mayor, um, and uh, to my fellow colleagues, hello. Um, I'm Councilmember Drew Glover, and it's my pleasure today to talk to you about the idea of the implementation of a Beach Flats Impact Fund. So to provide a little bit of background with regards to the impetus behind this, uh, in December or January, uh, we were approached by representatives of the Beach Flats community neighborhood and organizations serving the Beach Flats community to address the impacts felt by the lowest income neighborhood in the city of Santa Cruz caused by the operation specifically of the boardwalk during summer months. So I'll first start by just kind of breaking down what is a, a benefit district uh, because it's essentially what we would be creating as a parking benefit district. We're referring to it as an impact fund because we want to acknowledge the impact that um, the Beach Flats experiences from the boardwalk. But a parking benefit district or PBD are defined geographic areas typically in downtowns or along commercial corridors in which any revenue generated from on street and off street parking facilities within the district is returned to the district to finance neighborhood improvements. Um, there are successful examples of this that can be seen uh, around the country, uh, I distributed a document to my colleagues just a moment ago that focuses on the LA Metro example, um, which I'll refer to a little bit later, uh, but it's a great tool to be used to generate additional revenue and to support impacted neighborhoods. Uh, so why implement an impact fund? Well, uh, there are these three primary reasons of things that we can uh, look towards, which is uh, the ability to provide necessary improvements of social services and communities, fund the communities most impacted by some of the different commercial activity that's happening uh, in a city, and implement and create community projects all to address some of the issues. During the summer months specifically, in the neighborhood of the Beach Flats, it's inundated by attendees from the boardwalk who uh, essentially overwhelm the area. This increased attendance results in increased exposure to CO2 emissions, noise, trash, traffic, and wear and tear on the 21-acre neighborhood, all of which negatively impact the quiet enjoyment and the use for the residents. Um, some examples are road and drainage degradation, inaccessibility to parking, and uh, a feeling of essentially being trapped in your own neighborhood. Uh, just to provide some context as to the beach flats and some of the stuff that they're dealing with down there, even with the cost of housing, uh, is the a uh, survey that was done in 2016 by No Place Like Home, which looked at the rents of rate burden situations, overcrowding and housing, uh, as well as forced evictions. And not only of the 435 renters that were surveyed along beach flats and lower ocean talking about uh, being rent burdened, 73% experienced being rent burdened uh, in the beach flats and lower ocean neighborhood, but people from the Latinx community uh, reported back at about 80% of that population being rent burdened. Uh, looking at the issues of forced eviction, uh, 
especially for uh, families with children was about 46% and Latinx families at 52%. So not only um, with regards to beautification topics, but we'll also be talking about other ways that the impact fund can be used to prevent homelessness and also support affordable housing development. So here, I just want to take a second to illustrate kind of the general proposed area of the map of the benefit district, of the benefit district itself. Now, this map doesn't extend all the way to the, uh, the wharf, but the proposed streets can, can give you an idea of the volume of meters. You can kind of see them. I don't know if you can see them from here, but if you look behind you, the little yellow dots that represent the different meter locations. Um, these uh, would, be included in the benefit district, but could include Beach Street, potentially from the wharf to the boardwalk, uh, down past the boardwalk with this curve that you see here up onto Third Avenue, and then down Raymond, LeBrant, Second Avenue, and First Street, which continues over if the image were to continue to the left past that large parking, um, parking lot over to essentially the boardwalk bowl. So, how would it work? Um, these are some preliminary estimates based off of some of the numbers that were given to us by staff of the overall parking revenue that is generated from that specific district looking at the meters in question. Now, the way we got these numbers was, you know, uh, this is an underestimate, let me emphasize that, of the amount of revenue that can be generated to go into this impact fund because the way that we calculated this was just taking the overall projected revenue for fiscal year 20, uh, dividing it by four essentially to get the months of the year, which is June through September, and then looking at a 15% annual increase over the next three years uh, to generate these numbers. Now, I say that this is an underestimate because we didn't calculate that there would be an influx of the parking during those months, which is where a substantial amount of that overall estimated revenue would be coming from. Uh, the reason why we have it structured this way um, is because the parking that's surrounding the boardwalk is regulated by the Coastal Commission. So the city is able to do small annual increases that do not exceed 25% annually or 50% over three years, which would then require an approval by the Coastal Commission. So if we were to look at, say, a proposed increase of 15% annually, then within the first year, based off of the projections for fiscal year 20, we would see $16,000 coming into the fund, the next year in year two with 30% would be $36,000 coming into the fund. And finally, uh, in year three of the pilot phase, essentially of the impact fund, it would generate approximately $60,000, $61,000 for that third year for a total uh, estimated uh, revenue of 113,098 roughly that could be allocated towards programs and projects in the Beach Flats community without having to get approval from the uh, from the parking, or the, excuse me, the Coastal Commission. So what do the projects look like? So there are three primary areas outlined in the agenda report specifically that would be looked at, and this is after talking with uh, representatives from organizations serving the Beach Flats community and the needs that are associated there from their observations and the work that they've been doing. And so the first is social support and service programs, housing development and protections, and then infrastructure and beautification projects of both uh, the streets and of their parks. Uh, the impact fund is envisioned to support work geared towards creating affordable housing development, supporting social programs and services, which could include free legal clinics, supporting tenants' rights, after school youth programming, counseling, community resource centers, services helping to reduce homelessness, supporting the Beach Flats Garden, increasing access to quality healthy foods and providing funding and uh, for increased access to community resources such as healthcare for the lower ocean and beach flats neighborhood, but also infrastructure repairs like roads, parks, beautifications, and drainage solutions, um, which have all been an issue uh, in that surrounding community. And the projects will be created for the community. And this is where I will turn you to the Metro document that I shared with you, because it gives a really great kind of breakdown of what LA has already done with some of these uh, benefit districts or impact funds which, and I quote from the piece, are used to make various improvements such as street sweeping, tree planting and trimming, sidewalk and street repairs, street lighting, graffiti removal, historic preservation, putting utility wires underground, um, and also, which is not mentioned specifically, but I think is something that uh, is relevant to the beach flats uh, and parking access, is to be able to offer parking permits to all uh, neighbors 
in that area so that they can have security in their parking. Um, the way that it could be structured, and this is something that we'll get to when we get to the recommendation, uh, is developing the benefit district through the involvement of key stakeholders, businesses, developers, landowners, but especially the organizations and the community members serving uh, and living in that community to help figure out what the process could be to develop the rules of the parking district, and also taking the initiative steps to work collaboratively, to, collaboratively excuse me, to create shared goals and objectives, uh, to create an overall plan for the parking district, but then just as importantly as figuring out the way in which to develop the granting process of those funds to programs to ensure that they are serving that community directly and are not being siphoned out of that fund for outside projects and outside areas. So uh, the idea with the agenda report specifically, as you can see with the recommendation, which I'll repeat in just a second, is to uh, work or in direct staff essentially to work to create a proposal that would come back to council for review by April 2020, so that then we could have an in-depth kind of process engaging the community uh, as well as different stakeholders to have those conversations and come back with a plan that council can review and then ideally approve uh, so the recommendation here is uh, to, for a motion to direct staff to work with co-signing council members, community bridges, and other interested community partners to develop the policy framework, feasibility, and implementation plan to establish a beach flats impact fund through parking meter revenue and return to council with analysis results and action plan no later than April 2020. It's really a conversation of equity and making sure that those that are impacted by the tourism that we experience in the community are having money essentially put back into their community, not only to help with mitigating climate change, to address the issue of CO2 emissions, but also to make sure that they're living and thriving in a, a community that's well served. So thank you. Thank you very much. Council Member Crone, do you want to comment on this at all? Just to um, reiterate uh, Council Member Glover's earlier statement about the impacts on the Beach Flats neighborhood um, that, that go on every summer when it's really intense, and um, and I'm really glad to be part of this, bringing this forward uh, to address and hopefully alleviate and improve that part of the community. Okay, thanks. I'll just say thank you for the presentation and for kind of summarizing many of our sentiments for, as the members of the city council are bringing this forward. Um, I'd also like to say that, you know, one of the reasons why I'm very much in favor of this item is because as a resident of the Beach Flats community, I understand how it is to be directly impacted by the traffic during the summer. Oftentimes, as Council Member Glover said uh, earlier in his presentation, uh, from members who live in that community, you can sometimes feel like you're imprisoned in your community during high um, levels of traffic. So oftentimes, if you are planning on driving and you leave between the hours of around 10.30 and you know 4 or 5 p.m., sometimes it can take you often up to an hour to hour and a half even to get out of the community or to get back into the community and so oftentimes we find ourselves parking outside of the community and walking back in, having to go back later on to get our vehicles because we just can't simply have access to uh, the community. And so um, I think that it's important that as a community that's probably the most impacted um, by summer traffic, that we try to do something uh, to give back to that community and um, really support uh, the people who live in, in that area. Mm -hmm. Um, are there any other questions by council members currently at this point, point in time? Is, is there staff comment anticipated on this or not? I do. So this plan and timeline was constructed in collaboration with the city manager's office. Uh, so they are aware of all of the proposals and content of the agenda report in the timeline. Also, I, oh, sure. go ahead. You go ahead if you have something to add to that. I was, I was going to add to that. I think that um, in the spirit of the council policy that was adopted, um, one of the reasons why we brought this forward in this manner is because it's an opportunity f before we, you know, kind of begin working with staff um, that we bring these ideas forward and then um, we bring it to council to see if this is something the council would be, would be interested in having staff work on. And then we um, kind of develop this process working with staff and stakeholders in the community on this item. Um, I have been contacted by staff who've mentioned that um, they would very much like to be 
involved with this should it move forward. Um, this morning I was also contacted by the Seaside Company who said they weren't in opposition but they would like to also be involved in this. And mm -hmm. so I think that uh, the intent is that if we're moving this forward, we then begin to have communication and conversations with these different stakeholders and we figure out a process um, in order to be able to bring this forward. Because I also, as someone who's signing on to this, have um, some concerns around rates, who's gonna be affected, what are the zones, what are the meters. And so I think that there's a lot of work to be done, but we wanted to bring this forward um, because we can't really bring it forward otherwise without getting council's approval. I appreciate those comments. And um, as proposed here, uh, I completely appreciate the um, the issues, the underlying issues that this um, proposal raises and, and tries to deal with. It seems to me that as proposed, it's very limited um, in both the mechanisms for dealing with those and it more significantly to me, um, ignores a huge amount of work that's already been done and is in the pipeline and particularly, um, and I don't know how much the newer council members know about this, the neighborhood um, uh, uh, revitalization strategy area, which encompasses this area. Um, uh, we are, um, we have invested a lot, have developed a lot of plans over time with stakeholders, uh, programs are in action. I think it's through economic development and it, might be helpful. I don't know if other council members would like to have a brief description, but it occurs to me also um, there's so much um, involving many departments, the, the Climate Action, Parks and Rec, Public Works, that and, and of course our housing programs that are very much focused on the, um, uh, the elevated uh, issues in the beach beach flats and lower ocean and south of Laurel. I mean, that's it's kind of a larger area there. So um, my own preference would be to um, acknowledge the council's interest in this, but to uh, step back and um, uh, have some kind of a, um, a staff, maybe a council member or two working with it, but a, a summary of where we are in terms of the, the funding mechanisms in place, the, the projects in place um, and and take a look at that before we leap into um, one funding mechanism which is the um, parking fund and um, um, a, a, a rather limited number of parties consulted. So that's a, a long sense but um, I think it's an overreach and frankly a totally unrealistic timeline to think that this is going to come back in April. Watkins. I'm going to wait till the comment section because I think it's the question section, right? Yeah. Oh, was it comment? No. no. Questions. Questions. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> um, I'll reserve my comments, but I, but I do want to just express my excitement for the interest in this. I think, as we think about uh, health and all policies, equity, sustainability, and public health, this is really aligned with those values. Um, I see health and all policies as sort of the the framework that's this broader theory that's sort of designing how we think about that with our policy making, the implementation could look something like how are we looking at it in specific areas and applying it to different decisions. So um, I just want to acknowledge that nexus. I would love to hear from the staff in regards to some of the work that's already happening. Um, I know that Tiffany Wise West is doing a lot of work in the beach flats in terms of climate change and sustainability and resilient coasts and access and, and doing a lot of outreach in that regard. So I don't know if, if she wants to speak a little bit about some of the work, but I do want to, um, I guess the broader in interest is understanding sort of that holistic picture and how this fits within that and how are we gonna move forward in a way that's really informed and inclusive in terms of community outreach and programming and planning. Um, and ensure an impact fund, uh, I hadn't heard of that before, could be a piece of that puzzle uh, once I know more about it. And as um, Councilmember Matthews mentioned, and what is true about the health and all policies framework is, as we think about all of the strings that we pull to influence decisions, whether it be parks and rec decisions or transportation or um, 
anything beyond, you know, uh, roads and sidewalks and all of those different types of priority areas, that that is the holistic way that we can look at how we're gonna serve our areas and our communities. So I do think it's one potential component of something a lot broader for a community or for a specific area in our community. Um, and then also just sort of understanding, are there any um, sort of opportunity costs or unintended impacts? I don't know that much. I appreciate the information that was shared in regards to the parking uh, benefit districts. I hadn't heard of those before, um, but just sort of trying to really get a, a fluid thing. So I don't know if, if Susie or Tiffany or others are, who are here um, want to weigh in on any of the kind of areas that I brought up. Sure. Hello, Council Members. Tiffany Weisbus, Sustainability and Climate Action Manager. Um, I really appreciated the fact that um, the social vulnerability to climate change assessment was referenced in uh, the staff report. And I think, as you all know, the Beach Flats residents are already experiencing the impacts of climate change, and that will continue to increase over time. Uh, through the Resilient Coast Initiative, which is about halfway through, we have uh, Vice Mayor Ma uh, Myers and uh, Mayor Cummings that are both on the Technical Advisory Committee for that. Um, that project um, is really a community-driven, data-driven process where we are uh, trying to work with the community uh, to identify climate adaptation measures for the Beach Flats area and the accompanying financing that needs to uh, come with that. Um, so clearly coordination with this effort would, would be appreciated and, and could potentially uh, improve the base of knowledge that you're working from. We have conducted over 125 door-to-door -door interviews in the Beach Flats, um, several community meetings, including one coming up on March 7th. Um, so that's a little bit of background on what we're doing and looking at both short, medium and long-term solutions, what are the triggers for those and what are the financing mechanisms that are available? Thank you. Thank you, Council Member uh, Watkins and um, the rest of the council. Susie O'Hara, Assistant to the City Manager. It was really our pleasure to work with Council Member Glover on this project. And you know, as we began to peel away the uh, layers of the onion, the complexity, you know, with the Coastal Commission approval, that was kind of the first you know, question we had in terms of what are those thresholds, but each time we kind of looked a little bit um, deeper at potential revenue that we would be looking at with regard to this project, um, the intricacies of the meters, actually the physical meters down there and what we have the cap capability of doing, um, the costs associated with that, um, in addition to what is currently happening with regard to Tiffany's work, there really is a need to look much deeper at that. So, you know, to look at the motion and understand kind of um, having that analytical period ahead of us really being data driven is, is much appreciated. To get to Council Member Matthew's point, it might take a little longer than what we were expecting. So I think um, we should have a conversation really early about, you know, as we continue to look into those different layers of the analysis, if it, if it, if it, it is more complicated than, than we're thinking. But, nearly every department is impacted in some way. And I know um, through conversations with Tiffany, there's so many things that she's currently thinking about in terms of infrastructure. Um, one opportunity cost that we do need to think about as a city is, you know, will this revenue source enhance and support that? Or is it potentially going into different directions that we, you know, that we might already be thinking about? So uh, much work moving ahead on this, but generally speaking, you know, um, Definitely appreciated taking the time and getting a little bit more deep into the analysis. I know the staff members who might want to speak to this, um, referencing Council Member Matthew's concern or the question she brought up. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of the Council, Bonnie Lipscomb, uh, Director of Economic Development. I just wanted to weigh in because we do have a process going on right now for our consolidated plan and just a, a little bit as way of background, our consolidated plan is a five-year planning process that we do that enables us to allocate CDBG and home funding in our communities. And through that process, and we're in that process now, and so we've been doing series of outreach meetings, but the Beach Flats area is part of a neighborhood revitalization 
stabilization strategy area specifically that enables us to prioritize CDBG and home funds. And so we have a whole plan um, and we do it every five years. So we have a series of them and they're all accessible through our website and you can look at um, that process and our outreach. And in fact, we just conducted outreach um, through, with the help and assistance of the Nueva Vista into this area and received close to a thousand responses, which is great. Um, so we'll be coming to you in March um, with a draft of the plan and the priority areas, as well as again in April. And then some of those decisions will be included with recommendations related to CDBG allocations for the next year's budget. So there is a lot of information about planning and process. And I'm encouraged with the priority areas as well. I think that reflects um, on a lot of the priority areas that are in um, the consolidated plan um, and in this NRSA. But I will say that the, the area that's been um, identified through the NRSA, the Neighborhood Revitalization Strategy Area, is, is a little bit larger than just the beach flats. It includes Lower Ocean. It goes up a little bit to um, Cathcart, south of Laurel. It's looking at um, geographic areas. So it's not exactly the same area as this. So it would be great to look at both plans and to see if, if there's some alignment there. So there is um, a lot of work that's been done to date. I think um, it makes sense to look at these together. It's definitely one of the priority areas um, in the city. Yeah. Mark Dettel, Director of Public Works. As the department that collects the parking revenue, um, I would just say, obviously that area is greatly impacted, no doubt, in the summertime. Um, this increase is not gonna affect the parking availability in that location. It won't change that. It will bring in revenue that you can use. Um, it is general fund revenue, just so you know that. It's not parking district revenue. That area goes to the general fund. Um, there, will, there may be an unintended consequence, though, by increasing the rates on the meters. Uh, more people are gonna park on the wharf, and that's already an issue for the wharf merchants that, that they have beach um, goers parking on the wharf. And so they're gonna be asking to raise those rates as well, just so that you, you know that. Um, they, that's always a struggle. They don't have parking for their customers. So there's a parking shortage in the beach area, there's no doubt. Um, but um, the other, I guess the other thing I would say is it can, it can clearly be done. Uh, the timeline looks short to me just because of the coordination and other work that our staff is currently working on. But um, we're happy to work and support the item if that's what council chooses. Councilmember Myers. Just while you're there, Mark, um, can you, I, I'm not sure that I know exactly how a parking district would get formed. Is that, I, I know you can do it by ordinance, but it, beyond outreach and, I mean, do we have, is there, there's not a vote or anything like that then? Yeah, that right. would have to be researched. I'm, to be honest with you, I couldn't give you that off the top, or maybe Martine can do that, but, um, there, there are different ways to do yeah, that. Yeah, I just, I'm, I'm just, yeah. this is more. Yeah, there are benefit assessment, question. <laughs> assessment districts that can be formed, and we've actually looked at one for mm -hmm. the beach area mm -hmm. uh, in the past, and mm -hmm. we've had some in other parts of the city. There was one in Harvey West, for example, that are created around different uh, objectives that the neighborhood wants to to uh, implement. Uh, largely, they've been around infrastructure, but there is a community assessment uh, or benefit assessment district formation process that exists as well. That's completely separate and different than then parking revenues uh, is, is the creating like its own district and it would generate revenue uh, from the properties basically. And so there, so I know in California law, there's lots of different ways to create districts related yes, to yes. Those housing, typically, economic development, all those things. And these so typically require the property owners to uh, elect to participate in the district. So there's a formation and election process that goes with that. I don't have it at the top of my head exactly what it is, but it's, it's, a, it's a process that has to be approved by the participating properties in the district. And then I just have a question for Bonnie. Um, thanks, Mark. Sure, I would say that, that, I mean, this model has been used to do improvements in downtowns, downtowns. or whatever they raise yeah. rates and they use that money to um, make, you know, lighting and, and landscaping improvements. I mean, we have things. a, that's what part of our parking. Uh, that's the way to pay for parking structures right. and that type of provide parking. Yeah. And Bonnie, does this area or a portion of this area fall into any of the opportunity zone designations that we were put into place or is that stop downtown? The lower Pacific. I'm visualizing the map right now. There was one in Lower Ocean. Um, yeah, I think it I does think. include, the, it's based on census tract, so I think it does include the Beach Flats area, but I'm not sure the exact boundary. I can go back and follow up with you on that. 
Uh, I had Council Member Brown. If you think that, thank you. Okay. Um, okay. I guess if there's no other questions at this time, we can hold our comments and open up to the public for public comment on this item. So if there's any member of the public that would like to speak to us on this item, please line up to our left and you'll have two minutes. Thanks, Council. This is Ray Cancino, CEO Community Bridges. Um, I just wanted to appreciate staff um, and also um, the council members that work to try to get this together, including, uh, including Tony uh, from Parks and Rec, to kind of think about this idea moving forward. Uh, today's action, you know, I think, is important to think about the opportunities that are down there. Uh, we have the Seaside Company that has some parking that are, that is rented from the city and is charging at a higher rate than some of the hourly uh, metered parking. And so I think that that's one thing that um, should be kind of recognized and understood. The second thing is that the current proposal isn't to remove any current existing general fund dollars. This is only to be using the increase um, to move forward into the impact zone. So one thing we always come up here uh, and talk to council members and always have this like political struggle is around uh, a scarcity mindset, a scarcity model around funding and inability to do everything we want to do. This is an opportunity for us to create a, a fund that will help generate uh, additional revenues to get some of those dream projects taken care of. And they could be uh, done in coordination uh, with existing plans. And I think that's what the intention was of creating these plans and why you see the collaboration and the understanding of some of the needs in the community. I think uh, further to that, um, there's opportunity here uh, to really make a drastic change in a local impacted district um, that is heavily impacted by tourism that benefits all of us in different ways, um, but at the same time gives back at a more equitable way by limiting its scope to that location. The location that was uh, shown above was just where the parking um, uh, area was first identified uh, through this process. We hope to continue to kind of talk about what does that mean. Initially, we removed the wharf uh, from that um, opportunity zone because the reality was we wanted a free uh, local uh, place where people could still park for cheap and essentially still uh, provide some level of kind of uh, recourse for people that didn't have the money to pay the additional parking fees. So I think that all these things have been thought about, but I think there's opportunity for us to continue to improve um, as we get feedback from more partners. So I look forward to being a part of the team. Thank you. All right, next speaker. Elise Casby, community organizer and longtime environmental activist. I just want to take an opportunistic moment <laughs> after thanking Councilmember Glover and the staff for putting this together. I think it's really important in good faith to, to help the people of Beach Flats immediately with some kind of um, project. And I think this is an opportunity. Uh, Director Dettel has said that this it's done in other places and it might be workable. Um, obviously, Bonnie Lipscomb and Cynthia Matthews and others have said that it might take more research. Susie has said that. But I would just ask that we do something small um, to help the people there. Um, and it sounds like it would take not too much effort. I also want to take that opportunistic moment to say, look at the map right there, the visual that you have, wouldn't it be wonderful if there were solar panels over all of that area, which has become quite industrially impacted by the parking. Um, we are in a moment where we have to think of emergency. If you are in an earthquake and you realize your bed is shaking, right then, your bed's shaking, and at first you think things like, well, Am I moving my bed? Is somebody doing something to the building? Then you realize you're in an earthquake. Immediately you take massive action. You cover your head, you get your pets, you get out of harm's way, you go out of the house, you dive under a table that is moving. You take massive action. We are in a moment where we need visionary uh, people government leaders who were willing to stop diddling around and take massive action. Beach Flats is not gonna be there in a few years. The ice is melting, I recommend um, The End of Ice by Dar Jamil. Please help us do something small now like this, but really let's put solar panels all over that parking area and get not only energy, but revenue. Thank, Thank you. you. Next speaker.
Well, impact zones are, uh, Gareth Phillip, uh, widely misused in a lot of places, but uh, I actually kind of like the third part of that infrastructure. Doesn't sound so bad, those streets are kind of beat up. I don't like the idea of a permanent forever fund that just goes there. I mean, when does that stop? I don't, I don't get it. Anyway, let's go through this. I see we have another progressive crone, Glover Cummings, cornucopia of social programs being this time funded by any tourist hikes and parking meter rates. How high would they have to rise to fund such a plethora of social programs boggles the mind. I see no actual statistics how this city has not provided essential city services to Beach Flat. They're not special that they deserve a designated extra funding source compared to anyone else. They do have things that other people don't have like their community garden. Uh, it's a blank check social program measure justified once again by supposed op oppression. This time it's where the city thinks some of the public, this time tourists who actually bring money into the city and its locals are cows to be milked as environmental villains. Your own links to the state environmental survey indicate Santa Cruz, a city's worst CES census tract is actually right on top of Francis Forty Middle School, has a low CES score of 1821, a CES percentile of 3376, and a no ranking of uh, SB 535 for a determined of a disadvantaged community for environmental factors. Every other census track in the city is better. Uh, as to congestion, well, there's a lot of congestion in this city in a lot of places. In fact, if you wanna put one of these impact zones around Garfield Park and put in parking meters, that'd be okay with me too. Um, just as a sarcastic comment. It's more victim oppressor leftist agenda stuff. This time it's tourists, the oppressors, and anyone minus a few bucks, the victims. Somehow I contest the idea Beach Flats residents are victims of tourism, all things considered. They probably even work for the tourist industry. It's a social program, unjustified money grab, redistribution of wealth unjustly from tourists by a jurisdiction operating with a manufactured inappropriate social welfare, ideologically possessed fake mandate to spend on an unrelated whatever they want, whenever they want. Thank you. And I'd like to ask if there's any other member of the public, aside from the gentleman who's approaching the podium, who would like to speak to us on this issue. Seeing none, you'll be our last speaker. Good, good afternoon, Scott Graham. Um, I lived in Beach Flats before, and the traffic down there is terrible in the summer. Um, it's, I, w I would like to actually see an air quality uh, survey done down there in the peak of summer traffic because I think the air quality is really bad and I'm sure a lot of the kids growing up down there have breathing problems that are directly related to the amount of traffic on the streets there in the summertime. <clears throat> and it would be really great to somehow eliminate the traffic. I mean, if we you know put in a monorail or something, um, have people park up on the summit and take a water slide down into town or something, you know? And it's like, um, and just to get rid of the traffic, I, it, there's gotta be a solution to where we can get less traffic there. And as far as increasing the revenues of this fund, uh, how about a tax on the parking at the boardwalk? So that, you know, they are c contributing to the, some of the solutions to the problem that they've caused. I think that might be a good idea. Thank you. Yeah. All right. And so with that, I'll bring it back to Council for Action Deliberation. I'd just like to say before we move on this item, to me it sounds like there is a lot of, there's a lot of consensus around um, this impact fund being something that can be beneficial to the community. And I think that um, one of the things that I've been hearing from council members in terms of questions and comments is really around coordinating with what the city's currently doing um, and yet what's going on in a lot of the different departments. And so I think it sounds like you know, if we're able to coordinate our efforts well, that this could be something that we could work on. And additionally, that the timeline seems a bit short. And I would agree that I think that that does seem like a pretty short timeline given that it's uh, it's the middle of February and April's gonna come really quickly. So um, I saw Council Member Watkins, Council Member Glover, and Council Member Matthews, and then Brown. I, I appreciate your comments, Mayor, and I think um, maybe I could offer a friendly amendment to help sort of um, 
identify those in the direction if there's no motion no yet. Motion yet. Oh, okay. Maybe then I can offer the motion if that's uh, okay with those. I know it was, um, I already thought we were already there, but I, I realized that was before comment. So maybe I'll just go ahead and move a recommendation to direct staff to work with co-signing council members, community bridges, and other interested community partners. And then through an inclusive and equitable community and data-driven process, that includes the incorporation of current resilient coast adaptation efforts and outcomes, high up as a framework, economic development's current efforts, and a more detailed analysis of establishing a beach flats impact fund, including fund allocation strategies in the context of existing funding opportunities. Um, to develop a policy framework and then the remainder of the, of the motion, to develop a policy framework feasibility implementation plan or to inform the development of a positive, uh, to inform the development of a policy framework feasibility and implementation plan to establish a beach, beach flats impact fund through parking meter revenue and return to council with analysis results and action plan as early as possible or before summer? Second. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. Pick, pick one. Okay. Um, with it, with as, as close to April as possible, as early as possible. I mean, I'll second that and then we can talk about it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, Do you want me to repeat it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and hope, if, if you could speak slowly as well. I have it. Yeah. Let me just, uh, but you would have to add it. I don't have it, I have it sort of my little, my comments blended into that. Do you want me to e email what I have? Reread it? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go slow, I'm sorry. Okay, so motion to direct staff to work with co-signing counts members, community bridges, and other interested community partners through an inclusive and equitable community and data-driven process That includes the incorporation of current resilient coast adaptation efforts and outcomes. High up as a framework. Economic development's current efforts and a more detailed analysis of establishing a beach flat Flats Impact Fund, including fund allocation strategies in the context of existing funding op opportunities, opportunities to to have developed to create or to establish the policy to establish, um, to inform the policy framework feasibility and implementation plan. I think we could really just probably have that and return to city council as close to April 2020 since the other is already referenced above. Does that fit for you, Councilmember Glover? Um, if I could have a reread in its entirety and I can kind of compare it, uh, that would have been totally, that was, yeah. <laughs> I think while we're waiting on that, I'm wondering if it's okay if there's other comments that were brought up, if we can address those and then we can revisit the motion. Uh, yeah. Um, so I can come back to you once once it's kind of cleared up. And so if that's, if that's okay with you, mm -hmm. unless you want to comment. No. Oh, I just had, uh, uh, just with regards to the, it was nice to work with staff on this project uh, and kind of get the idea of what's going on. Our, our idea and perception, I believe, was to acknowledge the interconnectedness of the policy and how it needs to be worked across departments, but because of the uh, policy and the eight hours of time and not wanting to get ahead of ourselves and reach out to staff to have them invest time on it without the express direction of the council, that was kind of left out, which is why we met with the city manager's office representatives and the Director of Parks and Rec. Um, so moving into this uh, with the, I think it was encompassed 
and I, I'm sure when we hear it reiterated in the current motion that it will take form that it is across all affected departments, with essentially with regards to looking at that kind of stuff. Um, and I appreciate some of the feedback, not only about the uh, implementation plans or plans that are already being worked on, like the neighborhood revitalization plan and, and working with the resilient coast plan, but also in thinking about the uh, impact on the wharf. So thank you, Director Dettel, for that input. And I'm looking forward to the process of working through this with all the different departments so that we can talk about how we can minimize unnecessary impact in other places, but still be able to um, kind of uh, move on those opportunities as was uh, suggested by Mr. Cansino, so. Councilmember Matthews. Um, it, I do get the impression that the motion as stated uh, duplicates a huge amount of work that's already in, in process that has been done and is in process. So that's a concern for me. Um, I wonder if the maker of the motion um, wants to reconsider integrating. And then the other thing is who takes the lead on this? Would this be another um, three-person council subcommittee working with uh, a lead staff person? Um, it seems to me, um, the way the whole neighborhood revitalization research and outreach has proceeded with a longer term plan um, has been one that um, relied heavily on outreach, reporting to council for direction, and then um, taking it the next step. And quite honestly, that's what I see as probably um, a more productive um, path to go. I just, I just want to put that out. It's certainly the path I'd prefer. Brown. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I'm uh, really pleased that this has come before us. I've seen examples in various communities, kind of across California in particular, but really <laughs> the country, uh, with various funding mechanisms uh, to establish these kinds of impact funds in uh, neighborhoods which are often low income, um, surrounding you know tourism. Uh, serving businesses and others, uh, I think of the Staples Center in downtown LA and the community benefits agreements that were established there through a very bottom up um, process of really working with the community. And I'm glad that Nueva Vista and Community Bridges is has been involved in the conversation and that you're on board to um, to really bring the community's voice. And I know that's happening in other some of these other initiatives, but um, to really identify what some of those needs are and specific ways that they could specific funding projects that could be funded with this. So I, I think it's really great this is happening and I'm looking forward to hearing more. I wonder if the, um, depending on how this goes, uh, with a report back, I mean, if, if it's gonna take longer, if it's gonna take a while, maybe we could get a progress report if they're, depending on who's, like which staff and individuals, if the three council members who brought this to us want to be um, a committee or unofficial, um, but like some, some kind of progress update on what you're doing and how it's, how it's going would be nice if we're not going to get any official report by April. Something in this direction. One of the things that I would just like to say is that I think my understanding with the intention of the motion is that um, the efforts that we would be doing would be working in conjunction with what's already in process within the city and that we wouldn't be duplicating efforts or trying to um, start from scratch with any of this. The idea is that we can see sort of what's being worked on, what's being done, and then incorporate this into the current work of staff so that, because I think that that's one of the things we don't want to do is that we don't want to duplicate efforts and we don't want to, for example, have multiple different meetings happening within the community because mm -hmm. I think that we also worry about community burnout mm -hmm. um, from us kind of asking the community constantly to come and meet with us. And so my understanding from the motion is that it's really an opportunity to start working with what's going, what departments are doing already within the context of health and all policies and um, and really trying to um, become more efficient with what we're gonna be doing in this process. So uh, that, I just wanted to say that because I, I feel like I'm, I'm hearing um, that it seems like we might be 
creating more work when I think the mm -hmm. purpose is that we're trying to create less work um, for staff and kind of work with what's already been, been going on. So, Council Member Glover and then Vice Mayor Myers. Yeah, I appreciate you saying that, Mayor. Uh, that was something that it kept sticking out for me, which I'm a little confused about uh, with the, the idea that somehow this is going to be a brand new project. It seemingly and intentionally is working on the work that's already been done and building off it to emphasize the need for there to be a residual funding source to be able to provide services in addition to what's already being planned for the Beach Flats community through parking revenue and using examples from other places that are proven to be effective and can be implemented somewhat uh, easily looking at those models, just taking into consideration the impacts it would have on the different departments, which is why we wanted direct staff to work on it. So um, I, I'm with you in that interpretation of the motion as well as the um, intention of the item. Mayor Myers. Yeah, I just wanted to thank um, the three council members that brought this in the mayor that brought this forward. Um, I think it's exciting and it, I, I think I am interpreting the motion as well. Um, in terms of its, uh, you know, recognizing that, you know, a wider net will be cast, you know, with the staff. Um, I think these things are incredibly in, uh, exciting to do and they're very complicated. And so I would just suggest that maybe that you do set summer as a more likely mm -hmm. um, timeline because um, even though there's, there is need now, I think if you're sort of biting off, you know, this sort of big of an effort, I think it's worth the time to do it and, you know, maybe have access to, you know, experts through the league and other, other groups that, so I, I just think that give yourself the time to really do it and explore everything and maybe just, you know, give yourself a schedule that allows you to do that. That's my and, and I'll also yeah. just building on that, um, I know that Council Member Myers, myself, Council Member Brown have been on the library subcommittee and I know that we anticipated a much shorter timeline of when we would be reporting back and just knowing that um, what you might, you know, initially start off with in the timeline you think you can get things done, oftentimes those timelines um, are much longer than expected because of um, unforeseen um, circumstances and situations that arise. So I think that, you know, setting a date that it comes before summer, I think would be appropriate. And then if there needs to be adjustment, um, then I think that it would be great if there's space for that as well. So I just wanted to say that. Okay, maybe I can, mod oh, I'm sorry. Bonnie wanted to maybe. I just wanted to respond to the question earlier that I wasn't able to answer around opportunity zones. And the, the answer is yes, um, the Beach Flats area and the wharf is included in the opportunity zone. And the, the benefit for that is for investors can defer um, when they invest in a property or development tax over a number of years. And if they keep it in for a full seven to 10 years, actually that tax can be forgiven as part of the project. So it's a bit big incentive for being able to invest in a community. And we specifically um, included, um, requested for that census tract to be included. So it's helpful to have staff with a lifeline um, who can text you quickly. So thank you. Thank you. Rural Watkins and then Glover. I am um, reading this. I'm trying, I'm thinking maybe now I can, if I could maybe offer, I think I inserted my section probably in the wrong location that this maybe doesn't come up as much of a robust kind of approach, but more so in a consideration of how we would move forward. So I'm wondering if you could um, cut out my um, additions with through an inclusive, equitable, starting with through an inclusive, inclusive and equitable community. Do you see that, Bonnie? It's the third line. Oh, right here? Yes. Yeah. Start, starting at through an inclusive and equitable. So start cutting that or cutting for pasting somewhere else. So we um, select through an inclusive, equitable community and data-driven process that includes incorporating um, current coast adaptation efforts and outcomes with the framework, with the, it's the health and all policies framework, economic development, and more detailed analysis of the fund allocation strategies and existing funding opportunities. No, just, um, just cut it out to that, to the, yep. Cut that. Delete. Cut. cut. Just, just cut. to cut, and then we'll paste it, um, and then paste it after implementation plan.
And then, and then it would say to, that includes um, consideration and then paste. That includes, um, actually you don't have, you could delete consideration. Delete what? It could, uh, consideration. Just, you could delete that word. And through, right? That includes, through and through, sorry, and through and. So it's more just including it in terms of conceptualizing it as it moves forward, but not using it as the way to design it. That's sorry, I inserted it in the wrong spot. So I'm, I apologize for the confusion in terms of the robustness that came out of it, but to, to build it into how it is designed moving forward, because the impact fund as, deci as designed is, is a relatively small amount of money. So we wanna keep it in this broader context through this bigger initiatives and thinking about how holistically we're working towards the, um, the really primarily the pillars of, of what health and all policies is. Does that make more sense? Yeah, I'm just reading okay. through it. twice. I know, and so. Mm -hmm. so one, one thing I would maybe recommend is after detailed analysis establishing, to delete to develop, so it'll be a detailed analysis establishing the policy framework feasibility and implementation plan. Right here? Uh, no, above. Third, fourth. Fourth line. As right. an editor, I'd su suggest making about four sentences out of that. It's, <laughs> it's one run on sentence. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, fourth line down next to establishing Next, on um, to the right, to develop, to delete that. Delete it? Yeah. Oh, no, no, not the establishing part, but to develop, yeah. It's just establishing the policy framework of feasibility and implementation. Councilmember uh, so Council Member Glover. Uh, I know that uh, Council Member um, Watkins suggested the health and all policies be in there, and I think it should go outcomes with the Health and all policies framework. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Comma, economic development, current effort, comma, and more detailed analysis. Not, might I make a suggestion okay. under including fund and then in addition to allocation strategies instead of just another and because that's a lot of ands. So beach flats include and including beach flat implement including fund allocation. Is it fund allocation or fund and allocation? It'd be fund allocation. Yeah. So delete and fund allocation strategies and existing funding opportunities. And then if if I'm sorry. If I may, we could also cut off to establish a beach flats impact yeah. fund, um, meter, parking meter revenue, and then just say, and return to council. Uh, Does that fit? Since uh, it's already I, referenced. I, I, it doesn't specify parking. So I would, to establish be, a beach flats parking fund, you could strike that and then opportunities through parking meter revenue and return to council. Because there's nowhere else in there it says parking revenue. Okay. If you just strike to establish a beach flats impact fund, and just take that out. There's part of that highlight. Yeah, there you go. There, opportunities through parking meter revenue and return to council. Mm -hmm. Council Member Matthews. Next. And then I'll. Just a sure. kind of a functional question. Who's taking the lead on this? Uh, I would imagine it would be the sponsoring council members and the uh, staff department heads that would be working on it, but probably led by it's the three be, council members. I would prefer that staff take the lead, engaging the council members. I also think it's important that a wide net be cast 
in terms of the community partners who are engaged from the beginning? I'm just asking the question. Someone's got to, this is a big job. Someone's got to do it. So maybe I turn to Martine. Well, I, I seem to me like this is a, essentially a subcommittee that's being established of the city council and uh, our office will assign a staff okay. person to take so the lead true. and to coordinate with all the various departments uh, and move it forward. Councilmember Glover. So two uh, friendly amendment requests then based on that, if we are gonna have this be a subcommittee, then it would be uh, direct, the, I guess, from the beginning, direct the formation of a subcommittee with the co-signing council members to work with staff, community bridges, and so on. And so we'll start there with the maker of the motion. So you can, can you just state that portion of the amendment again? Yeah, the direct the formation of a subcommittee with the co-signing council members, because that would be the three council members that signed on to it, and uh, to work with staff, comma, community bridges, and other interested, and so on. And other interested community partners. What he's saying is to, to then continue on the rest of the mm -hmm. motion. Yeah, it's just yeah. an amendment to that first sentence. And so this is to maker of the motion or so a friendly um, amendment. Yeah. Great. Uh, yeah. So there was a friendly amendment made by council member Glover, accepted by council member Watkins, council member right. Matt. So, so. And then the second one was uh, to, for what council member Brown had said, which just not just an open ended as soon as possible, but to have a report back sometime in April of the pro progress, whether or not it's able to be moved forward or not, but a report back in April, just to let us know where we're at. And that would be to the maker of the motion, friendly amendment. Just an informal report back. Just a report mm -hmm. back, yeah. Uh -huh. Update, sure. Okay. okay, so another friendly amendment to have a report back in April made by Council Member Glover, was accepted by um, Council Member Watkins, and then Council Member Matthews was on deck, and I have a Technical, well. I think it's, a, it's not a subcommittee, it's a committee, right? I mean, it's not a, not a sub of anything. Council right, it's yeah. a committee, yeah, sure. Yeah, we slipped. I would just like to add, if um, this might be accepted, um, that the last sentence where it says strategies and existing funding opportunities through parking meter revenue, I would like to ask that there be a friendly amendment that um, it be an existing funding opportunities, including but not limited to parking meter revenue because I think that there may be other opportunities and we don't want mm -hmm. to um, leave their, leave any opportunity out. And we can consider parking meter revenue, but is there something else that we might want to consider as well in addition to parking meter revenue or in place of parking meter revenue? So that's, that's a fine. friendly amendment. Mm -hmm. Mike, I'm sorry, I, I feel I understand where you're going with that just because you want to maximize the benefit to the district. I'm a little concerned that in doing that, it will make it too broad and not focused enough. Uh, you know, if we can create the benefit district that's specifically focused around parking meter revenue now, and then maybe revisit it after that's established and you're starting to generate revenue through that in collaboration with the other uh, departments that are doing the work. But if, you know, if you were to just look at all other potential revenue generation, that could open up the timeline to be much longer than just analyzing the parking and the impact of the parking changes. Go, Councilman Matt um, Watkins, and then Crone. My, my thoughts around that is to understand that even if that we did establish just this parking revenue or, or not, but we do wanna think broadly about other funding options or opportunities. So I am supportive of that going on because it, it is one funding source potentially with limited funding revenue um, growth and there are other ways that we can leverage additional funding, uh, whether we have it now or in the future, but I do think we wanna keep it in that broader context. So I'm supportive of adding the addition personally. To um, Councilmember Crone, and then I have a comment to make as well. Thanks, with respect to um, the parking part and the April 20th, is it, are we trying to get this done before the tourist season by June? My understanding is, well, I'll, I'll, I mean, I, I guess I can speak to it, but my understanding is that 
and what's been expressed by the community. And I think that what an understanding that many of the council members have is that this is going to be pretty complicated. Um, it sounds like there's a lot of work that's been going on um, in multiple different departments. And if we're going to try to coordinate this in a in a way that you know we can really make it work for the community, it's going to take some time. And so I think that that's why um, bringing it back, you know, before summer was laid out as a timeline. And I think that personally, it's something that we, the members of the subcommittee should look at. And, and so I was going to even say that by having that language around including but not limited to provides flexibility within the subcommittee and the members of the subcommittee can actually, you know, decide what is the appropriate way to move forward so that, you know, if it's going to be, we're you know, if we want to consider a breadth of funding opportunities, that might take a really long time. Do we want to focus on something more narrow? We have that flexibility. So, um, so I'll just I'll just end there. But that's that, those are my thoughts, um, and that actually takes care of my comments. So, Councilmember Glover. So you're sticking with that friendly amendment with the broadness? Yes. All right. Well, then I will also accept it. Uh, as the seconder of the motion, just wanted to make sure that it was so we have consistent. A friendly and amendment made by Councilmember Glover. That was made by you. Or sorry, myself. <laughs> I mean, coming <laughs> accepted by Councilmember Glover and, and by uh, Councilmember Watkins. Yeah, and then the other thing um, was, I guess it was just how to do the timeline, but that's okay since I'll be on the committee, so we'll talk about it then. Councilmember Watkins. I just think I think we have maybe one more editing um, little bit. If you wouldn't mind going up, Bonnie, on the on the screen, um, to inform policy. If we, um, and then take out the second and that in, after data driven process. Take out that includes again. So that incorporates? Yeah, because I think it got, re yeah. And then after, sorry, then going back up to the third line, after inform, to inform a policy framework. Sorry, I was just cleaning, okay. Thank you. Okay. Any further comments on this item? Seeing oh, none, we'll I do. Sure. Sure. It's not even mine, but policy framework, and I think it's opportunity zoning. What's feasibility zoning? The feasibility of the policy. Feasibility and um, policy framework. Feasibility, it's a feasibility, comma. Comma. Zoning. Okay. Um, feasibility. Do it next to zoning. Policy framework. policy framework, comma, feasibility, comma. <coughs> oh, that's right. So I had a po po um, policy First feasibility. I think you can cut out zoning adaptations outcomes. Feasibility. Maybe you can just a more detailed analysis establishing the policy framework feasibility and implementation plan. So I think it was repeated twice to inform a more detailed analysis. Excuse me. And implementation plan, you could strike establishing, you could strike that fourth line establishing the policy framework feasibility because it's repeated and then just. All of it? Well, I think actually you would just take out inform and then cut out a policy framework feasibility more and then and then just leave it at more detailed an analysis. The first a policy framework feasibility you would cut. The inform part? You would leave inform a and then cut out the first policy framework feasibility. From A more, you see, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's the first, yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay, I think that covers, I think it was just double. Yeah. 
Oh, this was posted by the Federal Reserve. Mm -hmm. Want it very detailed. Yeah. <laughs> well, grammatically, we will fix it. Okay, but okay, right. fine. Yeah. There you go. That is good. I think okay. That's yeah. All right. So, if there's any no further comment on this item, we'll take it to a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Sure. Passes unanimously. All right. All right. Moving on to item number 20 on our general business is warming center funding. Um, this will be presented by um, Ralph Dimmercut, principal management analyst. Ralph Demerica, Principal Management Analyst with the City Manager's Office. Um, good afternoon, evening, everybody. Um, so this is a quick presentation, and before you today is um, you, the council is being asked to review the proposal from the Warming Center and the draft agreement uh, that was prepared by the City Attorney. And if council wishes to proceed with funding the program, um, to a uh, motion to authorize the city manager to enter into a contract in a form approved by the city attorney uh, with the warming center and be um, to um, pass a resolution to amend the fiscal year 2020 budget and appropriate um, a general fund budget of $15,000 to the program. Um, if, as you uh, all may remember, um, at the January 14, uh, 2020 city council meeting, um, a motion was carried to potentially allocate $15,000 to the warming center um, with added stipulation that uh, an indemnification insurance um, reporting on the process, scope of work, and a budget for services um, be returned to the city council at the earliest possible meeting um, in the form of a contract for the city council's approval. Um, Following that meeting um, on January 23rd, um, we received a document from the Warning Center, uh, Warming Center detailing their scope of work, um, budget of ser services, and uh, reporting process um, as was requested by the City Council. Uh, we forwarded this information to the City Attorney's Office who then drafted a uh, agreement um, for your review tonight. And um, should the council wish to financially support the warming center, um, a resolution for a budget adjustment, um, which is attached, would also have to be adopted. And the $15,000, as mentioned, would come from the general fund. Uh, I believe um, we have Mr. Adams here who could answer additional questions um, from the warming center. And um, that concludes my report. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Are there any, before you leave, I just wanna see if there's any questions for you from members of the council. Yes. My only question is uh, technical. So I assume when in the reading through the material um, that the contract which suggests exhibit A by exhibit A, you mean the warming center scope of work, which it just doesn't say exhibit A on it. It's, that's exhibit A? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I just wanted to Let make me that. Let double check that for you. Make sure of that. And I think that's, I have some questions for Mr. Adams, but. Okay, thank you. you. Oh, wait, um, are there any questions? questions on the contract itself, or are we still deliberating? I was, if there's any questions for Ralph at this time. I just said, uh, yeah, um, I, well, I'll wait, I'll wait till we, okay. And, well, and okay. Mr. Kanadi, <laughs> would, <laughs> Mr. Kanadi, would you be available to answer uh, questions uh, regarding the contract um, specifically? I just had a question on, I see the, um, I see the budget, and so I'm just trying to get a sense. So, so I just want to make sure I'm understanding what we're what's proposed. So this is for warming warming center um, provision of of warming center um, nights tied to specific conditions, as well as materials. It looks like. Um, for uh, folks when they're when they're when they're entering into those, um, you know, the warming center nights. I don't know. I don't Mr. Know. Adams, did you want to discuss the specifics of your budget? Yeah. So and I'm, yeah. Sorry. So maybe what we can have before we do that, maybe if, if there's any other questions for okay. um, analysts at this time, we can have those. Then we can have um, Brent Adams has four minutes okay. to give a, a presentation, and then um, we can hear from members of the public, and then maybe bring it back to. Um, council if they have questions for um, Brent Adams. Okay. 
So I guess my question is, I just want to make sure that I'm, I, I'm just confirming that this would be, that the budget is for providing those services for those night, nightly warming center operations. Yes. Councilmember Matthews. And I had similar uh, questions about the scope of the project um, because the, um, what's referred to as the warming center program uh, talks about specifically <coughs> extreme weather shelter at four church sites, but then goes on to talk about um, the storage facility. And so is that also uncovered in, in this proposal? Um, it, it just isn't clear what the, um, the scope of the project is. And um, um, I guess I, I do have other questions. Um, this is for 15,000 for this fiscal year. So it would be from the point that the appropriate documentation is submitted through uh, June 31st. And um, there will hopefully be relatively few cold nights. So again, the question, is it for the cold nights? Is it for other um, programs? And then it talks about a second location um, for the warming center, uh, a second facility. Our, our capacity to open two facilities at once. So where is that? Will there be um, use permits? What will be the conditions of use? And um, what are the permits or conditions of use at the existing site? So, it's it's I, just I unclear. Have, I, have, right, I have some of those same questions, but I was thinking that those would mm -hmm. be best answered by Mr. Adams. So I'm, I'm putting them out there yeah. so okay. that he'll know oh, what so, they okay. are. <laughs> okay, so I, I, then I'll just put some out there too, sure. so you're aware. Um, so I um, I was wondering that too, because we, g given that the goal was to get this funding to you um, during the winter, and it's now three, four months later, um, <laughs> there's a short window here. Um, so if you could talk, speak to that. Um, and then I also have questions about, like if you could help us understand, I see storage program in the budget, and I assume that means like a contribution to rent where it's easy for me to think about it because I've been there to the facility and I've, I understand how the operation works, but trying to lay that out a little bit would be helpful. Um, not necessarily here, but like maybe how you would give us a little more information or in a report. So maybe I think what would be best is um, maybe if we can invite up Brent Adams. Um, we've, he reached out to us beforehand, and so we've allocated four mm -hmm. minutes. And then I yeah. think that what would be appropriate is that if council members have questions, Brent, then mm -hmm. they can ask those questions to you at this point in time. So Thank give you, you four council. Minutes, four minutes for your initial presentation, and then council members can ask questions. I did have a handout for you. I hope you can uh, view that. Um, don't have a copy of that in front of me, but uh, and it's a little uh, difficult to look at. So let's just be clear. Uh, Warming Center is not unlike the Red Cross. We stay ready at all times right now, ready to shelter uh, as many as 150 people. To, uh, uh, and, and so that takes a lot of uh, funding and I have to hire a person. So also let's be clear, our 20 year traditional winter shelter has collapsed. You don't have one. So we are a backup program to no winter shelter system. So I have to be ready to, so for the hundreds of people outside, it, this, this program came into being 2013, 2014, when we had a 10 day cold snap of below freezing. So we haven't seen that condition yet, but that's actually why we have a warming center and we open up. And if you see on the document every year because of community support, community support from the county and a city, we raise that temperature threshold a degree every year from 32 all the way up now. We just opened uh, last week at 40 degrees. So uh, what we're, and that's, that, and that's part of what we're doing because there's no winter shelter. There is no shelter for hundreds of people. We're ready to shelter 100, 200 people on a given night up, up in two locations. We have four locations, MOUs with our locations. So what we would do is, and so, and also to be clear, uh, I've already spent a bit of this money with the first vote, unanimous vote, before you uh, went on break. Um, I was all ready to uh, get ready to hire a person, make sure we had those uh, uh, materials uh, paid for so that I could open in two locations for as many as 10 nights. Um, uh, I want to make sure I'm answering your questions. Mm -hmm. So we have the MOU do, uh, doc, and, and over two years uh, past, 
two years in a row, the city had elected to um, uh, allow us to use a Harvey West clubhouse. We're not in a conversation uh, like that uh, this time around. We're no longer in conversations with, with the city, county, or uh, Salvation Army about a network uh, to, to protect people like we did last year and the year, year, year past. So we have a red flag condition here that only the warming center has stepped up to meet. Um, I feel like I'm being redundant now. So uh, purchasing of materials, uh, more than we've had ever in the past. I hired staff person to duplicate me so that I can, we can open in two different locations. We have MOUs with churches already in place so that I can open. If I hit the wall, I don't know we're gonna have more than 100 people uh, say until about 11 p.m. In that case, I can open up our, our, our secondary location. That person can go there and is fully trained uh, and can uh, manage volunteers, clean the place up, uh, uh, meet our requirements with the site location. They're all extremely happy with us. Never had a problem with our site locations. Um, and so when we're dormant, like tonight, we're actually busy right now doing the work. Uh, so the storage is really storage of materials, not our storage program, let's be clear. You're not helping to pay any of our other programs. Um, but this person, you know, at the Red Cross, when they're not opening what are, or, or doing some emergency work, what are they doing? Do, they're, do, they're not at home. They're not taking, they're not on call. They're at, at their desk doing other stuff. So that's kind of what we're doing. W right tonight, we'll be handing out dozens of hand warmers. Every single person in the last year who've requested a blanket has given a bl been given a blanket by us. That's a huge undertaking that, that's not budgeted. Our donation programs, we have donation barrels at Staff of Life Market, West Side. People are constantly, every day, flooding things in, that's coats, blankets, uh, underwear, clothing. Bl uh, uh, so ev that, that's actually happening. And so that's kind of also what we're doing. Some of this funding helps that manage, uh, that uh, uh, administrative capacity to be able to manage something like that. We've never put that in our funding. Uh, so I don't know if that answers all your questions, but locations, the ability to uh, uh, protect more people. Um, and again, we're waiting for that 10 day cold snap and we're ready, <laughs> city of Santa Cruz, to. To, to care for hundreds of people if we get 10 days. So that's really what this is helping us uh, affirm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll go ahead and open it up to public comment on this item. And so if there's any member of the public who would like to address us for two minutes, please line up to the left. And then when public comment ends, we'll open it back up for questions for um, Brent Adams. Hi, I'm um, sorry, I have a very little voice, but I still want to speak, and I'm Nancy Crusoe. Um, I've been, I love the warming center, but I've been there every night since we opened five years ago, five and a half years ago, and it's an amazing thing to me to be able to go there and to feel that I'm doing something important <laughs> and to watch it grow and meet needs that we didn't even anticipate in the beginning. So even though our th temperature threshold is, people freeze at 40, you know, I go downtown, I go to the gym at, late at night. So I'm downtown with people who are out all night. And I immediately noticed how horrible it was on 42 or 41 degree nights that people were freezing. So Brent started a hotline and a distribution of blankets and of hand warmers and things that people need. And I was able to feel great relief because I didn't have to do it, but I knew it was being taken care of. And I so appreciate that as a resident. And I don't know if I have one more minute. I would just like to read a final paragraph of something I wrote to you last night. Um, I wish we had, I think Warming Center is a great asset to Santa Cruz. I wish we had many more such open-hearted programs offering each person basic things we take for granted with as few bureaucratic entanglements as possible. And that last part is important because it carries respect and not acknowledges we are all one. That's Thank it. you. Next speaker. Phil Posner, uh, here with my uh, my dog, Ahona. I literally got out of bed to come down here because I have a cold. But I want to tell you, Ahona doesn't have a cold. In fact, when she is cold, she has a nice warm place to sleep. My house, and she can even pee in a park, and she can sleep in a park. She has 
more things going for her in some ways than some of the people in our community who lack shelter. I'm here on behalf of Conscience in Action with my co-founder, Nicholas, and on behalf of the Association of Faith Community Board, of which I'm a member, to urge you to continue to support Brent's incredible work. I know a few people who have more passion and more creativity to deal with issues having to do with people who lack shelter. So on behalf of <laughs> uh, my dog and myself uh, and organizations, I hope you will follow up with the wonderful vote that you made um, the last meeting that you did use, that you made to support uh, Brent's work. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Wakona. Okay, next speaker. Hello, Satya Ryan. Um, yeah, thank you so much for funding the Warming Center. I hope that this goes through. Um, I've been I've been just really impressed with, I, I mostly just see what Brent does on Facebook, but I've just been so impressed by the initiative he's taken to start this on his own. I mean, he's done so much. I keep seeing the additional things he adds to the program. And I walk around downtown on cold nights, and sometimes just at night I step out for a minute and I think about our homeless community friends who are, I wonder where they are, what they're doing, and knowing that, I, I, I like hearing the, the 40 degree threshold because that's really cold at 40, you know, and sometimes even at 45 it's cold. So I, I thank you, and, um, and, I, and I do appreciate the work that you're doing, Brent, and um, and I'm not clear on if this is including all of all of your programs or um, just the the um, the warming center sleeping program. But I think that they're all worthy of funding, and I can, can't imagine how this how he puts all this together by himself and and volunteers. So thank you for your help for this wonderful program. Thank you. Next speaker. Hi, Suzanne McLean. I'm the uh, vice chair of the Association of Faith Communities. And uh, for those of you I haven't met, most of you I've met before. Um, I'm also speaking on behalf of the Warming Center. We've, we've had a lot of different um, working relationships with uh, Brent. And um, I think our last speaker said it well. He, he has the heart for people who are less well off. He's also passionate, which means he's not always polite. He steps on toes. Sometimes he, well, I wouldn't say bites the hand of feed him, but maybe nibbles on it. But the thing about Brent is he's doing what we talk about doing. He's doing what people in the community think about. They think, oh, what can we do for these people? He's not waiting around for that. He's doing it. And for that, he has my utmost respect uh, in spite of a few rough edges. So I certainly hope you won't let those rough edges get in the way of a program that is doing so much good for people who have so little. Thanks. Thank you. Is there any other member of the public who'd like to speak to us on this item? Step forward. Uh, I met Brent, Brent during the Occupy here in Santa Cruz, and I think Brent has shown what an activist can do when they're really willing to walk their talk. And if anybody in this community has walked their talk about providing assistance, especially on cold nights to keep people alive and warm, it's Brent. Um, I, I just also want to say that I have heard over the years from many volunteers, I would say for sure two, but I, I can remember two, but my memory is starting to fail a little bit. As I get older, I, I notice that I don't remember things as well, but I, I've heard many people tell me who have been involved that it's really well run. Uh, one woman went in the middle of the night, her name's Jane, she lives here up in like the Walnut area right above uh, downtown there. Um, 
so I've heard from many people testimony uh, that it helps. And then I found out the other night that there's actually sleeping mats there, um, that people aren't forced to just sit or stand while they drink coffee for like eight hours or six hours, whatever it is, but they're actually able to lay down. And so I just wanted to add that um, my favorite sociologist is Pierre Bourdieu. He recommends a kind of guerrilla sociology where you really go out there and find out what's going on. And uh, since I'm not always interested in doing a lot of academic work, that was kind of friendly to me. And it was my, uh, my clientele, if you will, when I was a recreation therapist who essent essentially became a lot of the homeless population, very mentally ill people. And I know a lot of these people who are still really needing just a warm place to survive. And what seems like a small amount of money can make a huge difference if you'll approve it. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Marv Lewis, a longtime resident of Santa Cruz. Um, on um, Monday, Tuesday morning, the 4th of February, I received an email from Brent Adams uh, requesting volunteers for the warming center. And I'd never been to the warming center before, but I decided to volunteer. And uh, I took a shift from 12 to 3 a.m. on Wednesday morning, the 4th of February. Um, by 3 a.m., it was 31 degrees in Santa Cruz. There were 50 people inside the Red Church, approximately. There was soup, there was coffee, there was tea. There was mats for everyone that wanted to sleep. There were restroom facilities. The room was divided for women <clears throat> and men. It was well organized. The staff tended to any issues with the people that were living there for that one evening. And most notably, it's important to say that when it's 31 degrees outside, that's the kind of cold that if you don't have any kind of warm garments on or shelter, it's the kind of cold that you very well may not wake up from if you go to sleep in the night in Santa Cruz. And I can say with certainty that Brent Adams, because of his effort, he saved 50 people in the city of Santa Cruz on the evening of February 3rd going into February 4th. And that's just for one night. From a cost metric point of view, let's take a look at that. That's $15,000 divided by 50. That's $300 per person. And that's just for one night. So we can imagine that number would go down considerably over 10 nights. That would be $30 per person for just one site. That is a pittance to save the lives of the people who need shelter desperately in the city of Santa Cruz. Thank you. Next speaker. I got to first thank Brent Adams just for being here. And uh, what I got to say about the warming program, this saves lives. You know, and the only problem I have is I've had people come up to me, ask to use a cell phone so we could call 211 and figure out where a warming center was that night. And uh, the it, it has to get really, really cold before it opens up. And the my only criticism of the warming center is that they don't open it when it's just a little bit warmer, like five degrees more than, than what it is right now. But uh, this program is, the city needs to give it every dollar they can because it's all money well spent and it saves lives. Thank you. Thank you. Any other member of the public? Okay. Is there any other member of the public who'd like to speak to us on this item aside from the gentleman who's approaching the podium? Okay, you'll be our last speaker. Good afternoon, Scott Graham. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I would encourage you to uh, give this money to the warming center it's an absolute necessity that, you know, <clears throat> they're meeting a need that is not being met <coughs> through the uh, $1.2 million program that exists. And I'm sure if they showed up and wanted a 10% adjustment to their uh, budget, you guys would rubber stamp that with no, hardly a question. You're gonna give this guy $15,000 and it's like, oh, we're gonna have to rake them over the coals before we give them the money. Um, 
Yeah, I, I just think that, you know, it's beyond belief that we can't do more for the people that are out there suffering in the cold. And this uh, organization run by Brent is a way to actually do something instead of just talking about it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'll bring it back to council um, for, I know that many council members express having questions for Brent, so I think this would be a good time if you have questions for him to ask them. And then in addition to that, we will um, move forward with action and deliberation. Um, so are there any council members who have questions for Mr. Adams at this time? You have any? Council, Vice Mayor Myers. So I, I'm, I'm just making sure that I, just for Brent's sake, um, and Brent, thank you. I went and visited yesterday with, uh, with uh, Brent yesterday at the warming center. Um, I just wanted to understand um, when you have uh, an <coughs> evening event, a night event. So I'm imagining that along with materials and other things that you would just bill out the, that event that night. I'm just trying to understand if you're doing services, I think, I think according to the contract that we have, I just want to make sure we're understanding so you can get paid and, and that those services can be provided. So I'm just, I'm just kind of in the weeds here. I don't really, but I, I wasn't really able to get the, the answer out of the staff. So just want to make sure that when you hold an event, you're going to basically bill it out based on the staff time and other materials that we're not breaking it down per night. Uh, we did that in initially in the beginning, um, but it doesn't uh, it doesn't uh, come, uh, take into consideration all the other costs of preparation uh, that are. So what we're doing is staff. I ha hired a person, materials purchase, um, uh, helping with our shuttle, uh, which is quite expensive and it's not really showing up in in this uh, uh, administrative component, outreach, uh, storage. Uh, and, and then, so the two different uh, materials that we're talking about are affirming our, uh, that we have uh, the, the right amount of bedding and storage for that and cleaning for all of that. <coughs> and then stuff that we hand out on the daily that we've never really uh, budgeted. So uh, it's not gonna be a breakdown per each time. It's just those are the elements that, we, w that we're needing uh, um, to affirm b uh, a stronger program. Right now, we, we're already extremely uh, uh, ready to do what we're doing, but we don't have the ability without hiring the second person to open up a, a backup space. Uh, we don't have, and so it's kind of like affirming our, 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 our basic system that we can, because there's no winter shelter, there's no emergency shelter at all, drop-in shelter. So we become the backup. So, so that's what we we're really trying to cast. And the original conversation was, how come we're not having these conversations with the city, county, Red Cross, I'm sorry, uh, Salvation Army, that, that we had years past? How come we're not having conversations about, uh, uh, anyway, so and it was really just the motion was, I need $10,000 to affirm that. 5,000 more was uh, recommended by Drew Glover, and it's actually needed. You know, it's in truth, quite a bit more would help us, but uh, we're just trying to be bare bones and trying to, again, prove ourselves as good city partners, as a good program within the city that you can look to us and not feel prickly that we're, we're just doing amazing things for almost no money. It's almost all volunteer, uh, 25 people per night with just currently one paid staff uh, and now additionally two paid staff. Uh, so that's what it'll be. And if you want a cost breakdown per night, we could do that, but I think it, it'll look a little, it might look a little ridiculous in that regard in my opinion. Cheers. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Are there other questions? Council Member Brown. Well, um, I guess I'm, it's a comment that I'm gonna turn into a question. Uh, so I, I just wanna say, I've, you know, I've talked with many nonprofits in our community that are, have experienced the challenges of <coughs> moving from the system that we previously had as a city and also at the county of funding community programs um, into this core uh, funding model. Um, because while we want to ensure that we have um, data and that we are we are providing service, we are a we are actually getting um, the service. I guess getting the services that we um, say, you know say we're funding that are actually ha occurring. Um, there's a real challenge though with demonstrating that. I mean, how do you uh, you know develop these kind of homogenized metrics that? all of these nonprofits have to fit into. And, and I know that that's what we've asked 
you to do in some respects. And, and I think there's a good reason for it. We're asking all the other nonprofits to do that. But, you know, I think that the point about as few bureaucratic hurdles as possible is important for us to think about when we are asking, um, or we are, we are making a minor contribution for a service that provides so much um, benefit into, you know, public benefit, benefit to the most marginalized people in our community. So I, I struggle with um, what I'm about to ask <laughs> because I don't know that it's necessarily, um, uh, you know, it's, it's not necessary for me to understand the value that this program provides. But I do uh, wonder, uh, Mr. Adams, if you, might be able to give us, not, not here tonight, but um, at some point, I think it would be worth trying to figure out what it costs per night. Not the direct costs, but the, you know, when you, when you figure out what it costs to run up this program over the course of a year with an average number of nights um, that you're gonna be open, what, what the actual cost is, because I think we should know that. And because it, we will see that it is a fraction of what the per night cost is for any other program that is provided in this county, either public or privately um, operated um, and beyond. So I, th I think that if, if you'd be willing to kind of maybe there's somebody who could help work, help you kind of work through that, I think it would be useful to see. And um, I would also ask if um, we could maybe um, in, in terms of the reporting on this, um, I do share the um, concern about, you know, your ability to demonstrate that what if there are no more cold nights in between now and, you know, it, we're, it's, you know, it's pretty warm out there. <laughs> it may be winter's over. We don't know how many more nights it will be. And so I worry that if we suggest, if we leave it that we're going to fund you, like each night is an event. Um, that you will not, like, you will not meet the fifteen thousand dollar threshold. Um, so I'm just trying to figure out a way to make sure that um, we recognize that these are the services being provided. There are some metrics by which we can understand <coughs> what services we're getting, um, but that we it, it, it's not really necessarily going to correlate exactly with what you do between like every night between today and. June 30th of this year. So I'm just trying to figure out like amongst us if how, what level we're comfortable with um, because I'm comfortable with um, proceeding with the contract and then just requesting that your the documentation um, provide, you know, doc documentation of service provide some additional detail for us. Um, so, and I have a few suggestions about what that might be, but I wanted to ask you if your thoughts on how you might be able to help us better understand the service and what it costs. So whether we open again, um, we're already doing the work tonight. Uh, again, I'll, I'll reiterate, there's no winter shelter. Uh, the Salvation Army uh, year-round shelter uh, has put out dozens of people who've broken the rules. Maybe you heard that they're trying to get those people camping outside the post office up to the armory, but they can't get them up there because they're all blackballed from the Salvation Army. Uh, over the years, many people have been blackballed because of behavior, this and that or the other. So we, uh, and, and, and then we're focusing in our new current shelter program on the most well-behaved, robust person, not the most vulnerable person. We put a priority on physical mobility and mental health challenges. That's what we, one thing we want you to affirm, uh, that the industry, that the uh, shelter system has to put a priority on these people because it accidentally, inadvertently, unintentionally puts the lowest priority on these people. That's why they're outside tonight. That's why we're kind of the only pardon me, organization that makes sure that they have blankets, that gives them a phone number to call, 2461234, uh, that, that they have a place to go get blankets. So um, if you see our storage room with, with all the donation materials, it's packed quite full. Then I have a, sh a, a, a box truck filled with backup stuff. So, and what we're gonna do quite soon is rain everything on the community, not just phone-based or people accessing our space or the warming center, because we don't wanna be hoarding the rest of the the coats, we have a, a huge stock of this stuff, but it's been quite costly and not part of our normal budget. These are things that I've like learned to do without being paid to take care of in community uh, that, because we're just under the radar. So hand warmers, 
by uh, somewhere between five hundred thousand dollars worth of hand warmers are flowing out on a nightly basis. Tonight it feels Sunday sunny. It's going to be below forty five degrees forecast tonight. It's still for somebody over fifty degrees can easily get hypothermia tonight. Um, so it, we're still in winter conditions without a winter emergency shelter. So it's the warming center that's kind of undergirding this community, making sure people have a phone call, they know where to get a blanket. Uh, we have two hundred fifty people on our shelves tonight so all of those people know and, and their friends know how to access this so we're kind of like the secret program working uh, uh, on the streets to, to help people and it's not it's not in the halls of government it's not part of the funding regimes so um, so even if we don't open another night we're already able to expend those funds appropriately without any like weird uh, you know pork bailing or it doesn't go to me. Personally, I'm not getting any of this money. There's no, there's no, nothing for my personal salary, salary coming out of fifteen thousand dollars. If I could just follow up, so I and, and I, I totally get that. I my intention was not to suggest I, that I, um, there's any, you know, uh, anything uh, that the funds would be misused. I think, you know, you've demonstrated that the way the funds are used is the way fund for the greatest need. So it, it's more about. Um, Given the um, interest in uh, uh, public sector, let's just say, I'll leave it there, um, in kind of moving towards having these kinds of metrics and yeah. um, providing ways to demonstrate, you know, what, what you really can't, I mean, the qualitative nature of, you know, the experience and what, you know, how many volunteers and what people do, it's very hard to kind of fit that into the boxes that we ask sure. you to check. But I'm, I'm just, because I know that that's a concern, I'm just trying to figure out if there's some ways we can um, reflect that in the, at least in the reporting for this year, especially if we want to kind of move towards funding, additional funding for next year, we would like to do that before you know, the if, winter's if, over. if I may, so having relationships like this only benefits a nonprofits like this. We, when we're tight, really <coughs> small and doing everything for for the money that we can raise at a fundraising dinner, there's no responsibility on us to 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 have you know better reporting. When we have grants like we do relationship with Kaiser Permanente and. Ka Community Foundation. Now we have to do regular reporting, so it it, it, it encourages us to measure up and be a more professional uh, entity in terms of bookkeeping. This is the first year we hack or the we've had a had a bookkeeper for the last year, um, uh, you know, and using a, a, a program that helps separate out the different programs that we're doing. Uh, and then yes, uh, it, much more easy to, to quantify, you know, what we spent for warming center specifically, including workers comp and, you know, insurance for a shuttle van, which is quite expensive and uh, different things like that. So th th great, that's great. And so if we, if that could sort of be part of the reporting, assuming we can get to- That would um, be- The motion. <laughs> essentially end of year reporting or something like that. Okay. So. If Councilmember Matthews and Watkins, and then myself. Um, well, I did want to get to the reporting thing because in your proposal, you say, and it's part of this two-page proposal, end of season reporting, the warming center program will submit a progress report affirming specific use of funding as well as data pertaining to shelter activation, number of guests, et cetera, which is I think exactly what we've been talking about here. Um, the warming center activation period ends in early April 2020. This report will be submitted within 30 days after the conclusion of our activation period. Now, I'm gathering that you don't really intend to end your program. Where'd you go? There. <laughs> in April 2020. That's just a couple months away. Well, it's the warming center program activation phase that is based on temperature forecasts. Uh, we will still have, we have blankets year round for every single person. We have all the coats. Um, we'll be storing materials through the spring and summer. Um, if it's, re if you're asking that this funding, for instance, the staff that I'm hiring this season that I've hired is already em employed now and has helped us with uh, two activation phases, <laughs> considering this funding um, won't go into next year, uh, the uh, 2021 funding, uh, a warming center cycle. I believe our fiscal year ends in June. It's June 31st, so it's a short fiscal Maybe year. Maybe I'm not understanding. The, the, the so grant would be um, 
within our given fiscal year, which okay. ends in, in June 31st. And it's also my understanding that this can't be retroactive for expenses already incurred. Okay. So, um, but I, I think it's important because this was originally brought to us as strictly the warming center program, and I understand there are many other aspects to that program. Um, it's certainly obvious the votes are here, but I think it is important that we get, um, and I, I didn't realize you had grants from Kaiser and Community Foundation, and you're already apparently doing reporting to them. Yes. So um, there is some kind of a mechanism set up. So um, whoever's gonna make the motion, I think it is important that we um, be very clear on what we expect this grant to cover, contract grant, um, what the end period <coughs> is, and it does say in the contract um, that um, invoices for the fiscal year, and Tony, maybe you can advise me on this, says all, all invoices for the preceding fiscal year must be submitted by May 31st, but that would be for like the previous fiscal year. Um, I just, I wanna give, and it's, it's for Brent's benefit as well as ours, what are the expectations for reporting and invoicing and so forth? I, I, I can't speak to the expectations for reporting and Maybe. invoicing, but there might be another staff person that's available okay. to do that. Um, this is based on the template that the city uses for most of its um, grants to, to nonprofit. Mm -hmm to nonprofits, and so um, we could modify this language to take into account this specific mm -hmm. circumstance to the extent the council mm -hmm. um, thinks that might be necessary. I, I, I have some language that I was just toying with um, during the discussion that I could roll out. Well, anyway, for whoever's gonna make the motion, to me that would be important. Some degree of specificity, specificity and about, um, uh, services to be provided, some provision for reporting that would include some some rough data and uh, a timeline. Cynthia? Yes. Um, so this initially was for what was t termed initially expansion. So it's not for regular services in the warming center even. These are for elements that we are pay began paying for before the break and that we have the conversation if it shouldn't be retroactively. But uh, the, the, the warming center season began in uh, mid-November. Uh, and so we've been looking at that ever since the first vote. This is the fourth, fourth vote on this, by the way. Um, so I've had to kind of like, you know, drag, drag this along uh, uh, and then go, okay, at some point, I'm just gonna start, start uh, 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 understanding that this is going to happen and I have to get ready for these conditions should they occur. Uh, so we've been ready for these condi conditions. And so these will be budgetary amounts that would be specifically about expansion, hiring this individual, um, uh, materials pertaining to uh, uh, expanding nights, uh, numbers more than we would <coughs> normally do, uh, materials, and then uh, the whole donation circus and things like that. But so it, let me just affirm, I believe it'll be quite easy for me to uh, uh, report these by the, the time, um, and they won't be normal warming center elements. They won't have anything to do with the other uh, uh, storage showers and laundry pro programs that we're doing. Uh, and I think it should be pretty cut and dry. Um, but this thing that you mentioned, nothing proactive, nothing, purcha nothing purchased, uh, can they show things that were purchased prior to this vote? That's what, because that's, that's kind of a, a bit of the, of the budget. That was, anyway, I don't want to occupy more time. Um, move on to Council Member Watkins, and then I have some comments, and then Council Member Brown. Okay. Um, let's see. So I, I think Council Member Matthews covered some of the questions that I had as well in terms of the retroactive piece. Um, I guess my, maybe it's just more of a comment in terms of the process here. I think that's where we're kind of getting stuck a little bit and knowing that there was this immediate need to try to have something in place and to use the services, but it's really outside of the scope of our general funding processes. And so I think that's where I, I sort of struggle to reconcile 
this because then now we have this limited time frame. And, and so I think moving forward, even if we do do an interim funding, that we want to keep it in mind of our holistic kind of approach to how we're addressing uh, services and the continuum of services for um, those experiencing homelessness in our community. And whether that be a conversation with the two by two and whatever that um, partnership with the county or the the, um, the COC or, or whoever is, is monitoring that, that we're kind of keeping that bigger perspective in mind moving forward, but also acknowledging that we have this immediate need right now, which I, if without saying what I think Councilmember Brown at the time was bringing up was we want to help this immediate need right now. Um, so I think that's where we're a little bit, that's where I'm feeling that we're a little bit stuck in terms of how that works for just the sort of outside of the scope of our processes. You know what I mean? So those would just be my brief comments on it. I had some comments I wanted to make too. And one, I wanted to start by Brent appreciating the service that you provide to the community um, and what you're able to do on such a small budget. Um, one of the things that's really difficult is given the fact that the city doesn't have any kind of warming center option and the, that this is our only option in terms of a warming center, it makes it really difficult um, because we don't have any other we don't have any other options in, in town currently. Um, it seems like the other services that we do offer are full and this is something that really is beneficial, especially on these really cold nights um, when temperatures drop to points where people can die of hypothermia. Um, one thing, and I don't know, I'll, I'll just say this, and I don't know if this is for um, you know, city staff consideration or whether, um, and then just Brent, you know, um, for you to maybe take into account. One of the things that uh, I think is really important um, when we consider getting contracts from um, nonprofits within the community, especially when they lay out a budget, is to have some kind of narrative that follows along with it. So we can kind of understand clearly when you say um, materials that there's a breakdown maybe of a paragraph of, you know, in order to run these services, we need to purchase um, bedding, um, we need to purchase blankets, you know, and those things are all laid out at, that cost X amount per blanket or we get them in bulk 500 for X amount of price. I think it would have been really helpful um, understanding that within the context of how this has been laid out. Um, so like for example, with, you know, shuttle van expenses, it's an administrative, it's like $1,500, you know, does that cover gas, insurance, repairs, um, people who are driving? I think those kinds of things are really beneficial for us when we're trying to understand, okay, here's how this is all breaking down and here's where all these costs are. Um, I'd also like to say in, um, and just, you know, to be transparent, I think that when um, the city council is asking for um, proposals and contracts. It's an opportunity for us to really understand your scope of work, where the cost at. I don't think that it should be interpreted that if the council is asking for a contract that that's a guarantee that we're going to allocate funding towards that effort. I think it's an opportunity for us to better understand what is the work that you're doing, what are your needs, seeing those needs laid out in the form of a table with a budget so that we can understand if we're going to decide to donate funds what those funds are going towards. So I just say that because um, it sounds like there that you know there's there may have been an assumption that because we were entertaining this that there's a definite end to us donating that and as a result some spending occurred um, before we've even you know considered this. And while I think there is you know um, th there is an, an interest in moving this forward, I just say that because it would be bad if you were in a position where you spend money that you thought you were going to get and then you didn't get it. And I think that's for any <coughs> nonprofit within our community. Um, and so those are the main comments I had. And then also, as was expressed by Councilmember Matthews, I think that, you know, for whoever is going to be the maker of the motion, um, really understanding what this is going to cover, what how the reporting is going to be is really beneficial um, because I think that one, it will help the community understand how the funding was spent, and two, I think it's beneficial for the warming center because should the warming center want to request more funding in the future, it's a way of demonstrating here's what we spent money on in the past, and moving forward, we'd like to ask for this amount given what we've spent in the in previous years. And so I would just like to say that. The last comment I, th I would like to make is that I think that for um, the council members who brought this forward, I appreciate it. I do think though that if we're ever gonna consider something like this moving forward, that it be done 
like in September or October, so that when we are making decisions on funding allocations, it's at the beginning of winter or before winter so that we can give these funds at the appropriate time rather than in such a short window. So that's it. Those are all the comments I wanted to make. Councilmember Brown, Glover, and I saw Councilmember Matthews hand. Yes, okay. And then the city manager. I don't know if you want to comment first. Uh, either way, I just wanted to simply just to comment on the, your uh, suggestion about uh, getting the process earlier. Earlier, I, I agree with that. I think, if at all possible, it would be would make sense to incorporate it into the budget process or yeah. actually our community programs mm -hmm. process. That really is the the approach is also mm -hmm. the set aside process, and you know this really fits in within that. And so to incorporate it into our existing process that then aligns with the budget process, so that you know by, for example, if we're looking at next year's winter shelter program, the council would make that decision by June 30th, and then it would be well before the winter season. Typically, that would be my suggestion. So I think that whoever the maker of the motion ends up being, that if that can be incorporated, that we, if we're going to consider any additional funding for. Um, warming center or homeless programs that it come with our budget cycle. I think that would be appropriate. So, um, Council Member Brown. <coughs> um, yeah. So I, I guess I have, I do have a couple of comments. I, mean, I want to remind my colleagues that the original motion for this was was made November twenty sixth. So um, to suggest that this, I mean, it, that was late, but if we're talking about, I mean, and I agree that maybe that, that the funding cycle should really coincide with our annual, you know, our budget cycle, but we're four months later now. And so, it, you know, we, it, it's not like we um, are just now thinking about this. And part of the reason that it came when it did was because, um, you know, we had been told that there would be sufficient uh, winter shelter, and there wasn't. That became clear. And so I think that the circumstances under which this arose um, were um, partic particular, unique, and that we, we need to recognize that. So, you know, talking about how it could have, should have, would have done it is not really, um, I think, productive. So I'm, I just have to say that. Um, secondly, I do have a question related to the... Um, the end of the term of the contract, because that is a challenge. If we cannot fund something that a retroactive expense, um, and we're specifically intending to um, fund particular functions at the warming center, um, can, how, how does that work? If can we fund retroactively? If we cannot, can we extend the contract period? I don't. I, I'm not aware that it would have to end on. June thirtieth. Right. That, that funding, you know, we generally with core like with core, with community programs, we give the money and then at the end of the contract period we get told, you know, we get the report. Right. Uh, I mean typically what we do is, you know, we have a contract for service and then the services are provided and we get invoices and billing for the services provided. You know, typically it's not uh, set up in such a way to reimburse for expenses already provided. That's our typical way now. Uh, I don't know whether legally uh, uh, there's a there's an issue there. I think that's just general generally our contracting approach uh, with uh, any contract that we let uh, with the city. Uh, with social service providers, there's a contract. They're giving their funding. They have the fiscal year to spend the money, uh, and then they do the reporting. So that's the, normally the way we do it. But uh, whether the council has uh, the ability to make an exception to that, that's really more of a, a legal question, and I would defer to Tony uh, on that. But again, as far as process is concerned and the way we normally do contracting, we don't normally do that. I understand that. So I'm... I'm assuming that if um, it's contemplated that the service will be extended past June 30th, that when the fiscal year 2021 budget is presented, that will be incorporated into the budget. So I don't, I don't think there's a contractual obligation to mm. the service continuing past June 30th. Or con um, Great. The, the, the comment about providing compensation for services that have already been rendered is based on a provision of the California Constitution, which says a local government body may not grant extra compensation or extra allowance to a public officer, public employee, or contractor after service has been rendered or a contract has been entered into and performed in whole or in part, <coughs> or pay a claim under an agreement made without authority of law. So. 
um, that to me, uh, regardless of whether or not there might have been some hope or expectation that a contract might be entered into, um, is, is an obstacle to paying for shelter services that were provided in the past. I'd like to make a motion then. Okay. Um, so I would move that we authorize the city manager to enter into a contract in a form approved by the city attorney with the warming center with the uh, period, the contract period um, amended from it's, this is, uh, I don't know what page number it isn't for you guys, but it's the end of the contract. Um, two, three, no, this is, anyway, it's the last page, uh, um, number four, this contract shall be effective the 11th day of February, 2020 and shall terminate on, um, June 30th isn't, we're not gonna have time to, you won't be able to spend the money. Is, is that, if we're asking, if we're saying it's only for the right. coldest nights of the. What you can do then is consider funding for next fiscal year as part of the budget process. So by June 30th, you would make a decision about the next winter, sh winter okay. season. So I'll leave the contract then. Um, and um, so uh, enter I, into the I, contract. I, yep, go ahead. I do have. Um, just trying to I do have a suggestion to, to yeah, address so the to retroactive compensation issue. We which, cannot do that is what I Right, mean. and I have some language to suggest how we might address that in the contract itself, which would be Great. an amendment to paragraph C, uh, if you bear with me for a second. I was just gonna change the term, but. Um, Roman is... numeral one C, submit an invoice request. Okay. And it would read, submit an invoice request on a city approved form for payment for the insert expenditures made on or after the effective date of this agreement, comma, with su appropriate supporting documentation, period. And then it would go on uh, to delete year's grant award and then uh, continue with funds must be expended and I would insert exclusively for those expense categories listed in exhibit A. And then. Um, exclusively for the categories? For those expense categories listed in exhibit A, which were um, uh, salaries and, or, or, yeah, there, there is a box with a listing of expenditures. Yeah, 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 I know. Budget box. Funds for which invoices are not submitted. Um, Prior to this date, well, I, mean, I was struggling with the requirement to submit invoices no later than May 31st of the fiscal year. Do we have to? I, I guess that would that would be appropriate insofar as um, well, we could we could modify that language if the council wants the contract to extend past the 30th. So submit an invoice request on a city approved form for payments for, for, um, expenditures, for, payment made, for on expenditures made <coughs> on or after the effective date of this agreement with, apporting, with appropriate supporting documentation. Okay. It looks like a management analyst has yeah, I was just um, ahead, briefly please. discussing the situation with our finance director and should there be um, funds um, in this uh, program account when this contract ends, it is possible to roll them over to the next year. Mm -hmm. So that might solve a lot of this discussion. Okay. So I'd like to ask the maker of the motion if you can please restate your motion. Sure. All right. So. Um, the motion would be to authorize the city manager to enter into a contract in the form approved by the city attorney with the warming center. With the amending the contract language in section one, paragraph C. 
as follows. Submit an invoice request on a city approved form for payment for expenditures made on or after the effective date of this agreement. Funds must be exclusively expended, no, exclusively used for the expense categories listed in Exhibit A, scope of work. <clears throat> Invoice for funds awarded by this contract. And this is where, okay, so, um, Invoice for funds awarded by this contract that fall within a fiscal year must be submitted no later than May 31st of the fiscal year. Funds for which, and then following, funds with, for which invoices are not submitted prior to the state will be deemed forfeited by grantee and will therefore be immediately re reprogrammed in the sole discretion of the city. Is this the place to suggest rolling over? So here, rather than saying, will be deemed, for, so delete, will be deemed forfeited by grantee and therefore immediately reprogrammed, um, will be um, considered for- Will be carried forward, be carried to, forward the next fiscal year. to the next fiscal year. Second, is that, is that the end? That work for you? It's, that's just the, so we also have to do the budget <laughs> adjustment. So that's the first no. part of the motion. Can I? Councilman Matthews. Like, oh, well. I'm, I'm wading into so, the finance. Uh, yeah. I think I think the only here. piece, the, the only question I have is, yes, we can encumber funds and roll them over, and we do that when there are projects that aren't completed. Typically, the way that works is if it's a construction project, for example, and for some reason it's going to take longer than the end of the fiscal year to complete, then we can encumber them and roll them over in anticipation of that project being completed. Um, but that's, you know, for paying for that particular project. So I think that's certainly the case uh, that that can happen if it's anticipated that this, again, it depends on what you're paying for. You're paying for this winter season, and for some reason winter season doesn't, goes beyond June. <laughs> uh, otherwise, you know, you would normally then budget for next winter season as part of the budget process. So you would, you, we would need some kind of approval to do it. So there's a the fiscal side of it and then there's the approval side of it. And so <coughs> that's where I'm sort of confused. Are you, are you uh, wanting us to, we can encumber the funds, uh, I guess I should be clear. We can encumber the funds, but we would need to know that you approve rolling those over and you're approving the program for next winter as well. Just to, we just would need clarity on that. And that's a part I wasn't clear. Would that be included in the contract here or? Well, then, then you would have to, we would have to amend the contract to extend the period of the contract as well. Uh, I guess that's, that's, that's the other piece. Because again, normally, the, the normal process would be to, uh, for this fiscal year, it would be to provide a contract for this fiscal year with funding for this fiscal year. And then for next winter season to approve it as part of next year's budget process. And then you'd have a new contract, new funding. Mm -hmm. That's the normal process. Uh, Again, what the funds, the rollover piece there is part of our normal agreements because what normally happens with community programs providers is they're given the money, they're given a year to spend it. Uh, if they don't spend it, then it goes back into the pot mm -hmm. uh, for then reallocation for next year and they could then get it again. <coughs> That's the normal process. So this would be an exception to that process. Again, we don't generally do that. I don't know of a case where we've done that. Um, so it's just a bit unusual. We do have this encumbrance encumber process again, but it's generally for, usually it's for contracts or construction projects or things like that. So, I'm not, I'll just wait, it's my turn. No, I guess, I think that the motion is still, the, it hasn't been, I don't think it's been finished yet, so I don't know if you'd like to. Um, Council Member Matthews is one. I, to I have on. some more suggested language. Well, I do too, we just, try, we got a conundrum to work through here. Um, and we are now in, um, approaching springtime. So um, one thing to do would be uh, the original proposal was for 10,000, bring it back to 10,000, take it through June 31st. And at that point we get a whole new cycle, et cetera. So, and we will have had some reporting. So I'm just throwing out that as a cleaner proposal. I had just to go back to the order, I had Council Member Glovers, Matthews, Vice Mayor Myers, and Council Member Watkins. So just Thanks. to honor that. Uh, so just uh, 
for clarity question over here to the city manager and the city attorney. Um, I know what you just mentioned of our normal funding plan is that we grant the money, they spend it, submit invoices, it gets paid back out to them, and then if they don't use all of it, it just goes back. Is there some stipulation that we can't just give the money to the organization um, with expected reporting kind of parameters that would come back at the end of the, either the, whether it be the fiscal year or whatnot, or, and this gets back to what the suggestion by Councilmember Matthews, why wouldn't we just approve the $15,000 and see what needs to happen? Because I mean, there's, as uh, Mr. Adams said, there's warming hand things that are handed out, blankets, socks, you know, if you look at this, the items that they hand out daily, and I believe this is associated with the warming center, this document you gave us, right, not with the footbridge or any of the other programs, is that every day they're handing out warmers, ponchos, tarps, blankets, coats, jackets, socks, 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 clothing, hygiene products, sleeping pads. So uh, what's to say, and now Mr. Adams said that he had made previous uh, purchases ahead of this because of necessity, I believe. I don't think it was, I mean, this is me kind of based off of what you were saying and understanding the work that you do is that it was because of the necessity in order to be able to offer the space and to uh, potentially anticipate the need to expand should you hit many nights in a row or reaching your capacity. So whether or not it's paying for retroactive services, I would imagine that the organization itself could use and figure out ways according to the sheet here and what they're working with, could use that $15,000 or any portion of it up until the end of the funding period. So I, I don't think I am remiss or I am concerned about the suggestion to subtract money from the uh, amount that we're giving to this organization, even if it's only for a um, short period of time for them to be able to uh, purchase the items that they need in order for their distribution and or in the worst case scenario where it's incredibly cold and they need to expand, have that um, money there available for them to expand because none of us can see three weeks into the future with the weather and maybe there's a cold stint that hits us where they have to be open for five days in a row because of torrential rains that we don't see because of climate change. So either if we can't give them all the money at once and ask for reporting afterwards to hold them accountable for what they say they're gonna do, which would then influence our future budgeting or grant writing cycles, then why don't, I mean, uh, we should move forward with the 15,000. Uh, we should enter into the agreement and whether we want to extend it, and this is the conversation gets back to the language changes or whether we wanna just check in at the end of the fiscal year and see how much money has been spent by the warming center, hear the reporting that they have and then re-enter into the next funding period with the anticipation based off of their estimates of their need from what they were able to spend in the time that they have had to, to use the money. I mean, it's, I mean, so all of that and it amazes me how long this is taking. It's amazing how much intricate detail y'all want to make it so that we can provide people with warm services when we spend tons of more money on other things at the drop of a hat. It, 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 it is impacting me by this conversation that we can't say, okay, and especially with, since, since so the argument that it's in the wrong time frame, I mean, that is absurd. Thank you, Councilmember Brown, for bringing up the timeline around this because it did come to us back in November. And shouldn't all of these things have been worked out between now or then and now, anticipating that it was gonna be coming back right now, anticipating there was gonna be that short of a timeline to spend it? Why are we deliberating on the dais when we have other issues to focus on when it could have been staff that has foresaw this and then provided it to us as options and solutions outside of us trying to craft the language here amongst all of us. It, it, it blows my mind and I think it speaks volumes to the lack of urgency and intention that we as a body have shown on addressing the issue of homelessness, whether it be falsely claiming that we have winter services, which then r delayed us till right now to be able to offer this kind of stuff, which is very problematic in my opinion, uh, or the the seemingly high stand like incredibly high almost impossibly high standard that we're trying to hold Mr. Adams and the warming center to in order to be able to provide them funding to to be able to keep moving services forward so um I'd like for us to move on this and stop with all of this back and forth and 
uh, get back to Councilman Brown's motion, which I thought was done, which is why I said second, uh, but maybe that's the first half. <laughs> I wasn't done. <laughs> um, and, and just move forward because this is, in my opinion, rather r ridiculous and inappropriate. So we have Councilmember Matthews, Vice Mayor Myers, Councilmember Watkins, Councilmember Brown. I would also like to point out that um, we are pretty far over yeah. on this item, right. and so um, I'd like to ask my fellow council members if they would want to consider moving <clears throat> the next item, which is our mid-year update to 7.30 p.m. That would give people, because I imagine that we're going to still be deliberating on this for a little bit, and so we could either move the item until um, after public comment or oral communications, or we could uh, continue through. Um, but I just want to put that I question. I the question on this one. I, think it's oh, I haven't finished it's the motion. Incomplete. Yeah. 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 So. If I, I want to I work on your motion. So y you move motion to authorize the city manager to enter into contract form approved by the city attorney with the warming center. And I would like to add that the contract specify the services to be provided, because I think that's been a bit of a m moving target, um, that um, it reflect metrics for collection of data, that it request monthly reports, and specify the term of the contract. That, you know, I'm, this is a discussion. So, I can go over it with you. Well, there's other people on the staff, so. Okay, so um, the so you're asking that it come back, specify no, the terms no. of the contract, or do, so if we want to specify the terms of the contract, then we just specify them, and I think that's what we were trying to get through with C was just to submit to do make, do the wording, <coughs> uh, make those changes that um, the funds will. Either, so there are two ways to do it, as far as I can tell. We can make the contract period be until the end of this year, rather than the fiscal year, mm -hmm. or we can make it be the end of the fiscal year and then say any additional funds will be rolled over. Uh, dealer's choice, I, I don't, whatever seems like it makes the most sense. To, to, cl the staff. to clarify, yes, you, you, you can I, do both, you can, you can, make the contract for this winter seat, for the remainder of this winter season, uh, and then make a decision about next winter season as part of your budget process, which uh, I understood you wanted to try to incorporate it into the regular budget <coughs> process, right? And that's why I suggested that. Uh, however, you also have the ability to, if you like, to uh, provide a contract term that covers next fiscal year, and then the, the funds can be encumbered uh, moving forward. So that is, uh, council has discretion to do that as far as I understand. I have some language for your consideration. So we're squared away on the first part of the paragraph. So the last part would, um, the last sentence would, would read, funds for which invoices are not submitted prior to this date, and then insert, may be carried forward to the 2020 fiscal year subject to council appropriation as part of its FY 2021 budget process. There's a request to repeat. Funds for which invoices are not submitted prior to this date, which is May um, 31st, may be carried forward to the 2020 fiscal year subject to council appropriation as part of its FY 2020, uh, 2021 budget process. So that would work. I, you know, again, I, I don't really have a real strong feelings about it. I mean, the other, we could also make those other changes, delete funds for which invoices are not submitted, um, delete that sentence entirely and make the contract period 11th day of um, last page number four. Um, the 11th day of February, 2020 and shall terminate on December 31st, 2020. And so that's takes that would take care of the contract, and then the so B 
would be a resolution to amend the fiscal year 2020 budget that it keeps it cleaner if we just extend the contract period because it's in our budget for this fiscal year delivered and we don't have to change the resolution and C request monthly reporting with information regarding um, uh, services provided and I think did you have a list that you well and in, in this I'm just saying what the proposal says it will do is um, um, affirming specific use of funding as well as data pertaining to shelter activation number of guests etc and the etc is other stuff that's included and then um, so that would include uh, the reporting and the metrics for data collection and then specifying the end of the contract. I think we've done that. Proposal. Carrying over. At a minimum. So has that in front of the amendment been accepted or in those yes. changes? Seconded? Did the motion get finished after I said second? Because that, that there was a whole bunch more. So, yeah, the motion was the authorize the amended contract mm -hmm. with the with the language that we've come up with. With the assistance of our staff, um, a resolution to amend the fiscal year 2020 budget and appropriate general fund budget of $15,000 and C, request that the warming center provide monthly reporting of regarding services provided. Can I just say as per the scope of work or do we want to lay that? That's fine. As per the scope of work. Exhibit A. Yeah. Yes, second and accepted. Right. Okay. So, motion was made by Councilmember Brown, <coughs> seconded by Councilmember Glover. There was a friendly amendment made by Councilmember Matthews that were accepted by both the seconder of the motion and the maker of the motion. We still have um, Vice Mayor Myers. I just say one thing really quickly for the minutes. The friendly amendment was related to the reporting. Well, it should be included in the language yeah. of the motion. Yeah. Have the motion. Okay. The motion is to authorize the city manager to enter into a contract in a form approved as amended with the uh, including a amended language. Can you just you want us to read it again to have it now, or can Tony send it to I you? I can. I can read it. Okay. Fairly quickly. Okay. So. Yeah, she's got to go. Gotta type it. Mo I'll, so the, then I'll then I'll email it. Okay. And that will. If Let I, me just maybe I could just ask for clarification just so I. So the contract will be ending at the end of this fiscal year, July June thirty. Is that correct? So we're okay, we're extending the contract. This fine. calendar year. Right, through the end of the calendar year. And so the funds would be uh, would be obligated through there, but we would have to, and Martine, this is a question for you, um, we would have to re-encumber this money at the start of the budget? Uh, I mean, at the start of the fiscal year as part of our budget proceedings? It sounds like what the motion included was that that would be, uh, uh, the council would make that decision during the budget process, is, is, as I understand. That's how I interpreted it. The, the motion was. I mean, made. I'll just state for the record. I mean, I really think somehow, somehow this should become part of our community mm -hmm. grants program, mm -hmm. and so I, I mean, I'm conflicted because I, I want to um, support the need, but I'm, I'm, a little frustrated that we can't just provide up to a certain point the funding and then go through the community grants project mm -hmm. to kind of start from scratch. So that's what I'm struggling with. And um, I just think it's cleaner. I think it actually, <laughs> if I'm looking at it from Brent's perspective, it's actually better to have all of this lining up so that we can, you know, it's an annual renewal or an annual proposal that we then kind of can see as part of the, the group. So, but I understand what you're doing too, Council Member Brown. Um, I, we're in an imperfect situation, so I understand. Um, but I'll, I'll just, those were the comments. That was just the main comment I had, was just seeing if we could just 
define the amount, stop, you know, stop the contract and then go into the community grants project. So, so I had um, Councilmember Watkins on deck and then Councilmember Brown. So did you still want to have? Yeah, I, yeah actually yeah. I have a friendly amendment that for um, fiscal year 2021 that we transition this contract to align with our set aside funding allocation and core funding or other existing city processes to safety net services just to, to bring us into systematic alignment. So that's a friendly amendment to the motion. So that would be D on the motion. Mm -hmm. We're gonna, our friendly amendment. Part D, organized here. Sure, yes. Is that accepted? Okay, so we had a I, friendly amendment made by Councilmember Watkins. Sorry. I'll just, I'll just finish this. And then I actually have another friendly amendment. Oh, okay. I would, I would be curious, I would like to know operational, organizational understanding of the budget as well as what it, like base costs, oh. as well as one-time activation costs. Like, so what it, what's the sustainability of the organization as a whole? And, and if, for example, it is a really cold winter, we know how many, how much it costs to activate the warming center. So I think, however that works into the reporting or contract, I think it's important <coughs> information for us to know and or for the funding process moving forward as it relates to core B. I mean, it, I mean, it could be a, it could be a friendly amendment to have that be incorporated into this, or, um, this contract and or as a recommendation moving forward as it rolls into the next iteration for the fiscal year's um, budgeting process. However, the maker of the motion feels comfortable. But one way or another, it'd be, it'd be helpful information. I I don't, I don't. When it's my turn. So I'd, yeah, I would just, yeah. for for recording purposes, can you restate that? Sure. And as a friendly amendment. How you want it. Yeah. You have an idea? Okay, yes. Councilman. Um, and I thought of the same thing. It's something we require of all our community programs applications, many of which are in this ballpark, so it's not unusually burdensome, but just that the applicant um, provide a copy of their agent, their total agency budget, so we know where this fits into the other fundings. Is that's, right. that's what you're getting at. Okay. And if, if well, that, that their agency oh, they, budget so would reflect have that. that. That's right. Yeah. So if I'm hearing correctly for the purposes of recording, that the friendly amendment is to have the organization provide a copy of their agency budget. Agency, agency budget. budget. The organization. Total organizational, budget. <laughs> total organizational budget. No problem. Yeah. yeah. That's, what you, that's right. That'd be helpful. Was that friendly amendment accepted? <coughs> yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yes. Yep. Friendly amendment made by Councilmember Watkins, <laughs> accepted by Councilmember Glover and Councilmember Brown. Okay. Um, we still had um, Council Member Brown and Council Member Matthews on stack for comments. So would you, do you still have any further comments? My comment, at least on this round, was to suggest that, um, like other community programs, that the Warming Center provide a copy of its agency, agency budget. Matthews, do you have any further comments? Nope. Okay. Does anybody have any further comments? Seeing none, we'll take a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Okay, so at this point, I'm gonna ask um, my fellow council members whether they would like to move forward with our next item or if we should take a break and then hear the um, mid-year update after oral communications. I personally would just say, go, go for it. Yeah. Me too. Yep. All right. It seems like there's consensus to move forward with our mid-year update. I just also want to let um, council members know that um, oral communication, since oral communication stop is at seven, that if we haven't made it all the way through, then we'll need to stop at that time. Okay. Let's make it all the way through. Great. All right. So <laughs> next on our council agenda is item number 21, general business. Um, we're going to start the presentations off with the fiscal year 2020 budget adjustments and information on city's financial status and that presentation will be done by Tracy Cole, our principal management analyst. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so I'm gonna do a brief introduction here. Okay. So there's a 
Before you are, uh, really there's three components to this uh, even, evening's uh, uh, item. And the first is a just a general update on a mid-year budget picture uh, as far as uh, how we ended the year, what our projections are for the next fiscal year, uh, and then some of the factors and variables that we have to take into consideration with respect to our budget projections. So Cheryl will, be, will do that, she'll do an update, uh, and then council can have an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, then we'll move on to the next items, which are action items. The first uh, is a uh, request for the council to amend our, our personnel complement and classification compensation plans to make some additions to classifications and some changes to classifications. And uh, I, I think, I guess Lisa's gonna be here to do that. Uh, and then there'll be questions from the council and then you can take action on that one. Following that will be a um, brief presentation from staff on the budget adjustments, which are the uh, uh, adjustments that we need to make to the budget that we've had to make up to now for a variety of different reasons and staff will go over those. Uh, and then the council can ask questions uh, and then you can take action on those. So those are the three overall pieces. Well, again, we'll start with Cheryl. We'll give a, a kind of overview of the, of the big picture and then move on to the next two items. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Cheryl Five, Acting uh, Finance Director, and I'd like to introduce um, Lapita Alabos Bisbee. She's uh, now the budget manager in our finance department and uh, has recently joined us. Uh, she has a budget team of Tracy Cole and Jillian uh, Morales as an accountant. So, thank you. Uh, first, uh, this is our start. Just trying to get this. Quick question, Mayor. Can we just get a sense of how long a presentation might take? Might be. It's uh, it's pretty quick. It can go quick. It depends on questions. Okay. So, okay. It's only uh, around 16 slides or so, and they're pretty quick. So, okay. Um, this is the local government finance trends. Uh, basically, the local governments local governments are not in a boom cycle. Pension payments are increasing. Uh, California cities need to move to more safe, stable revenue base. There's recession uncertainty and low reserve levels. Good, we have reserve levels, but they're a little low. We need to build them up a little more. Um, the city budget is stable, but we're being cautious. Uh, the cuts you made for the fiscal year 2020 budget, the $3.9 million in cuts that we did over a three-day process, um, they have put us in a better financial shape. We're cautiously uh, uh, stable at this point. Um, there's no new projects added this year, and we did see service reductions from those cuts. Um, still, we're, uh, the message is we're being careful. Uh, we see uh, with our five-year projection, we're seeing um, slight deficits in fiscal years 21 and 22. We think we can manage those uh, this coming year. Uh, we're seriously, still seriously underfunded in our capital needs and deferred maintenance. Um, we need to move, we need new revenue sources and, or additional funds to address priorities that are coming up. So that's where we stand at this point. Um, I want to bring your attention to the slide here. It's it's a uh, it's a the 2020 slide. If you see in the lower hand right hand corner, there's a 20. 19 adopted budget comparable cities, and you'll see that um, the city of Santa Cruz uh, adopted in fiscal year 19 uh, a balanced budget. And then in fiscal year 2020, we had a little slight surplus. So the city of Santa Cruz continues to adopt balanced budgets, and that's our goal for the next year also. Um, this is the fiscal year 2019 financial report. And uh, at the end of the year, we had a, a, we weren't projecting a surplus, but we did have a slight surplus of 0.9 million. And however, that's not enough to fund the needed capital investments and deferred maintenance. Uh, this is the reality show, the budget makeover. The, again, this is addressing the $3.9 million cuts that you did in fiscal, for fiscal year 2020 budget. And you can see below the, um, the slide under that, is uh, what our projections would have been had we not made those cuts. 
And then we see if the little circle around there, you can see the, in the future years, the revenue is popping just a little above the expenditures and we're pretty neck and neck uh, prior to that. So this reflects the, what I mentioned before that we have deficits in 20, 21 and 22, projected deficits. Okay, now this slide shows general fund deficits. So this kind of quantifies what our deficits are going to be. Uh, if you add them up, they're almost $5 million, but this is what we're going to manage. Um, behind the, the, you can see the expenditure are the bars going up. Behind that is the revenue base. So this is a slide you put a, probably saw uh, in a prior year, but it's been updated to reflect our new projections after, again, after the 3.9 uh, budget cuts, million dollar budget cuts. Okay, included in these projections are a slight decline in sales tax and property tax revenue increases. A better way to say that is we're, um, uh, we're, not, in, we're, not, increase, we're not increasing our revenues. Uh, as fast as they were. So we've uh, we've considered that they won't continue to increase at the same rate. They're gonna, they're, they're gonna cool down a little bit. And uh, it includes all council approved COLAs for all the bargaining agreements. We just did a, a number of uh, renegotiations with the bargaining units. And it includes future increases in uh, our CalPERS rates. And if you've been told that our CalPERS rates continue to climb, we've incorporated that into this projection. And then future decreases in debt service payments. And again, that's um, the major one would be the pension obligation bonds, which is uh, final payment is in fiscal year 2022. And that runs around $3 million or so a year. What we still need, uh, we need support for aging, the aging infrastructure. Uh, you can see we need the roof for the civic auditorium. Uh, we need, uh, you know, repairs, revetment repairs to West Cliff, and we need um, storm drain replacements. These are some of the things that are on our unfunded CI, uh, capital investment program list uh, that we don't have the funding for, so we still need that funding. This is a CalPERS pension update, and basically on the right, you'll see some of the um, things that CalPERS is doing that's causing a problem and why we're having increasing rates. And um, um, their total assets, uh, although they're in the billions of dollars, only represent 71% of what they calculate their future uh, benefits will uh, to public workers are. And um, they're projecting an uh, in investment rate of 7% per year, but they're only, co they're coming short of by about 6.7. I mean, they're coming short and only meeting about 6.7. And then um, again, it's their, their, their fiscal projections are falling short. So on the left-hand side though, you'll see some of the things that the city has done to mitigate these problems with CalPERS. And one of them is establishing the IRS section 115 trust. And currently we have over $10 million in that trust. Uh, we've done agreements with the employee bargaining units for them to pick up the share of the employer cost. And, uh, and we've also uh, uh, paid at $8 million toward our unfunded liability saving, um, uh, lowering that unfunded liability. And uh, we also, which isn't on there on this chart, on this uh, slide, but we also, um, uh, we prepay our unfunded liability each year and that saves us several hundred thousand dollars of interest and um, we're able to do that and it helps with uh, our with uh, the, our actuary reports where we show our unfunded liability. Okay, has the recession been canceled? Uh, basically, everybody's waiting for the recession because we've gone longer than we've ever gone in history in a recession period, in a, um, uh, recovery period, and so everybody thinks that, okay, when's the shoe gonna drop? When are we gonna have the recession? And basically, um, the Chris Thornburg, who recently gave a, a, a presentation on the, uh, on econo on the um, economy of the uh, country, said that we're kind of in a not too hot, not too cold. We're in a Goldilocks uh, era right here, uh, basically, Nothing's moving very fast. It's just kind of, just kind of 
stagnant and uh, not stagnant, not too, you know, it's okay. So their fears are that where, what's gonna happen, what's gonna cause us to go into recession. Basically right now we're at low interest rates, low unemployment and low inflation, and we've got a stable expansion. What may cause us to go in is not the wind, it's the why. And it could be reactive global impacts, and there's a quote from the Wall Street Journal concerning the, the, uh, Kona, Kona, the, the virus in China, and then climate change might do that. But every, every agency is saying it's the next unforeseen event. And of course, unforeseen means we don't know what it is, but it'll put a shock to the system. Right now, there's, they're not seeing anything like that. So probably won't have a recession in 20, 2021, but yeah, we don't know what the unforeseen event would be. Okay, uh, Lapita's gonna talk about our 2021 budget plan. We're going okay. into next year's budget. Great, thank you, Cheryl. Good evening, um, Mayor Cummings, council members. So as we just heard in, um, on Cheryl's presentation, given our economic and fiscal uh, conditions, the direction we'll be moving this fiscal year is a status quo budget. Um, we'll be seeing an increase in um, the budget reflecting employee costs, uh, but we will maintain a status quo um, as it relates to operations. Um, there are no anticipated budget reductions asked of departments at this point. Um, and the budget process this fiscal year will be different from the last two uh, or so fiscal years where, we're, uh, where we plan for extra meetings to discuss budget reductions. This year, uh, departments will be presenting their budgets to council over two planned um, budget hearings scheduled in May. Um, we'll also take advantage of those public hearings to invite the public for engagement. Um, and also different this year, our, uh, we're separating our public hearings for operating and CIP budgets. Uh, the council will first hear the CIP budget in early May, followed by the operating uh, budget in mid-May. So separate public hearings will hopefully help focus discussion and allow more time for each uh, of the two processes. Um, so that concludes um, our fiscal year update and budget plan um, before we go on to the next section. Are there any questions? I had one question. Um, I know recently um, it had been stated, there was a, a court case that found that Amazon is now gonna have to pay local tax. And so I was wondering if the, any analyses had been done yet to determine how much um, sales tax revenue might be generated from Amazon purchases and sales locally or how that might you know fit into um, how much revenue we're gonna get from those types of sales taxes. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, Marcus had done uh, an analysis of that early on and it seemed that we wouldn't fare much better, we might fare a little worse from that, from that. So, but we could do an analysis and see currently what would happen, you know, what, where we would be. Thank you. Are there any other questions from council members at this time? Okay. Seeing none, we can move ahead with the next portion okay. of the presentation. Um, Next up is uh, Lisa Murphy with yeah. that. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. I'm Lisa Murphy, your Human Resources Director. What I'm actually passing out to you is an updated version of what you see up on the PowerPoint slide. I, I neglected to include a position on this table, which I'll go over with you in just a moment. So what you have before you is uh, each year, we, we consolidate it to twice a year. If operational needs um, dictate that the departments want to make any adjustments or changes in their uh, the number of staffing or reorging of their staff, we do it either at the mid-year or we will do it at the budget time. So what you have before you is some recommendations from each of the departments of some mid-year changes and I'll just list each one, give you a brief description, and give you the fiscal impact. So the first one you have up, and again, I'll point out the correction in the table. The first one you have on your, um, before you is for water, and what they are adding is a principal planner and an associate planner, and then they're going to delete a professional engineer. <coughs> the details of the each explanation, if you were would like me to go through it, is uh, in your agenda report. And for the sake of time, I'll just, ha if you ask me questions, I'll respond to those. 
for public works, uh, given the new uh, requirements that they have for uh, food waste recovery and the number of recovery resources that they have to conduct at the landfill, what they're asking for, one is they're gonna do a bit of a reorg within their department, and then they're going to add uh, four positions. And I should note, all four of those are actually um, SEIU positions, and, or except for, sorry, three, and one is a supervisor. And then in economic development, they're adding a half-time economic development coordinator. You will see in the communications manager, the city manager is adding a communications manager. In addition, they are removing the special events coordinator from the city manager's office, and they are placed in the parks and rec, so that's what you see there. And again, the last one is uh, in the police department, what we're going to do is create a, a career ladder for the uh, police property and evidence specialists. So now we'll have a senior. And once we fill that from an internal ranks, then we'll come to you at the budget and we'll remove the, uh, the position. So it'll be net neutral uh, for the PD. The overall uh, economic impact <coughs> is identified in the fiscal impact, and you'll see the majority of it actually is in the enterprise funds, while there is a very, very slight savings in the general fund. And partly that's due to the uh, restructuring of the funding of some of the positions in particular, such as the community, um, communications manager. Uh, we're spreading that costing out amongst the department. So as I said, there's a slight neg negligible uh, in savings in the uh, general fund, but the uh, majority of the cost is by the enterprise funds. So having said that, I recommend approval. And uh, if you have any questions, please ask. I do, and this is so embarrassing. So <coughs> on the water, on the chart that you gave us, you add two and you take away one. Oh. So that to me would be a net one. I'm sorry. I'm adding two, but I'm, I, so you are right. I'm embarrassed. My math is this late in the evening was a little bit off. So we are adding the two positions, taking away one, so it is one. I, I, was, I was worried I couldn't do that. The, the only other one that I left off of your chart because there's no change, it's just a title change for one of the positions, but there's no economic impact for that. Resource recovery. Why am I? Are they on? I, I have to tell you, I rushed to put this together and I'm failing to see. Will you, show, will you just point it out because I see one, 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 one. Yeah, there are two. Um, the su there are two supervisors in resource recovery, um, supervisor and supervisor, and the others. There's no added positions. To, to those. I identified it as SEIU. Is that correct? Is that what you're saying? That's incorrect. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's two. The numbers are correct. That's the supervisory position. I apologize. Vice okay. Mayor Myers had a question. Yeah, I just wanted to just clarify when you say. Um, Enterprise funds, so just so everyone's clear that may be watching. So water and public works, those are all enterprise, those would be the enterprise fund That's positions? Correct. Yeah, it's a solid waste fund and the water fund. Okay, thank you. To be more specific, it's the water fund, the wastewater fund, the refuse fund, the parking fund, the stormwater fund, uh, which are enterprise funded. Okay, thank you. It's with respect to the, like the communications manager, we're spreading it amongst all the funds. So that's mm -hmm. all getting divided up, even Correct. into enterprise fund uh, Correct. departments. Correct. Okay, thank you. So will you want a motion on this I, now? Do we, we have, have one more? I don't think so. Okay. Uh, we'll Not do it yet. at the end. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. And Councilmember uh, Brown had a question. Yeah, this, <coughs> I know this is a budget item, but it raised the question for me if um, we, we could hear a little bit more about the timeline for hiring a communications manager. What's the plan? Yes, yeah, so if uh, council approved the position today, we would begin uh, the recruitment process uh, as soon as possible. Um, and uh, we, we, do, we did have in the process of putting together the uh, recommendations that came to you beforehand, uh, the opportunity to put together a job description. Uh, and so we have a lot of the work done uh, so we'll just be working with uh, the HR department to, to get the recruitment process going. So that's, it's pretty close to done what was included in our packet, the job yes. description? Yes. I have one question, this is for the city manager. I know that there's been, this was expressed last year during the budget, but my understanding is that there's a, like a river restoration specialist position, I think that's with the water department. 
Potentially, I just wanted to know river if there's a river coordinator position. I'm just wondering if there's been any traction on yes, that, that happening. Yes, that is in the, it's in the existing budget. Um, and uh, trying to see if, uh, uh, I know it's something that uh, the departments uh, are working on, really trying to define the scope. Uh, what happened with that position, it was originally funded uh, and it was allocated to different funds. We had a deficit, so then we allocated it to the water department. And the honest truth is that it's been difficult to sort of scope out the work just in the water fund, because you know the realization is that the work of this position involves a variety of different funds, not just the water fund. So the staff has been going through uh, really trying to figure out what is the best way to uh, scope the position and, and allocate it. So we are uh, in, in, going into an effort to reach out to, because I know we have uh, stakeholders like the Coastal Watershed Council and others who are interested in uh, the work of, of, of this position. And so we are initiating an effort to get all that input and come back to you with the revisions of that position so it can actually reflect the work rather than trying to sort of shoehorn a position that's funded for a certain fund and, that, and it's not working out to just make it realistic. And so we'll bring that back to you. And I can't recall what the timeline for that is, but certainly with respect to the current, the next fiscal year budget, we'll, we'll do that. Thank you. Are there any other questions from council members at this time? Yeah, I just about to no. could maybe explain the hundred thousand dollars of uh, fuel costs. Well, that'll oh, be coming we're, next. We're about to do that next. Yeah, that's next. Yeah. So we'll move on to the next portion of the presentation. Okay. The so I'll, <laughs> I'll cover this part um, as well. So, uh, as is routine, uh, each mid-year we bring back for council approval any administrative um, or cleanup uh, budget changes or requests additional appropriations in response to unanticipated needs. Um, the table before you summarizes those changes and requests. Um, the f and I'll try to go through this uh, pretty quickly since they're they're uh, pretty articulated in the staff report. The first is the only impact to the general fund. It's a one-time request of 75,000 uh, for the Poganip uh, lead remediation assessment. Um, the second row is really just a transfer of funds from the carbon reduction fund to various projects um, expensed in the general fund. And some examples um, listed were um, a new hydration station at Loch Loman, LED um, upgrades to the teen center, and electric conversion of gas landscaping equipment. Just just to name a few. The next line item, um, Public Works is requesting 100,000 to cover unanticipated costs to operate generators at various city facilities resulting from the two-day PG&E power shutoffs. Um, so, Council Member Crone, I hope that addresses your question. Um, and then the next item includes a transfer of the liability fund to the wharf fund in the amount of 100,000 um, for the wharf railing safety improvement project. Um, the next item is the transfer of money within the wastewater fund in the amount of 85,000 to support uh, the transport and provide um, reuse of biosolids. And then finally, um, the water fund has a list of requests totaling about 4.2 million um, outlined in the staff report. Um, included in the list is a new appropriate, or examples are uh, new appropriations for unanticipated repairs to the Newell Creek Pipeline, uh, change order on design work for projects starting construction in 2021, um, along with other emergency needs, um, just to name a few. And again, the only, um, this last one is, is uh, redu redundant uh, and reflecting just the, the liability fund um, supporting the wharf railing project. Um, so the only fiscal impact to the general fund that we bring forward for um, council approval is the 75,000 requested for um, lead remediation. Um, so that concludes our presentation for mid-year um, adjustments and we're happy to answer questions. Are there any questions for staff at this time? Councilmember Crum. Yeah, about the, uh, the 100,000. Um, so just running generators for, is there anything about how do, can we get that money back from PG&E? Um, have I've seen other people, you know, other communities sue PG&E for losses during the shutoffs? This isn't really on the recovery part of it. This is on paying the bills for the extra fuel. So um, we'll proceed um, if there is any exposure that we can obtain, but that will take quite a while. 
Um, I, I don't know the details on that. I know we are tracking it, but I don't know that, I don't know if finance or anything is working on that, to be honest with you, but I'll check on that. I mean, it's, it's something we had to keep the lights on and keep things working, so unanticipated. Great, thank you. Okay, are there any further questions? This, this is so trivial, but on the staff report, uh, the 4,000 for hydration occurs twice. Uh, part of that, it's it's an award from the Carbon Reduction Fund to the Water Fund, so the appropriations have to be in both places. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I see. I see the way it carried over there. I, I didn't see yeah. that. Okay. <clears throat> Councilmember Glover, Councilmember Crone. Just uh, this kind of harkens back to our last topic with regards to the amount of money that we spend on so many different things. I just find it interesting that the $10,000 that we're gonna spend on a deli case replacement at the Civic Auditorium, it's just it's interesting. Just thought I'd point that out. Councilmember Crone. Um, I wanted to point out the 13,000 a month, that's just in salary, not benefits for a communications manager. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think the city communicates well for the council, hasn't done well in the last couple of years, at least in my case. And I would like to, to push that as, uh, out of the main motion and maybe vote on that separately because I, I will not support a communications manager. I think it's um, not a good investment. And um, again, I would urge folks consider taking that money, it's probably about $150,000 and having stipends for council members and they can um, hire people to communicate for them and not have, I think the city's done abysmal in, in communicating in case of uh, Councilmember Glover and myself and a couple of different press releases um, haven't worked. Any further questions for staff? Saying. You want a motion? I was gonna open up for public comment. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. all right. Um, if there's no further questions at this point in time, I'd like to open it up for public comment. Is there any member of the public who would like to address us on our mid-year budget update and any of the items that were presented. Okay, you'll have two minutes. Uh, hello, council. Uh, just an overview. First, I wanna say, Cynthia, that just because it's a conspiracy theory doesn't mean it's not true. We all know that as grown-ups in the political world, that's a standard political, powerful technique. So I would really appreciate if you would stop countering everything I say when I get up. If you have to really disagree, that's fine, but just don't on principle counter everything I'd say. I think that would be respectful. The second thing I want to say is uh, I did not see the presentation. I'm sorry, I don't know your name. That Cheryl Fife. What was that? Cheryl Fife. Cheryl presented in the binder. I would like to see everything that's presented up there duplicated in the binder. So the 16 slides weren't there. And the reason I'm questioning that is uh, many experts on the economy actually think we're in a horrible recession already. And it is not being pre uh, really fairly presented by our mainstream media, nor most of the power brokers who are in power in the Democratic and Republican parties in the mainstream. So I think we're having a horrible recession and many people are not making livable incomes in the country. So I think that needs to be investigated. The other thing I wanna say is that the city of Santa Cruz housing program specialist, um, that's, I think it's a for hire uh, role in government, is, is one that I'm really questioning because we're still not defining what is affordable housing. My understanding of affordable housing is that you have to have a really excellent income, as in six-figure income, over $100,000. Uh, so you have to be working in a really high-level paid position to be able to afford affordable housing in Santa Cruz. And most of the units that are going in that are so-called market rate are actually luxury. We are now living in a luxurious elite wealthy enclave that has been highly gentrified by moving many middle in, many middle and low income people out of the community and or onto the street. 
So I'm very concerned about the, this position, but I'm running out of time, so I can't say more. But I think we need to examine these positions, and this one reports, reports to the principal planner. That's a problem when the planning commission is all developer-friendly, wealthy people. I wanna recommend the Solar Economy, which is a book that was written in 2002 by Herman Shear, and I'm out of time, so I'll stop there. I would like the Downtown Forward Program investigated because I think they're using city funds and they're supposed to have an alternate argument you. presented if Thank they're you. presented to the public in the library and they're not. So please investigate that. I wanna know if there's- Elise, you've gone over your time. Thank you. Okay, next. Hi, I'm Nate Alex Kennedy at Gmail, 3469888. I would like to talk to all the council members here in private at some point, so please get back to me and let me know if you need that email again. Um, with the budget here, uh, something that came to mind, I'm not sure how 100% appropriate this is, but we should sh switch as many of the county cars as possible over to electric or even lacking that hybrid at least. Um, it will bring fuel costs down a lot. Yes, I would love to see a, uh, a cop cr cruiser car that was all electric, stuff like that. An ambulance that's all electric, city vehicles, we need to try and get them all converted to something that is zero emission, no tailpipe. Thank you. Thank you. All right, is there any other member of the public who would wish to address us on this item? Seeing none, I'll bring it back for action deliberation. Councilmember yeah. Matthews. Thank you. I'll go ahead and move to approve the mid year position changes and also approve the mid year budget adjustments as presented. I'll second that. And I, I just want to say I really enjoyed the uh, rationale for each of the changes. I mean, it was really clear as people retire or the needs of the different departments evolve, and particularly in the um, public works and water, the um, just increasing expectations um, uh, for uh, regulation, for recycling and so forth. I thought the, the write-ups why things had to shift around or be added really made sense to what, what the um, departments are facing in all of them. So um, I thought it was a well-written report. Thank you. So we have a motion made by Councilmember Matthews seconded by Vice Mayor Myers to approve the mid-year position changes and approve the mid-year budget adjustments. Councilmember Glover, I saw your hand. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I, I share the concern that was uh, voiced by Councilmember Crone about the communications manager and the costs associated with that. There is an estimated uh, salary of $9,717 per month up to $13,152 per month. That is an exorbitant amount of money to pay to someone to manage the communications. I don't, I don't even believe we need a full-time communications manager, maybe a half-time communications manager, uh, and reallocate that money somewhere else because at that top step of that position, that's in one month paying for basically all of the money we just argued over to get to the warming center to support people from freezing to death outside. So this gets back to something I said on the campaign trail, which is a budget is a moral document. And we are making our moral statements by how we're allocating this money. And if you would rather spend $13,000 a month for some communications manager, as opposed to figuring out ways that we can offer that to supportive services of people that are gonna die if we don't provide them and have failed to provide them throughout the winter, it speaks volumes to the issues of the priorities of the city. Uh, I think that's con concerning. And I, I just want to acknowledge one of the speakers uh, saying that she felt that her perspective was constantly disregarded and or belittled by members of the body. And there's a term for that, it's called gaslighting. And gaslighting is a form of psychological manipulation in which a person or a group covertly sows seeds of doubt in a target individual, making them question their own memory, perception, or judgment, often invoking in them cognitive dissonance or other changes such as low self-esteem, using denial, misdirection, contradiction, and misinformation. Gaslighting involves attempts to destabilize the victim and delegitimize the victim's belief. So just, it's concerning that there's members of the public that feel that way, and I don't think we should spend $13,000 a month on a communications manager. 
background? Just so we can make this, given, given the time, um, could we just separate that, uh, the maker of the motion, could sure. we separate out the communications sure. manager? Yep. And I'm then I'm, I'm fine with everything else. Yeah. So there's a friendly amendment made by council member Crone. We'll, we'll just divide the question. Yeah. So yeah. we're gonna divide the question as it pertains to the position, position changes by pulling out the um, communications manager. Can I just get further clarification? For the mid-year budget adjustment, there was not a resolution brought forward for that. The only resolution brought forward were for the mid-year position changes. Right? There, there was a... It would be a resolution to approve the mid-year position changes, Dick. motion to approve the mid-year budget adjustment. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's okay. as, as I understood it, as is what I So, um, I guess we can take the first section of this, which is all the other positions, with the exception of the um, communications manager, and to approve the mid-year budget adjustments. Is there any further discussion on those items? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? So that passes unanimously, and then I will return to vote on the position of the communications manager. So Let's call for the vote. Yeah, so I'll call for the vote on that. Um, so the motion currently is or to approve the communications manager position. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Okay. So that passes with council members Watkins, Matthews, Vice Mayor Myers, and myself voting in favor. Uh, council member Glover, Crone, and Brown voting against. Okay. And so that completes and concludes this item on our agenda. And so we will recess until oral communications, which shall begin on around 7 p.m. Thank you. That's very nice. All right, good evening everyone and welcome to our 705 session of the Santa Cruz City Council. Uh, at this time we will have um, oral communications. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the public to address us on items that were not on our City Council agenda today. Um, oral communications will be for a half an hour and given that we're starting a little bit late, um, we'll extend oral communications to 735. And before we begin, I'd just like to welcome uh, the students from Cypress Charter Middle School for being here with us today. Yay. Okay, so if... Um, <clears throat> Can I take roll really quick? Oh yeah, and I'd like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Right. Council members Watkins, here, <coughs> Matthews, here, Brown, he's here, Glover, here. Crone? Here. Vice Mayor Myers? Here. And Mayor Cummings? Here. Sorry. Okay. Uh, we'll begin uh, oral communication. So if any member of the public would like to step forward, um, you'll have two minutes. Nope, just in order of where you are in line. And if any member of the public would like to speak to us, I'd like to ask you that you please line up to my left. So my name is Freya Sands. Thank you for your service. Um, and thank you for your attention to this letter, which will be coming around. It's about 111 Eret Circle, which you've heard about before. Thank you for your attention. My only further comment beyond the letter is that if it is unfair to the owners to designate 111 Eret Circle historic two plus years after the sale, then it is truly unfair to the neighbors and the citizens of the city to not have examined the wealth of this 130 year old property long before the sale. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Next speaker. Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. <laughs> Um, hi, my name is Sue Powell. Um, I live at World Circle on the west side of Santa Cruz. Um, and I am here to support um, the appeal um, 
of the recent Historic Preservation Commission decision about the historic and cultural significance of the Circle Church at 111 Errett Circle. As you know, at their meeting on January 30th, commissioners decided to recommend that the site not be listed on the city's historic building survey or as a city landmark. Neighbors of the Circle Church submitted an appeal yesterday and wrote a letter communicating their concerns about the meeting and the decision. So there are five points I'd like to highlight. I know I'm not gonna get through the details of each. Number one is that neighbors and friends of the Circle Church think that the second developer paid historic report and the peer review were very superficial and inadequate. In our view, commissioners did not address the problems with the reports and did not consider the age of the building, the history of the site going back to the 1880s, the decades of the church benevolent services to the community, its ties to the neighboring Baptist church, and the site's role in neighborhood integrity as a community gathering place, an open space, and a commons. Number two, in my view, the historic report uses affluent values and criteria which are not the values of the Circle's neighborhood. Um, this church was designed and built by one of the congregation, not a nationally known architect. It was constructed with less expensive materials. And this is what the uh, developer paid consultant used a cri as a criteria in deciding that the uh, place was not historic. I'm gonna have to skip um, to four, and that's that Ross Gibson was asked by the chair of the HBC to recuse himself. And I would like to ask the city council to request that the city attorney determine if that request was actually correct, because we don't think it was. And um, I only have eight seconds, so please um, read what I submitted, and thank you for listening. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Deborah Elston, and I'm coming to you in hopes that you will address another investigation that finished in December regarding council member <coughs> Drew Glover, once again violating the respectful workplace policy. This report was brought to my attention a couple weeks ago, and I had heard nothing about it in the media or otherwise. I felt the public should know, so I posted it on next door and closed the discussion. People I have spoken to were completely unaware of this report and wanted to know more. I'm asking you, our council, how come this has not been agendized for discussion or consideration? How is the city council once again going to handle this severe and egregious behavior? Those are the lawyer's words, not mine. Sadly, the public is getting very tired of hearing about these episodes, so please hold your council member accountable for his actions and words. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker. <clears throat> Good evening, Mayor and City Council. My name is Heather Waltz. I work in public education. I am a parent and I am a concerned community member. I am here tonight because I have read both the investigation report by Tim Davis and the UCSC Democrat statement about their experience with Council Member Drew Glover regarding his behaviors towards women and his demeaning of both women and men. Uh, Mr. Davis stated that Drew Glover unequivocally violated the respectful workplace policy and that he engaged in conduct on social media with a willful and con conscious disregard of the feelings, rights, or safety of two city commissioners. Mr. Davis states that Glover's behavior can be perceived by a reasonable person as derogatory, insulting, bullying, humiliating, sabotaging, slanderous, malicious, and retaliatory. Those were his words. What more can be said before you hold Glover accountable and address him for these behaviors? When the Rose Report findings were discussed in October, council voted that only one incident <coughs> did not justify censure, but now there are two independent investigations, both finding violations of the respectful workplace conduct rules. The second investigation and unambiguous findings, as well as what happened at UCSC, all make it clear that this is definitely a pattern of behavior for Glover. Unless you feel this is acceptable behavior, you must make the statement clear. It isn't. I'm asking you to agendize the discussion of the Davis report so this can be made public and discussed by the council. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hi, my name is Nancy Stewart. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, I'm here this evening because I've read the findings from a recent respectful workplace violation investigation completed by attorney Tim Davis. In his letters, Mr. Davis stated that Mr. Glover's behavior can be perceived by a reasonable person to be derogatory, insulting, bullying, humiliating, sabotaging, slanderous, malicious, and retaliatory. At the October 8th, 2019 council meeting, a motion was made by council member Brown and seconded by then Vice Mayor Cummings that stated the council finds that censuring of two of its members is inadequate based on the findings of the Rose Report as it relates to the appropriate policy. A single act shall not constitute disrespectful conduct, especially severe and egregious, unless, excuse me, unless especially severe and egregious. In October, Mr. Glover's behavior towards a city staff member was so egregious that the city manager directed all staff, other than the city manager and department directors, to no longer communicate directly with the councilman. In November, formal complaints were filed against Mr. Glover <coughs> by former members of the Commission for Prevention of Violence Against Women, which resulted in Mr. Davis's investigation. And most recently, the UCSD Dem Democratic Club chose to endorse the recall of Councilmember Glover based on his rude and disrespectful behavior towards their members and others in the community. These are all examples of behavior of, or a pattern of behavior that should not be tolerated by you as leaders of this community or by the citizens of the city of Santa Cruz. Mr. Davis's response to the complaints was submitted to the city two months ago, and yet there has been no action taken by the city council. I'm here tonight to ask you to agendize this most recent report and the violations by council member Glover and to hold him accountable for his behavior. Thank you. Okay. Right. Next speaker. Hello, I'm Nate Alex Kennedy at gmail.com. 3469888. Uh, feel free to call me anytime, councils, members, or public. Uh, but something I do have to say about this whole uh, recall, it's basically the, the, uh, they're trying to get Drew and Chris impeached without a trial and without any charges. They're, you know, the only reason for them being impeached is because there are people that don't like them and every single one of us in this whole room has people that don't like us. So with that said, uh, also uh, something I've been working on lately, the uh, Tom Steyer campaign, and uh, he is the one and only person running for president that wants to call the global warming what it is and it's a national emergency. <coughs> And none of the other people that are running for president right now, um, not even our treasured Bernie, all of the other people just wanna keep going business as usual and pretend that nothing's going on. And what I have to say as far as what we need to do as a city, all the council members and everybody here, what we need to do is we need to start addressing these issues locally. And uh, you know, it, we, we finally got uh, cannabis legalized in this state, but what I think we need to do is we need to get a bunch of industrial grade hemp main, meant for making paper, clothes, and all the other stuff that hemp can be made out of. That is what we need to do, and what I would love to see is have the city itself growing many, many thousands of plants and allowing people not to be limited to an amount like six plants like the initial law has been, but to uh, any open, any dirt that you have, you should be able to plant a seed in it up to a certain point and then tax it appropriately. Thank you. Next speaker. Pat Kittle, Santa Cruz. <clears throat> The last guy talking about global warming is, uh, <laughs> he's just the kind of person who I have in mind. Uh, he no doubt is also for open borders and the rather um, stealthy sanctuary city policy, which uh, according to my understanding, all of you unanimously support. Uh, I brought this up at a recent forum at the Loudon Nelson Center where <coughs> 
Chris and Drew were both present presenting their case and the audience was overwhelmingly in support of them. I explained that uh, I was not in support of them. I think they should be recalled. And I explained it was nothing personal because I think all of you should be recalled, at least until you can explain something that I have asked you to explain for years and you never do. And specifically that is, if you endorse sanctuary cities, you are basically inviting everybody on earth to move here. That's what you're doing. If you think about it, and I'm not, I mean, it's pointless for me talking to the city council, but somebody may be hearing this whose mind is open and is willing to do the math, it's pretty simple. If you invite everybody to move here, this is the most notorious carbon emitting country on earth. How are we gonna reduce global warming if we invite everybody on earth to move here? It's a very simple question. Drew was very courteous in his avoidance of replying to my question. Chris, on the other hand, was rather rude. He told me that I'm, if whatever kind of environmentalist I am, he's not, as though he should be proud of that. Chris, if you recall, I was restoring habitat the day you called me to work in your yard. Thank you very much. Next speaker. Keith uh, McHenry, like the library. Um, I thank you for supporting um, the warming center and for your support of the student strike. We're providing food and logistics also in support of this strike because it's very important because the, the wages here are not livable and the housing is not affordable. And I also want to, uh, after listening to Deborah's comments and her uh, people that she brought in, should be noted that on nextdoor.com, if you speak in favorably about um, homeless women and how they should not be attacked and that they should have access to housing, you get cut off of, removed from nextdoor.com. Um, we, the, the, um, you know, the, no one is really speaking about the um, Chief Math uh, Mills and his turning a blind eye to um, employment discrimination against women and sexual harassment by officers in in our department. Um, but Deborah can be seen walking in and out of the police station many times a day. So uh, it, I think it's quite hypocritical that when people like Drew and Chris are standing up to end violence against women, that they're being falsely accused of, of sexism. And really, with, is it much worse to be raped and murdered on the streets or to be looked uh, like sideways or something, whatever these little things are that are made up by the city manager's office? I don't think so. This is like a smear campaign that you should reject, you should call out. Women should be insulted that they are, that these accusations are being made against Drew when the city sanctions the um, shutting down of Ross Camp and sending women to their death. Thank you. Yeah. Good evening, I'm Scott Graham. Um, there's a real injustice happening here in town and it's, gonna, it's on the ballot and it's the recall. Chris and Drew are being accused of things by the, re, the pro recall group that are patently false. They've made up a bunch of stuff, they've gone marched around town telling people lies to get them to sign the, the recall petitions. They paid out of town uh, signature gatherers to gather signatures because the group that gathers signatures here in this county refused to, to do it for them because they didn't ag agree with the recall. So they had to hire a group from San Jose to do it. And it's just uh, amazing that instead of being forthright with what they were recalling these guys on, which is 
that there's developers, real estate agents, and landlords that didn't like their policy. And that's the whole reason these guys are being recalled. This whole smoke screen about sexual harassment and stuff like that, it didn't happen. It's been made up. But then we have, as just mentioned, the sexual harassment at the police department, which we're only finding out about now. There was a policewoman that wasn't getting backup because she filed a complaint against a superior officer that was eventually fired. She filed a complaint against the guy and nobody would help her. If she was on a call, no one would come and back her up. Back, you know, it, that's outrageous that this is happening. Yep. And I know that Mr. Norris had contacted me before on behalf of Huff and requested four minutes, and so I'll honor that request. Thanks. So silence means more suffering. The Cummings majority at City Council has spent a year of dither and delay on the most basic homeless issues. We saw this kind of pettifogging, pencil neck plotting this afternoon and the delay around the pitiful pittance that uh, given Brent Adams for services the city and its poverty pimp service providers are unwilling to provide. In a city flushed with funding, city employees like Susie O'Hara and her boss, Martine Bernal, are still telling the same tales after a year with the highest homeless death rate yet, you know, that where there's adequate shelter and all that sort of thing. They need to be fired and replaced. Council members who want to get past the stacked agendas of the last years, the phony censure motions, the corrupt recall movement might have moved to, to call for this kind of a vote against the city manager and city attorney, the real powers in the government. Hopefully in or out of office, they will struggle to do this because unless you make these kinds of fundamental reforms, you will get nowhere. We can learn from the example of Oakland's Moms for Housing and the Where Do We Go Berkeley encampment in standing fast against pseudo-progressive hypocrisy with another liberal mayor, Arguin, up there who isn't liberal at all, but has this pseudo-progressive coloring. Last year, as was mentioned a moment ago, the most basic rent control and just eviction protections were shelved, a direct slap in the face, unfortunately, by Mayor Cummings to those who elected him. And we still have no study of w rents, wages, and profits in Santa Cruz, promised last summer. I've written and spoken about Mayor Cummings' cave-in to the Matthews Myers minority in a meeting with him Monday before last. I presented a variety of questions to him, which he has yet to answer clearly, or perhaps he has answered, almost all in the negative, as I remember. Uh, some of these questions are on the back of this flyer, which I won't have time to read, but I'll make available to the community and on social media and on Santa Cruz Indie Media. My advice to people in the general public <coughs> is you need to phrase these questions in public places where you don't have a limitation of two minutes and the uh, pseudo civility rules that are used here. There's nothing wrong with being civil if you're in a position of equal power. But when people are not in a position of equal power, civility means subservience. If you are outraged, ask loudly, and if necessary, uncivilly at public meetings, important questions that are not being answered. What is really uncivil is the way basic human rights and services, basic human dignity, is denied to hundreds of poor people outside and thousands of renters struggling to live in Santa Cruz. And the political games played at this council ignoring these basic decencies. On campus, a loud, angry, persistent, and hopefully successful Cola for All movement stood up today and yesterday to police bullying, administration stonewalling, and city police collusion. They're a tonic, a lesson, an inspiration, and a hope for us all. Yep. Hey, is there any other member of the public who would like to address us during public comment on any item that was not on our agenda today? Hey, Student, students are welcome. Students oh. are welcome to, to speak if they'd like. <laughs> hey. 
Seeing none. Sure. Yeah, I'd like to follow up on uh, the comments we received this evening, and I'd like to make a motion to agendize the um, discussion of the Davis report. I'd like to add to that, uh, receiving an update on the work progress timeline at the Council Ethics Committee, and then also receive a report from the Human Resources Department and City Manager's Office on current anticipated steps for training on res respectful workplace policies, as well as conflict resolution and mediation efforts. I'll second the motion. So we have a motion made by Council Member Myers, seconded by Council Member Watkins. I have a question if I can. Sure. Did you have a date associated with the motion? I'd like to have it on the February 28th meeting. Um, would I'm you, sorry, 25th. It's the 25th. Sorry. Do you read back the motion? A motion to uh, direct the Human Resources Director to bring a report on the Davis uh, investigation. Receive an update on the work pro process and timeline of the Council Ethics Committee. Receive reports from the Human Resources Department and City Manager's Office on current and anticipated steps for training on respectful workplace policies as well as conflict resolution and mediation efforts. Lover? I just asked the Chair to split the motion. Okay. And how would you like the motion to be split? Well, there's three, three sections, so we could split it into those three different requests. Okay. Fine by me. So the first motion would be to bring back a report on. I don't know why we're. I don't know why we're separate. These are all related to the. Sound. I think part of it. Well, you can ask the. And I've been. I mean. We've been, I've been asking, you know, I've been asking for this to be agendized for almost two months. So, so I can, so I can, I can speak to part of this. Trying to, um, as trying to understand how to. Sure. And I can, on the agenda. <laughs> and I can, I can speak to part of this. Um, when this first came to the council's attention, this item um, was, or I'm sorry, actually I'll let the city. Um, I, I think so long as you're talking about what this, what the content of the motion is, it's fine to split the motion if that's the direction of the council but this isn't really an opportunity to debate the merits or get into depth about the, the, the specific uh, components of it okay. because it's not on your agenda. Right, okay, so. And I'll just say, um, I think splitting the motion is. And Can't hear you, Cynthia. Oh, splitting the motion is something that can be done at the chair's discretion. Okay, and I'm fine with splitting the motion. So maybe what we can do is we can read off each part of the motion and vote on each part independently. So if you could um, read off. So the first motion would be to receive a report from the Human Resources <coughs> Director on the December 6, 2019 report from an independent investigator, Timothy Davis, regarding the finding of a violation of the city's respectful workplace conduct policy by Council Member Drew Glover. So I can, just for clarification, it's just to receive a report on the report? Yes, from the HR director. I'm just trying to understand a little bit more too about. Well, I'm just, again, the, the idea was that we would be voting on a number of updates and potential action, but now they're being individually voted on, so. The intent behind the motion is to have the city council understand the investigation and have a public discussion about it and to understand where the ethics committee is in its work, uh, to understand from our city manager and human resources departments what kinds of further training is going on as well as um, our conflict resolution mediation that we agree to as a council and to take any action that the council sees fit to um, to discuss with council member Glover any further actions. So I don't, if we wanna break that apart, we can do that. But they sort of all roll together. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. Okay. Um, I guess one clarification I'd like to know is, is that report, is that an agenda item or is that a report to city council in the form of a memo or I'm just trying to understand. We've received, we've received, we've received the investigation on December 10th. 
It was released publicly on January 17th. We would like, to, I would like to have a, a discussion about the findings of the report. It is a public report. It is now obviously available. People are reading it. I'd like to have the HR director available to go through the findings of the report and be able to have council discussion. That, I was just say for me that that's, that's clear. Okay. okay. Uh, Councilmember Crone, and then I also have a comment to make, which I was gonna send an email out later, but since this is a, before us, then I, I'm more than happy to speak about it this evening. Councilmember Crone. This really smacks of a political ploy, and I, I'm, I'm happy to support this at the first meeting in March, sure. Um, I'll just say. There's a motion on the floor. I, I'm sorry, I, if I may. This feels like we're getting into conversation. The motion is to agendize it for a right, conversation exactly. at the next meeting in February. And just to sort of echo uh, Count Vice Mayor Myers' comments, this is something we've requested to be on the agenda um, just for discussion of updates, et cetera. And we're at this time now requesting it given that the community had came out and spoke to it. Thank you. And in response to that, Go ahead, City Attorney, if you'd like to say. I'll go ahead, I, I don't disagree with what um, Council Member Watkins just said. Okay, I'll just say with, with regards to the vote that um, I'm already, I've already scheduled, as I mentioned, um, and I can't say what I mentioned because it was in closed session, but I've scheduled a meeting with Council Member Glover and with the HR Director, with the City Attorney and the City Manager to address these issues. We're actually meeting on Thursday to discuss this. So um, there is action occurring. Um, I do understand that there's been requests made. I also am um, much more comfortable with bringing this forward at the first meeting in March so that we're able to have a full discussion of um, with Council Member Glover and then bring forward any issues that might come out of that meeting and any um, resolution that might come out of that meeting. So. I'm more than happy with agendizing this for the first meeting in March, but I'm not comfortable with agendizing it for the next meeting, especially because um, it'd be more appropriate to see what's coming forward in a gender review and ensure that there's appropriate timing, so. I'd like to call a question. I, I, I would like to make a substitute motion. Um, I would like question. to make I'll a substitute call motion call call that question. would, yeah, but I'm, I'm, I, I have the floor. We need to vote so, uh, no, you the question vote. has been called by Vice Mayor yeah, Myers. She needs a sec, she needs, she needs a Does second though. It. Second by Council Member Watkins. So there's no more discussion on this item. Can I just get clarification? So was there a friendly amendment to make it the first meeting of March? Yeah. No. no. There was not, accepted. however, the motion has been broken into pieces, right. so. Yeah, so you're so the so the first yeah the, there's a motion to call the question and then after that we'll continue to take these in pieces motion to call the question all those in favor please say aye aye, aye. opposed no. no so the motion to call the question fails uh with C vice mayor myers council member watkins council member matthews voting in favor council members brown glover crone myself voting against calling the question. So, Councilmember Glover. I'd like to make a substitute motion, which would uh, to agendize the discussion of the Davis report in the first meeting in March. I'll second that. So there's a motion made by Councilmember Glover, seconded by the mayor, to agendize the discussion of the Rose report for the first meeting in March. Davis report, my, my apologies. Okay. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. no. Okay, so that moves with so council you member. Don't really want to agendize it. <laughs> you just want it to be no, before the election so you can have a political thing. Yeah. So I'm <laughs> going to halt for the discussion on this. Um, so that passes with council member Glover, council member Crone, council member Brown, and the mayor voting in favor. Um, council members Watkins, Matthews, and Myers voting against. Uh, there are two other motions currently on the floor. And so if we would want to hear those motions be repeated, um, now is the time. There's actually one motion, right? It's just split yeah. three ways. But there's two other components there's of the two original other components. motion. What does that substitute motion cover? The agendizing of the, the report. item? Yeah. So now there's two other motions on the floor, unless the makers of the motion would like to. Um, we already, you, we voted not, on it. We voted on it. You're, we you're, voted on the, we voted on the first motion, which was to agendize the report. We voted there's on two, accepting the substitute. Right, oh, I'm sorry. We voted, we voted on the okay. motion. Apologies. Okay. okay, so now we'll vote on the motion that's on the floor, which is to agendize this before the first meeting in March. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. 
Any opposed? No. I'm for a loss. friendly amendment to that. <clears throat> sure. If we're going to, I mean, I think it, it, it is worth hearing more about what's happening. I mean, the, the one thing that is public here is the Davis report. <clears throat> What is not public, and we ought to be having a public discussion about, I think, is our efforts to um, move forward with conflict resolution, training, et cetera, um, as we directed back last year. So I think it would be nice if we're going to have an agenda item to include more of this. So I would ask people to uh, updates, uh, updates on made. I, I think you need to vote on the yeah. motion that's before you exactly. because this really isn't an opportunity. I, I, I make a friendly <coughs> amendment to the motion. Motion. Yeah. That's I'm confused, if I may, in terms of just the amount of conversation around account has around, gone that has gone from fairly a public far afield comment of public to have it agendized at the right. next meeting. Maybe. So I'm not sure. It seems like a real slippery slope here for me, Tony. In I terms agree. Of how we're heading going. in that direction. So the discussion should be limited to the language of the motion. Which is, and I'm not allowed to make a friendly amendment. I would recommend that you vote it up or down and then make a follow-up motion if necessary. Okay, so if I can, if I can please like bring us back. There is a motion to call the question, which was voted upon. There was a substitute motion made by Councilmember Glover that passed with Councilmember Glover, Crone, mm -hmm. Brown, myself voting in favor, Vice Mayor Myers, Watkins, and Matthews voting against. And so now that motion still needs to be voted on, which is on the floor, which is to agendize um, a discussion about the Davis report for the first meeting in March. And then there was a friendly amendment by Council Member Brown. Point, point of order. I thought we, we you have a motion. You vote, we voted, I thought we voted it. Uh, yeah. We didn't vote on it. Then we have another motion. That's not a substitute motion. That's a motion. I thought. Is that is that wrong? Or I thought it was a substitute. It was motion. a substitute yeah. motion. Yeah. But you called the question. What was that question called about? They, they called the question. Yeah. On we what? voted on that we to to, not to vote. Oh, we voted I'm to sorry. not call the okay. question. Right. Then a substitute motion was made. Mm -hmm. That substitute motion was voted on. So now that motion's on the floor. And then there was a friendly amendment made by Council Member Brown. Okay. So the current motion that's on the floor is to agendize the Davis report for the first meeting in March. Okay. Yeah, and I'd be happy to incorporate the two additional leftover pieces of the initial motion if that language is still available, or we can just vote on this and then Restate motion, those. The motion was split. Okay, so cool. we'll Let's vote on these and the pieces that I'm split good. into. Okay. So motion to uh, agendize the Davis report for the first meeting in March. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. No, sorry. Okay. So that um, moves with council members Glover, Crone, um, member Matthews, Brown, myself voting in favor, um, Vice Mayor Myers, and Councilmember Watkins voting against. No, no I voted favor. for it, but I would like the record to reflect that I only did so so that the item would in fact be agendized for discussion and we were left no other choice by the council majority. And I'll just say for the record that I'm again working with um, Council Member Glover and our city staff to address these issues and follow a process that I was thinking it would be appropriate and was going to planning on bringing this forward as well. So, but now we're going to bring it forward regardless, and so it all works out. Okay, there's two other pieces to this um, item, this motion that were made, and we need to um, resolve those as well. So, the other piece to the motion was to get an update from the human resources director on the progress of the ethics subcommittee. Okay. On February. Apparently, it's going to be in. And training as well, right? And all that. Yes. Yeah. And okay. Yes. And the motion was to do that on the 25th of February. Mm -hmm. I won't be supporting that. I'd like to have all of it happen at one time. Agreed Productive. with Vice Mayor Myers, but I'll be voting no on that. Okay. So. I would like to, uh, 
I'll make the, uh, so for the record, I've been asking since December 10th upon receiving the report to agendize this discussion. I would, rec I would recommend that you vote on the motion that's in front of you. Okay. So I will, we will get an up, uh, so I make a motion to get an update on the work progress and timeline of the council ethics committee, including the development of a code of conduct for council members and a structured process to address workplace misconduct complaints that are not directly accountable to the human resources department, but may require council action, including consequences for, for substantiated complaints and to receive reports from the human resources department and city manager's office on current and anticipated steps for training on respectful workplace policies, as well as conflict resolution and media mediation efforts for March for the first meeting in March. I'll second that. Okay, so we have a motion made by Vice Mayor Myers, seconded by Mayor Cummings. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. And then there was one more piece to this motion. <coughs> that was, it. was that everything? She included it, everything? Yeah, okay. she included it altogether. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, well, I guess that concludes our meeting for this evening. And so um, thank you all for joining us. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>